Okay, hello everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our workshop. What are the learning rules of the brain? So we're very excited to have a great cast of fantastic speakers today. Tim Vogels from IST Austria, Ching Fang from Columbia, Rafael Bogash from Oxford, Kim Stachenfeld from Google DeepMind in Columbia. Then into the morning session, and in the afternoon we'll have Blake Richards from McGill and Mila, Christine Greenberg from Brandeis, myself from Ulster University, and Juliana Gorgieva in Technical University of Munich. So we're trying to um, try our best to cover uh, different angles on this topic. So some people are like using M machine learning, some people are taking ideas from machine learning. Some, uh, well, we only have one experimentalist, Christine, <laughs> and. Um, some people are taking more bottom-up approaches. Some people are taking more top-down approaches. I don't, not, you know, I'm sure there's many other angles on this too that we didn't, uh, unfortunately, have space to include. So the organizers are. Um, can you see this? Let's make it mouse instead. Uh, Tim O'Leary, uh, who uh, is at the University of Cambridge, and myself and Oleg Sankovic at Ulster University. Fortunately, Tim couldn't be here, so I'm sad about that because he's a very opinionated guy and he might have contributed to the debate. So I'm going to have to ask all of you to take, take his place and try and voice your opinions where you can. I wouldn't worry about him too much. He's totally happy, this, as evidenced by this photo from a few days ago. Okay, so just motivate the uh, session a bit. I'd like to open with some thoughts. So we're all here to try and understand how brains learn. And uh, of course, we know from the textbooks that the answer to that is by changing the strengths of the connections between their neurons. Okay, maybe there's other forms of plasticity, but that's the dominant belief. This thing is called synaptic plasticity. So I like to think about, um, I was trained in physics and we're really drilled in thinking about spatial scales and numbers and how big and small things are. So this helps me to think about synapses, these little tiny things. So if an animal like a mouse is on the scale of 10 centimeters-ish, uh, its brain is about a centimeter. We zoom into this uh, region, hippocampus, which is famous, of course, for learning a memory on the order of one millimeter. Inside that, um, we've got these very impressive looking cells called neurons. Cell body here, this is a big dendritic tree. The, art, the axonal arbor is even more elaborate, but it's not shown. And then if we zoom into one of those little branches, it's studded with all these little stick pointy things called dendritic spines, and then right at the tip of that, this red colored uh, bit here is a postsynaptic density, so that's one half of a, a synapse. And they're in the order of one micron. So you're talking about very small things that have a big impact. <clears throat> so the, the big challenge is um, it's not understanding one synapse really. The, 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 so the hard question is understanding how billions of synapses or millions or billions of synapses jointly change together during learning in order to improve or change circuit function to store a memory or to get better at a task. That's the challenge. So how, do we, how can we possibly hope to address that? One approach that uh, many people in this room take, <coughs> including myself, is to try and think about so-called learning rules. So we'll hopefully be able to write down some rules that can capture what they do. And what's a rule? A rule is just to say something. If something happens, then I do that. If something else happens, then I do this. But, or concretely in mathematical and computational neuroscience at least, we're often hoping to um, ask, or if we can write down one of those rules, then we can insert it into some model, and then study that model, and then hopefully go back and test the um, signatures of whatever learning process happened in the model, and look for evidence of that in physiology or behavior data. That's the kind of high level strategy. <clears throat> and I think it's very good, uh, it's one of the kind of Places in neuroscience, I think modeling can, is sort of almost essential, really, because without a model, I can't see how we could prop properly address this problem, really, because the real brain has the learning rules, but they're not something you can just see or measure or look at it under a microscope. They're implicit in the whole process. So we can't really ever design a control experiment where we have with or without a learning rule. That doesn't make sense empirically. But in a model, we can play those games. So I think it's a very nice place for modeling to contribute. Of course, modeling alone is not the answer. We need to always experiments, but I think it's a nice place where theory and experiments could work together, and traditionally have worked together. So what are these rules of plasticity? What am I talking about? 
And as computational people or theoret theoreticians or mathematicians, we are going to try and think of this as a mathematical function, usually of the pre- and post-synaptic neurons' activities, and maybe some other stuff. So what we're looking for is some sort of function that is a function of, say, the presynaptic neuron activity, postsynaptic neuron activity, maybe the other things like the synaptic strength, the weight of the synapse, and maybe some error signal. You know, who knows? A bunch of other factors. That's the, that's the question, what, what all goes into the left-hand side. And, oops, and then on the right-hand side, we want to know what to write down there. What function can we write down that will do some clever learning for us in a model? <clears throat> so, to try and uh, paint a picture of how we got here, I thought it would be nice to draw a quick timeline of the 20th century progress on this topic, or 20th and 21st century. Now, a bit of a caveat before I show anything. I, this isn't supposed to be some history lesson where I comprehensively list every single learning rule and say who, did, who discovered what when. That's not the goal here. It's to try to flag up the main milestone ideas that have come up. It's only, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. And there's many learning rules probably from people in this room that I'm not going to show, including some of my own. So don't get offended and please don't shout at me. I made the mistake <laughs> of, I was trying to, I was making these slides at the weekend. I was going to promote the conference by putting this slide on, the, on Twitter, which was a massive mistake. <laughs> and as I had many people say, that's not when backpropagation was first discovered, or you, know, you didn't cite Steve Grossberg's adaptive resonance theory, that kind of stuff. But, so just please take it easy on me. <laughs> uh, We're nicer than Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and I even got, uh, yesterday I was checking my email afternoon and I got an email from uh, one or, none other than Jürgen Schmidt-Huber to correct uh, me on uh, when <laughs> the back propagation was about. You got Schmidt-Huber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it all started um, with these two guys, uh, McCulloch and Pitts, who in 1943, uh, so they, didn't, they weren't really studying learning, but they came up with a very simple and um, elegant model that we often use for modeling a neuron as a single input step function, input output function, that otherwise takes a linear sum of its weights and thresholds it. So that's kind of, kind of the basis for a lot of thinking about learning afterwards. And of course, we have this very famous guy, Donald Hebb, who, um, with very little sort of data to back it up, he speculated, uh, possible learning rule in words. So he wasn't a mathematician, but he, he was a psychologist. So he, he wrote down in English what he, his famous learning rule idea that if two neurons are active together, then their yeah, connection strengthens. And that often is thought of uh, as a correlative rule. So if two neurons are activities are correlated in time, then we're going to strengthen their connections. And that that's, has sort of a massive impact on how we think about learning rules. Later, uh, Frank Rosenblatt, um, took the McCulloch-Pitts neuron and came up with an algorithm for training it via trial and error. And then uh, on, I've kind of separated this timeline on the bottom. It's sort of theoretical computational contributions, and on the top it's empirical experiments. <coughs> this groovy looking guy with a funky haircut uh, is called Eric Kandel, and he famously showed um, that synaptic plasticity could uh, explain some behaviors in a simple C-slug-gill withdrawal reflex. So this wasn't an example of heavy learning because it was, uh, didn't require some postsynaptic activity. It's just sort of a desensitization paradigm. Um, but it was a you know, massive breakthrough in terms of mechanistic understanding of plasticity and learning. In the time, short, short time after that, um, people did discover a heavy learning rule empirically in uh, Bliss and Lomo and Per Anderson's lab in 1973. Around the same time, theorists were already putting these heavy rules into models, and one thing they discovered straight away was that the uh, rules are unstable. So there's a sort of a positive feedback loop where if you strengthen the connection, then the activity gets elevated, and that strengthens the connections even more. So um, this guy, Christopher von der Marlberg, proposed the idea that the neuron must sort of normalize its weights to stop things from uh, becoming unstable. And that you know, wasn't, wasn't exactly what he cared about in the paper, but it was sort of a cornerstone of really um, all, well, many future models we use tricks like that. Not long after the long-term potentiation, uh, people discovered the opposite long-term depression, weakening of synapses. I tried to get, when I was making this slide, I tried to find like the, the first paper for LTD. It wasn't as clear. <laughs> so I've, in those cases, I've sort of switched to like a plot instead of a person's face, because I don't want to annoy anybody. Um, it's a bit easier with the computational papers because usually there's one landmark, or often there's one landmark. 
One very famous model is this BCM idea, Bean and Stock, Cooper and Monroe, who um, proposed this idea of a sliding threshold to, again, to solve the stability problem that von der Marlsberg was trying to solve. And that also had a massive impact, and people still use that model today. Erki Oye, in the same year, uh, later the same year, showed how heavy plasticity with a tiny, some modifications. Uh, he showed a link to principal component analysis, so heavy learning could uh, do something that we think is clever in a sort of more statistics and machine learning way. And then, of course, the, uh, this, I think this is the point that people get angry about. In the 1980s, the, of course, the artificial neural networks and the backpropagation learning rules started to take hold. The connectionists, the parallel distributed processing people, they all propose these networks as machine learning models of, um, but very brain inspired. So that, you know, this isn't exactly when backprop was invented, but it was when it took off, I would say, in popularity in the 1980s. Around the same time, there was parallel developments in reinforcement learning, temporal difference learning by uh, Red Sutton and Andrew Barto, and then Q learning from Chris Watkins a few years later. And it's, I don't really, there's a, for me, I, I don't study reinforcement learning myself, but these are quite high level abstract models that don't directly have synapses in them. But I include them anyway because they are very influential on in our thinking about how learning works. So on the empirical side, uh, Mark Baer and uh, Cliff Abram are most famous for proposing this idea of metaplasticity, that sort of the plasticity of plasticity, that the rules themselves may change. And that was, you know, very explicitly and directly inspired by this BCM idea. Uh, Gina Tergiano and Sasha Nelson and others um, discovered this mechanism, homeostatic synaptic plasticity, so very analogous to von der Marlberg's weight scaling to normalize or stabilize activity, slow time scales. And then there's a super famous um, phenomenon of spike timing dependent plasticity. And the idea there is that, um, like Hebb was very vague about the time scales of correlations we're talking about. Spike timing dependent plasticity experiments showed that neurons are, can be sensitive, or synapses can be sensitive to pre and post synaptic correlations on fat, very fast time scales, in order of 10 to 45 milliseconds, 40 or 50 milliseconds. <clears throat> 2010s, then the uh, deep learning revolution, of course, kicked off, which was more or less the same ideas as in the 1980s with bigger networks, more data, GPUs, and some other tricks, uh, stacking the networks into these. Uh, many layers. Um, and again, that's, you know, it's not to say that, that that's a machine learning phenomenon, but it's, you know, it would be strange to say that it didn't impact our thinking about how the brain works too. Inspired by that, um, several people, you know, in the 1980s, people had already discounted the idea that backpropagation was possible in the brain because it was seen as biologically in, sort of not possible. But people revisited that again after the rise of deep learning. <coughs> Uh, including some people in this room, like uh, Blake Richards. And then very recently, or more recently, there's this been uh, a breakthrough in an, uh, what I consider a new learning rule, which is behavioral time scale plasticity, which is, if you, if you squint, it looks a bit like spike timing dependent plasticity, but the key difference is the time scale involved. So here the, the correlations are on the order of uh, seconds rather than milliseconds. And that's seen as a, a non hebbian rule because Hebb was saying that the two neurons should be active at the same time, but the neural activity time constants in the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds. So here the two neurons need not be active at the same time, but you can still get strengthening. <clears throat> and uh, Christine, it was mainly discovered in the lab of Jeff McGee building and others work, but, uh, and you know, his team have gone on to explore that even more, and other people, there's a lot of excitement now, I think, about this rule. And one of our speakers, Christine Greenberger, will um, hopefully talk about that. <laughs> And then today, of course, we're leading up to this famous day, 5th of March 2024, when we finally get to the bottom of all this and figure out how, how learning works in the brain. Okay, so all that said and done, you know, where, where are we? At a very high level, there's sort of three categories of learning rule. Um, unsupervised, supervised, and reinforced learning. Unsupervised, the idea is no teacher. Supervised, there's some error correction mechanism via labeled training data. And reinforcement learning is the same idea, but Either the error correction is very generalized, so not specific to different uh, synapses or whatever, or delayed in time, so it's hard to assign credit. And there's, you know, some of the examples cover these three categories. So the, here's, here's the big problem, really. Um, the, in terms of which of these can do, we, if we put in models, can do well on tasks, supervised learning 
really blows everything out of the water and reinforcement learning in some cases or combinations of those. Unsupervised rules can do some things, but not that much or nothing very impressive compared to supervised rules. However, if we think about which is more biologically plausible, unsupervised rules are way more easy to map onto neurobiology, whereas the other two, there's like deep incompatibilities with supervised learning that some people are trying to work around. Or with reinforcement learning, it's more about there's unclear mapping, I guess, between these quite abstract models and the synaptic implementation. So that's, that's the, the crux of the issue, that these fancy rules, they can do clever AI stuff, seem less biologically plausible. The more biologically plausible rules don't do much uh, for us in AI terms. But maybe hopefully we can discuss that today. Okay, so what's the current consensus? I don't know. <coughs> do we have a coherent strategy as a field to address this? Also, not really, in my opinion. <laughs> but so hopefully we can try and together as a group get to the bottom of this today. So I'll zoom through this because I'm already over time for Tim's talk. Um, some key questions I think we can think about are what levels of brain organization should we look at? Behavior versus circuits versus cells versus molecules. What type of research strategies make most sense for figuring out this problem? What's the role of machine learning here? Should we be taking tools or concepts or both? And again, hopefully some of our speakers will discuss that a bit. What's the roles of these three forms of learning? Unsupervised, supervised, and reinforcement learning. And then hopefully you guys have questions too, so please bring them up either at the end of specific speakers' talks or in the panel sessions. We'll have one panel session in the morning and another one in the afternoon. So the schedule is there's uh, going to be eight talks in total, four before lunch, four afterwards. Each four will have a three, oh, sorry, 30 minute panel session afterwards. They're not really themed apart from, I guess the morning session is slightly more machine learning flavored than the afternoon session, but that's about it. Okay, thanks very much. Tim, do you want to step up? All right, uh, good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me, Kian, and the other organizers. Uh, I wanted to give you uh, two quick advertisements before I talk about my own work. Uh, Worldwide Neuro is not dead. Um, <laughs> despite the fact that we don't uh, have a pandemic anymore, we still have online talks uh, that are enjoyable. Also, you can use it for your journal clubs. We have over 1,500 hours of recorded uh, talks. So uh, come by and take a look. Uh, this is where I'm at. Uh, this is just uh, my institute. In red is my office there. Uh, if you happen to be in Austria, uh, do drop by. Uh, iClear and ICLM are coming up. Uh, if you're in the uh, neighborhood, say hello. Uh, and then um, this is a plug for a uh, Summer school, that's very dear to my heart, uh, the Imbizo in Cape Town every year. Uh, if you are interested in diversity in neuroscience, uh, this would be the place to go. Uh, I think there is no um, place in neuroscience that's featuring a more diverse uh, body of scientists it's uh, amazing. In, a close, in close vicinity. <clears throat> so with that, um, my talk, Memory by a Thousand Rules. Uh, I hope to convince you that this is an adequate title. Uh, our cosine reviewers for our posters were not so convinced, um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I can do what I want. Uh, because <laughs> <coughs> so here's a rendering uh, of, a, of a cortical slice uh, with a bunch of pyramids. Uh, in the background and then uh, the rest of the neurons uh, entangled into that web uh, of pyramids and uh, what that means to communicate is it's actually uh, quite a mess. Uh, we've been trying to figure out what's going on uh, for a long time and uh, the latest uh, estimate is that there is uh, quite a few cell types. In 2015 it was 17 cell types with 140 uh, different unique uh, synapse types that support function and behavior uh, and really we know very little about how it wires itself up, uh, how, it, uh, how it works, how it functions, what the, uh, 
you know, dynamics are that are being run on this hardware, uh, but uh, we, do, uh, we do collect um, over the last yeah, 100 years, we've been collecting an enormous amount of data and we've been trying to make sense of that data. And one thing that we probably share uh, in our uh, belief system about uh, this network is that it's constructed by what we call learning rules. What these learning rules look like, we don't know. Um, we have some ideas. In fact, uh, there's been roughly 50,000 papers uh, about uh, what these learning rules are, uh, and, uh, and, and those, those 50,000 papers concentrate uh, on actually very few connections, uh, and you can uh, you know, successively make that network smaller uh, for models. It's actually a network as small as this uh, with excitatory and inhibitory neurons and their connections, and the status quo is something like this, where uh, you have a pre- and a post-synaptic spike that uh, very much... Uh, okay. Um, determines uh, uh, what the strength of the uh, neuron uh, of, the, of a specific synapse will be and how the efficacy will change. Uh, and of course, you know, yesterday someone asked in a different session whether actually anyone still believed uh, in SCDP. Uh, I do. Um, but, uh, um, but there is other factors at play. So there is uh, rate effects, there is neuromodulation, uh, and there's uh, quite a few other effects that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, when you implement these rules into neural networks, uh, you actually find that they usually um, don't do anything useful. In fact, most of the time, they will explode, as, uh, as has been already alluded to. Uh, getting networks to perform stably with unsupervised uh, synaptic plasticity rules is actually quite a challenge. Uh, there are some notable exceptions to this um, that, that, that have succeeded by finally orchestrating the different uh, rules at play. Um, uh, to, to create stable networks, but uh, really, on average, um, plasticity rules really are detrimental to network activity for most, uh, for most models. Uh, so <coughs> what it comes down to is that these models usually use uh, not one rule, uh, like this one here, an excitatory uh, rule, uh, but they use a bunch of different rules, maybe uh, a homeostatic rule, or an inhibitory rule, and they're usually co-active, and then you make sure that they, that they play nicely with each other by tuning them uh, finely. Uh, and, uh, and for example, this paper here doesn't say that explicitly in the title. It says, you know, orchestrated learning rules uh, will produce stable networks. Uh, and if you don't exactly know what orchestrated means, now you know. It means we've tuned for six months until this worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this was the point um, uh, in time when a postdoc of mine started entering uh, the game. And he uh, looked at these synapses, uh, you know, these synaptic plasticity rules, and he said, well, don't, you know, excitation and inhibition are actually usually pretty close together synaptically. Don't they, don't they play with each other, uh, you know, at the level of synaptic plasticity? And he looked into the literature uh, and found that, yes, uh, they do actually affect each other. So excitatory to excitatory, uh, like excitatory synapses affect other uh, excitatory synapses in their uh, synaptic plasticity rules. Uh, inhibitory synapses affect excitatory synapses in their efficacy changes. Uh, excitatory synapses affect inhibitory synapses. So when you block NMDA, for example, it's been shown that inhibitory synaptic plasticity no longer happens. Um, and inhibitory synapses affect each, uh, uh, each other. Uh, so, so there is uh, a lot of evidence for what we then termed codependent plasticity. And this is another title that uh, in this case, editors took uh, issue with because codependency is obviously a term that we borrowed from psychology, uh, somewhat millennially uh, colored as a negative thing uh, because it uh, aims to describe, uh, you know, a dysfunction in relationships where uh, one partner in a relationship is overly dependent uh, on the other partner's happiness or uh, unhappiness. Uh, and, and we thought this was actually uh, quite an apt description of what's going on for synapses. Um, so we stuck with it, and, uh, and in fact, uh, the, the paper still features this in the title, because you know, we can do what we want. Um, <laughs> um, so this is the experimental evidence for codependent plasticity. And then the question was, how can we articulate something like this in a model? Uh, and it, that was answered by uh, Everton Agnes, who's somewhere here, sitting in the back probably. Hi, Everton. Um, who, who built a plasticity rule uh, by hand, uh, squinting at the data and uh, thinking about how to incorporate these different uh, factors. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about 
uh, how these factors are working together now. Um, I'm not going to use formulas, I'm just going to show you pictures. I hope that's okay. So, um, pre and post uh, in this function are just uh, the regular uh, pre and post synaptic spike trains. And then we have these two additional factors, E and I, uh, that are presumably uh, currents from other synapses as well as uh, from, the, from the synapse in question itself. Uh, and we're now, we now have to design uh, these rules such that they play nicely with each other. And that's essentially uh, what Everton's work has been. And we're going to start with uh, the excitatory rule. Uh, so um, codependent excitatory plasticity starts with a um, simple spike time independent plasticity window uh, that you're already well aware of. Um, and then uh, in addition, uh, Everton made the efficacy change dependent on uh, as I said, already said, uh, the, inhibit, uh, the excitatory currents in the vicinity of that synapse, and I'll come back to what vicinity means, um, so that, for example, when the post-spike happened after the pre-spike, the, uh, um, the efficacy change would also depend on how much excitation there was already, how much excitatory current there was already in the vicinity, so that when there is already a lot of excitatory currents uh, nearby, the efficacy change would be bigger, and uh, if there's not a lot of excitation around, it would be smaller. Okay, uh, he coupled that with a heterosynaptic uh, rule. So when there was postsynaptic spikes that happened alone, uh, this synapse would, on average, decay. It would get weaker. Okay, meaning you know if there is no presynaptic uh, um, spike to inform that synapse, it should actually probably not participate uh, with a loud voice. Uh, and these two effects together then came to um, a, a function that uh, produced a fixed point here. Uh, such that you know these synapses would get stronger for a while in the presence of excitation, and then they would get weaker again, so that they could never get too strong. Uh, in addition, there was a dependency on inhibitory uh, synaptic currents in the neighborhood of that uh, synapse, such that when there was a lot of inhibition around, the synapses wouldn't get stronger at all, uh, but when there was very little inhibition around, those synapses would uh, grow. Okay. Yes. Is this a if you ask me more than one question, <coughs> I'm going to mind timing, and then you know I'm not going to get done. But yes, one question for you. <coughs> this is question zero. Is that is that a, a pre-post or just a, a post-only rule? Uh, this is a post-only rule. Okay. This is pre-post. So green is pre-post, orange is post-only. How do we get pre and post on one axis? Uh, well, this is post-only. Oh, okay. Green is pre-post. Okay. Post-only. 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 Pre-post happens, or when pre-post doesn't, ha when post only happens, right? The updating of the weight depends on a, a post-synaptic spike as well as on a pre-synaptic spike. Could you replace those with equations, please? No. <laughs> and Tim, this is a fit to data, right? You fit yes. Data. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> we've we've put all of these so that they fit the data. I mean, this one, for example, is inspired by uh, this this uh, result that I mentioned that when there is uh, inhibitory currents around excitatory synaptic plasticity is blocked. <coughs> okay, no more questions. Um, uh, what this leads to in effect is a uh, spike time independent uh, plasticity window that looks a little bit like this, where uh, you know when you have more inhibition than excitation, uh, you get one type of relationship for pre-post spiking, <coughs> and, and, uh, and when excitation is bigger than inhibition, it flips so that efficacy changes depend on both uh, the environmental um, additional currents of excitation inhibition. Okay. Similarly, um, you can do this for inhibitory synaptic plasticity, and here we started uh, with uh, a symmetric window uh, of, of uh, spike time independent plasticity, which is not necessarily as <coughs> uh, as experimentally well uh, documented uh, as as the uh, SDP window, but uh, seemed like a reasonable starting point. Uh, and then we added again environmental effects for uh, excitatory and inhibitory uh, <coughs> um, um, currents, uh, so that when there was no inhibition around, um, this, the, the efficacy uh, of the efficacy change of the inhibitory synapse uh, would go up with uh, excitatory um, currents uh, in the vicinity of the synapse, <coughs> uh, and then that that relationship dropped as uh, there was more. Uh, inhibition in the vicinity of the synapse. Okay. Uh, similarly, for inhibitory currents uh, in the vicinity of the inhibitory synapse, um, when there was uh, when there was no excitation at all around, then there was no change in efficacy in the synapse. That's uh, an experimental result that says 
when there is no NMDA current, when there's no calcium around, inhibitory synapses don't change. Uh, and then as excitation enters the picture, uh, you change uh, such that uh, when there is little excitation around, uh, when there is little inhibition around, you have strong uh, effic cha efficacy changes, and when there is a lot of inhibition around, uh, you get little uh, efficacy changes or weakening. Okay. So similar to the other plot, you have an inhibitory uh, uh, synaptic spike time independent plasticity window uh, that's still symmetric, but that flips sign according to how much excitation, how much inhibition is around. So uh, when there is lots of excitation, the inhibition will you know, get a lot stronger very quickly. When there's no excitation around, uh, it will uh, weaken. Okay? In, in, in effect, uh, this means that the inhibitory synaptic plasticity rule aims to balance uh, the excitatory uh, synapses in the vicinity. Okay? How am I doing on time? Okay. <clears throat> so, with those two rules, um, you actually find that they play quite nicely together. Uh, and I'm not going to show you all of the things they do, because I want to talk about something else uh, as well. But um, let me just quickly tell you that it reproduces a, a bunch of plasticity experiments uh, that, that we looked at, uh, starting from you know, regular SCDP uh, experiments, but also these LTP and LTD um, experiments. Um, it stabilizes plastic networks, so you can uh, have a codependent, uh, codependent excitatory and inhibitory plasticity active in the same network, and uh, these networks will not blow up uh, like many other uh, networks before. Um, and it accounts for excitatory inhibitory co-tuning, uh, so you, s you can reproduce quite readily uh, these results from um, Robert Frumke and colleagues uh, from 2007, where he showed uh, that uh, excitatory and inhibitory currents are, you know, adjusting uh, themselves such that they always form the same tuning relationship with their uh, sensory stimuli. Um, and then there's two things that, that we found in particularly, uh, particularly interesting. One is uh, that uh, the relationship between the excitatory and inhibitory synapses uh, determines whether uh, synaptic um, inputs are clustering themselves by their, uh, by their, uh, in, by their uh, receptive fields uh, around dendrites uh, or whether they um, create uh, random uh, patterns of connectivity onto the dendrites. And then uh, also when you let this, uh, this rule run free in uh, <coughs> currently connected networks, we get amplifying networks out of it. Uh, both of these things haven't been shown uh, in that detail before uh, with spiking networks, and we found that quite interesting. So if you're interested in these things, I would invite you to look at uh, our preprint, uh, which uh, is going to be published uh, after two years of review. Um, <laughs> Uh, soon, hopefully. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> okay. So that was codependent plasticity for you. And um, we now have another paper. Uh, so we have 50,001 uh, papers on synaptic plasticity. Uh, Everton told me to not say this because he thought I was talking bad about uh, our own paper, but um, uh, the point is not that I'm not happy with this. The point is that uh, this is actually a relatively incremental change. Uh, if we're optimistic, that means you know we have another 137 rules to describe. Uh, they're possibly state-dependent, interdependent, uh, and and very difficult to access uh, experimentally. And at the <coughs> current pace, you know, looking at around one rule per 50 years, that means we only have 10,000 more years to go until um, we've understood. Uh, all 140 uh, postulated synaptic uh, plasticity uh, types uh, in the cortex, um, that is, uh, just the cortex. You're not convincing me. <laughs> <laughs> so good news. <laughs> um, and so uh, we looked at this and thought this was rather depressing um, and thought maybe, you know, given that this, uh, you know, this um, neighboring field of machine learning is, uh, is constantly peering at, uh, at neuroscience or supposedly peering at uh, um, uh, neuroscience, maybe we could also uh, you know, utilize some of the machine learning methods that are uh, becoming so powerful to, uh, to look at synaptic plasticity. And so that's what the second part of the talk is about. Uh, how can you machine learn or meta-learn synaptic plasticity rules uh, in a way that doesn't depress your graduate students? Um, so we start um, with a rule like this, uh, but now we parameterize this rule uh, such that we're looking at, you know, 
uh, efficacy changes as a, a function of uh, spike timing, uh, but also as a function of the presynaptic and the postsynaptic <coughs> rate, uh, and as a function of uh, how far pre- and postsynaptic spikes are apart from each other. And of course, we can also uh, include other effects, like, for example, this codependency uh, that I will exclude uh, for the duration of this talk, but that we're currently simulating. In fact, uh, this, the simulation work has been quite extensive, and so what I'm about to tell you about has cost us I think on the order of 600,000 processor hours uh, since <coughs> July um, and, and, and quite a few hours before. So there's something to be said about whether this is worthy of the CO2 footprint that we're uh, producing. But it's another, uh, should be for, for another place in time. So um, here's the um, um, polynomic rule uh, that we're going to tune uh, for excitatory synapses, but we're also going to do it for excitatory inhibitory, inhibitory inhibitory, and inhibitory excitatory synapses. So we're going to do it for all four synapse types in the same network. Uh, and of course, you don't have to only do this with a polynomic, uh, polynomial rule. You can also do this with uh, MLPs, uh, where you use more than uh, these uh, you know, six parameters that, that I've alluded to. Uh, so you can use voltage, you can use um, uh, in, uh, inhibitory or excitatory currents. You can use uh, all kinds of other parameters you uh, might want to include. Uh, that blows up your parameter space and is not feasible in the polynomial space, but there's tricks that allow you to do this in MLPs. Um, but again, those simulations are still running, uh, so I, I shan't talk about them today. Um, with that, uh, let's look at what we did or what Basil did, uh, one of my grad students, uh, <coughs> later in collaboration with uh, Purnima Ramesh and uh, Pedro Konkalvs and Jakob Macke, who are also somewhere here in the audience. So uh, we built a recurrent network of excitatory inhibitory neurons. As I already said, we have four plasticity rules. Um, and these, uh, the, this entire network is being activated by, uh, by <coughs> external stimuli. It's 5,000 neurons, uh, so they're, uh, they're firing at some uh, some rate that is determined essentially by the synaptic weights in the network that we're uh, init uh, initializing randomly and, uh, and that are being governed by randomly initialized plasticity rules. Uh, and then we embed, uh, or initially we tried to embed this into a meta-learning loop. Uh, so we produce an outer loop in which we assessed uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the weights of the network, the firing rates, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the dynamics uh, according to a, a loss function. And then we tried uh, to improve uh, the synaptic plasticity parameterization uh, sequentially uh, with, you know, uh, for example, evolutionary searches. Uh, and, uh, and that, as I, as I maybe hinted at beforehand, uh, led <coughs> to very limited success. Uh, so, um, it really didn't work, and it seemed, to, um, it seemed to actually be in line with what people said when we started this. They said, don't, don't do spikes when you do meta-learning, because it, uh, yeah, it's painful. And uh, I would certainly agree with that. Uh, and you can probably read about this soon, even though um, Basil doubts that this paper will ever <coughs> be cited, uh, because it's a negative result. Essentially, um, we're still going to put it on the archives so that other students may not try to do evolutionary search on uh, meta-learning synaptic uh, dependent, spike timing dependent plasticity rules. Well, what are you optimizing here? Um, we're optimizing, so this is part of the problem. So the loss function was going to optimize for low firing rates, slowly changing weights, asynchronous irregular activity, so essentially stability of the network. That was what we were aiming for. Okay. <laughs> and this, at this point we got an email uh, from a a uh, scientist called Purnima Ramesh. Uh, she was in Jakob Makis' lab, and she said, I'm looking at your, um, looking at your NERVS paper here, and I think you're not going to be very successful with this in large networks. Uh, and in fact, we knew that already when she wrote us the email. But, sh but I can help you, um, and I would like to help you. And, uh, and so uh, we invited her uh, to come talk to us. And uh, that was the beginning of quite a wonderful um, collaboration, actually, probably one of my most favorite uh, scientific collaborations that I've ever had uh, with the Maki Lab, uh, because Purnima and Basil basically became a single person, uh, uh, scientifically speaking. Um, they finished each other's sentences and each other's <laughs> code lines, and uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a wonderful experience to see them sitting next to each other and working uh, essentially nonstop 
for, for two years on this problem. Uh, first, they tried to, uh, to tackle this with GANs, uh, so they used uh, general adversarial networks uh, where you don't have to design the loss function because the loss function designs itself. And we had some success with that in rate networks, uh, but it was uh, entirely impossible to, to put that into, uh, into spiking networks. Uh, and so this you can hopefully read soon uh, in eLife. It's uh, going to be published under this new publish, uh, publishing model. Uh, we just got our reviews back, <coughs> uh, thanks to the reviews if they're here, um, and we're going to address these soon. Um, but again, this didn't work for spiking, uh, uh, spiking networks, uh, so we tried something else, and this is where uh, Pedro came in because he brought another tool from the Maki lab that's called simulation-based inference uh, that is essentially a technique that replaces parameter sweeps uh, for networks uh, and allows you to sort of uh, optimize or, or, or uh, be much more efficient in assessing uh, uh, parameter spaces for their robustness or uh, to find uh, parameter regimes within which uh, your model works. Uh, so you start off with often a, prior, prior, uh, a random prior and then run simulations, assess those uh, simulations based on uh, the observables you choose, and from those observables you create a posterior uh, that describes which parameters are going to be most likely to lead to the success you're looking for. Okay? And you do this a bunch of times, successively refining your posterior uh, to really get a good assessment of the parameter landscape uh, that you're looking at. And uh, Purnima and, and, uh, and Pedro and Basil started thinking about whether they would be able to use this uh, uh, kind of uh, technique for parameter tuning uh, and, and using this in, sequential, in a sequential way. So a small tweak to this technique, which is, uh, I've been told mathematically, maybe not kosher, uh, but, uh, but worked anyway, uh, in that they started with a random prior and did SBI, and then once they had a relatively good handle on the parameter landscape, they just added a new constraint. And they said, so we're going to start with the constraint that we only want low firing rates, and then once we have plasticity rules that produce low firing rates, um, we're going we're gonna to ask those firing rates to be not only low at a population level, but also low at the level of individual neurons, for example, uh, and so on. So they sequentially uh, introduced constraints instead of having one loss function that would do everything at once. And this plays back to your question. And that was really the problem with evolutionary searches, that when you overwhelm the loss function with everything at once, you have essentially no, no chance of finding solutions. But when you approach this rather gently, uh, it turns out that this works. So, uh, you iteratively narrow down the search space and craft the loss function on the fly, right? Because one problem with the loss function was often that we said, like, look, we want a network that fires with an average asynchronity uh, or irregularity of a, with a CV of one. And then the plasticity would, rules would produce neurons that fired really bursty. So they fired three neurons in quick succession and then fell silent. And that gave us a CV of one, but obviously it wasn't what we wanted. How am I doing on time? Oh. Three minutes? OK. Uh, so this is just to say uh, we succeeded with this. This is a relatively complicated slide I'm going to skip uh, if I have no time. Um, but the, uh, the, the message of this slide is that we ended up uh, with a bunch of plasticity rules. In fact, many, many, many plasticity rules that uh, followed all of the constraints we put on them. Uh, and uh, the, the, the overlap between what we expected from mean field uh, calculations and what we finally got from the simulations was only partial, uh, so that uh, the rules that, some of the rules at mean field or first order approximations of mean field um, um, assessment didn't uh, actually produce the, the, the activity in all spaces or in all uh, parameter combinations that we wanted, but FSBI uh, <coughs> did. Uh, so uh, we basically shaped, you know, we, we, we successively honed in on uh, the parameter space that produced stable activity, stable uh, weights, and asynchronous regular activity. And uh, these are the rules that we found. In fact, these are only some of the rules we found. Uh, I printed some for you, for, out for you, so um, after the talk, you'll be able to peruse and see if your rule is in there. And I already told you, uh, actually, Jakob told me this yesterday, we have 1,200, roughly 1,200 rules that produce stable networks. So in you know, the logic of one paper per rule, uh, we should probably write 1,200 papers. <laughs> um, and, and Basile said he wouldn't support that. But um, <laughs> um, 
but we, can, we now have to look at what these rules do, uh, how they relate with each other, and we're, we're in the process of doing that. Interpretability is not totally uh, trivial here. Uh, we're looking at robustness, for example, beyond the time that we train for. Uh, they are robust, as far as I, uh, we can tell, or at least pretty robust. Uh, the, the, the activity stays robust for 60 minutes after simulation. The weights stay robust, asynchronous regular activity. So it all looks nice. Uh, but then we asked, can we do something else with these rules, right? We trained only for stability here, but we said, hey, what happens if we, if we ask this network to remember something? So we introduced a protocol uh, to these uh, networks in which we um, showed them a specific stimulus uh, for about 10 minutes and then left that, uh, you know, left the network on its, uh, to its own devices for a while and then flashed a familiar or a novel stimulus, actually, a novel, uh, no, a green novel stimulus and a, a purple familiar stimulus um, and asked, does the network differentiate between these two inputs and how long will the network remember uh, the familiar stimulus? And it turns out that all of the plasticity rules we found, the 1,200 of them, all reacted slightly differently. So we had some rules like this that initially uh, didn't respond uh, to familiar um, uh, stimuli, but then flipped and uh, started strongly responding to familiar stimuli. Uh, and, uh, and that would be you know, some sort of preference flip, uh, where uh, the network would originally uh, prefer uh, novel stimuli and then later uh, familiar stimuli. Uh, but we also had other rules uh, that did the exact opposite, right? So uh, in, the, in this color scheme of familiar and novel, uh, you can see here uh, what the preference is of a given rule. Uh, and, and it turns out that, uh, you know, you can find uh, this rule, for example, uh, um, to be coincident uh, with experimental results from the Carandini lab. And here uh, is another paper uh, that was published by uh, Sukin Lim and uh, Nicolas Brunel uh, with uh, David Schienberg's data uh, that seems to obey a different plasticity rule. So you can pull out you know, almost anything out of this rule space. Some rules forget, some rules will remember. They will remember for much longer than you think they should. Uh, and we're now in the process of soliciting your data. So, uh, so if you have data of learning, uh, uh, of, of any kind, we'd be interested to hear from you uh, to see if we can not only compare the rules that we've already learned, but also further constrain our search space to see what we can do with them. Uh, and so the cool byline here is maybe that learning and memory is a byproduct of homeostasis, right? So remember that we didn't train these networks to remember. Uh, we only trained them to be stable, uh, and they still remember stimuli. And so that's maybe the take home message. Uh, everything, what was it? Nothing makes sense in biology unless uh, it's in the light of evolution. Uh, so uh, if you evolve networks to be stable, maybe you evolve them to uh, be memory networks uh, to begin with. And so uh, these are the two papers that I talked about today. Uh, neither of them are, well, the NERVS papers out, uh, the Nature Neuroscience papers on the archive. Uh, and, and, and this is my lab. Uh, so thanks very much for the attention. Uh, we'll take one quick, well, one question while Ching's setting up, if that's okay. Yeah, leave over there, please. Okay, I, I came in the middle, so I'm sorry <laughs> if I, uh, this is due to a misunderstanding. But uh, when you say uh, 1,200 rules or 127, do you, do you mean it uh, only in J6? Seriously, I mean because uh, I mean I'm just imagining you have continuous parameters, so. Don't you have a continuous, say, posterior distribution over the parameter space? I would like to invite you to look at them uh, okay. here. So they look really quite different from the time. They behave differently. Do you for think example, this is like a multimodal uh, posterior? So we That's looked at when we do principal component analysis, for example, we see nothing. It's all one cloud. There's no structure. In it. And we're, we're now in the process of you know, probing this, these rules to, to take them apart, to pick them apart. And of course, they don't, you know, this is only a snapshot of them because they also depend on rate, they also depend on uh, codependency at times. So there's a lot of interesting work that has to be Okay, uh, if you have other questions for Tim, you can reserve them for the panel session uh, just before the lunch break. Otherwise, let's thank Tim again for an excellent talk. Okay, and our second talk uh, is by Ching Fang from Columbia University. And she's going to tell us about her work on modeling the generation and function of barcode representations in the hippocampus. Cool. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me and for the uh, organizers for uh, making this workshop. Keep lowering this microphone lower and lower. Um, 
So uh, this is work with Jack Lindsay and Salman Shte, and here we're proposing a way in which what we call barcode representations in the hippocampus are useful for learning precise episodic memories. And this work is based off modeling of data set collected by Salman um, in this very unique task. Uh, but just to give a little background before I get into the experimental results um, that we'll be modeling, both Salman and I are in Dmitry Aronov's lab where we are interested in the hippocampus. And if you're in the hippocampus literature, you're probably familiar with two very different perspectives that people will talk about this region in. So it's either uh, an area that's responsible for computing a cognitive map and for understanding the spatial grounding of experience, or it's an area that is very important for episodic memory and for remembering precise details of what, when, and where uh, the experience of an animal has been. So it's really not clear how to reconcile these two lines of literature that uh, really pervades hip the hippocampus field. And that's partly why this uh, data set from Selmon was so exciting and interesting for us to think about. So this is a paper that is up on BioArchive. It was also recently accepted, so you'll be able to see it um, in full journal form soon. And one very interesting aspect of this paper is that Selmon is recording from a model organism for episodic memory. So this is a food caching bird. Uh, here, this is the black-capped chickadee, which we study. It is a very tiny bird, around 10 grams large, uh, but it's very capable of doing a specific kind of task that is, um, that's what we call caching and retrieval. So, for instance, if the bird is in this laboratory environment where all of these dark, uh, dark squares are possible hiding spots where the bird can put food, location, food into a location, the uh, innate behavior of this bird is to grab food and hide it into some of these spots. And so you can see that this is directly speaking to the idea of a cognitive map, needing to spatially ground these memories or these food items uh, in, in space. But later, as the animal is running around, uh, it will then need to precisely retrieve the location of these food items. And so that's where this aspect of episodic memory and being able to recall precisely uh, details of an experience in the animal's life comes into play. And so there's a lot of reasons why this is a very useful model organism for episodic memory. One is that the time of memory formation can really be isolated. When the animal is taking the food and shoving it into this location, you can think of that as a moment in which there is some formation of memory going on. And specifically, we know this is hippocampus dependent and that this is the region that we really want to be looking at to target these memories. So I'll go over some key experimental results um, that we wanted to use to, um, to construct our model and that we also want our model to recapitulate. So there are three events of interest in, um, in this uh, task that Salman is running. Uh, one is when the bird is just visiting locations, it's just running around, and this is similar to what you would expect of foraging behavior for rodents running around in a 2D arena. The other is what we call cache events, where the animal is putting food into a site, and the final event is a retrieval event, so the animal has run around and it's decided to get food and it goes back to a location and takes its food. So the first thing you might ask is just what do individual neurons look like under these events? So during these visits, we, uh, here are three example cells, and we see that they display an activity profile that is very similar to what you expect of place field. So here they're all encoding uh, various locations in this 2D arena as these uh, broad kind of blobs. Um, but if you look at the activity of these cells during these cache and retrieval events, you see a very different activity profile. So these cells will encode uh, the caches that were made in this very sparse and uh, very localized way. They seem to be participating in the encoding of a lot of, uh, a lot of caches, and importantly, the location of the caches that they may encode don't seem to be related to the location of the place fields that they encode. Um, a second very interesting result is uh, if you look at the correlation profile of population activity um, across these different events. So for instance, if you're looking at the correlation of population activity across visits, this is when the animal is just foraging, you see a profile that looks something like this, this smoothly decaying uh, function of space. And this is what we expect of place codes. 
Um, but if you look at the um, correlation for these cache and retrieval events, not only do you see the smoothly decaying place field, but you see this kind of extra signal, which we call the barcode. This is, it seems like there's some specific activity that is reactivated during cache and retrieval at the same site, and it is much stronger than that uh, during the spatial foraging mode, and much more spatially precise than a place code as well. Um, so, this is all very interesting, and a, a final kind of observation that we really use to think about the model is looking at the presence of these different codes um, if you look at the time of caching. So here we're looking at the uh, entire window of an event where, where the bird has gone to a site and is putting food in, and you can see that initially there's this broad place code, and then a transient, sharper barcode signal seems to come on afterwards. Um, and they're always very tightly locked to behavior. So all of, us, all of this taken together is telling us there's this very different mode of neural activity that's happening um, during this ep these episodic memory moments, um, and that they seem, it seems very distinct from the place uh, kind of code as well. And we have a few mysteries that we were kind of left with at the end of Salman's paper. One is understanding where do these barcodes come from? And we suggest one way to generate this kind of decorrelated signal, and that is through the recurrent dynamics of uh, a random network. Uh, we also want to understand how are these kinds of signatures actually used to store memory. And we'll propose that these barcodes are useful for binding uh, information about the what, when, and where of an event into an attractor state, and that these informations come in as inputs into the hippocampus. Uh, finally, we want to understand why even do this kind of seemingly complicated way of storing memory. And we'll suggest that the presence of these barcodes allows you to store memory more precisely and really reduce interference between memories while still allowing for content-based recall. Uh, but I'll focus on this first point for now. Uh, how are we getting these decorrelated signals? So. Um, what we suggest is that if you actually just have random weights within a recurrent network, the dynamics of the recurrent network will just naturally decorrelate the inputs. So let's say here we have uh, place coding inputs feeding into a recurrent network um, where the network weights are drawn from a random Gaussian. Um, if we look at the bird running through space, and uh, one, one thing that I should add is that we're allowing this network to kind of toggle between a mode where it's more feed-forward driven and a mode where it's more driven by recurrent dynamics. So during the feed-forward mode, you get something similar to uh, the place cells or place inputs that you receive. Uh, that's kind of to be expected. But during the recurrent mode, as you feed in this place input, the dynamics of the recurrent network operate chaotically, and the final activity that you get will allow you to decorrelate nearby place signals. You can also quantify this more and try to understand exactly what is controlling this decorrelation amount. So uh, for the tasks that we'll be running, we'll be looking at 10 of these sites arranged circularly and just say that this chickadee is running around these 10 sites and occasionally caching and retrieving. Uh, the place inputs then into the model have this kind of smooth Gaussian correlation um, profile. And as you uh, increase the variance of the recurrent network weights, you can start sharpening up this correlation signal that uh, you'll eventually get from the recurrent network weights, or recurrent network activity. So here, as you increase the variance, you can see that the correlation profile becomes sharper and sharper, and essentially becoming a delta function at the extreme. And for our simulations, we'll choose somewhere in this like middle regime where you still get a little bit of place information, but still have this sharpening that you uh, expect from barcodes. And so just with this, we're already able to capture um, single neuron barcode activity. So here, we haven't run any learning at all, but we can see that neurons that encode place will also have a very sparse, um, very different <coughs> profile when they're encoding cache locations that doesn't seem to be related to place. So these are, for example, neurons. Uh, this is nice. It allows us to check one of these boxes of the experimental findings we wanted to capture. Um, but then we have to go to the second question, which is how exactly are we going to store memory um, and use learning to bind these inputs into an attractor? 
And here again, we'll turn back to experimental data. So in someone's data, not only do we see this nice temporal ordering of signals where you seem to get place inputs um, and then a barcode signal, but you also seem to see this third signal that arrives last, which is what we call uh, a seed signal, a signal that is just um, encoding the idea of a seed or a food. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it is also very locked to behavior in this way. So we think of seed as essentially encoding the what aspect of a memory, and we're going to design the inputs into the model following what we see in, in data. So uh, here we'll say that memories that are formed by binding these place and seed inputs through barcodes in the recurrent network. The inputs here, uh, again, we have place inputs. Here, let's say the animal is at the pink state, and so that will be active. And the, there will also be a seed input going into this network, and that's this uh, S neuron that we've added in as well. And at the end of one of these caching events, we'll say that the change in weights of this recurrent network, um, J, will follow this rule. So at the IJ synapse, essentially you have a Hebbian element and then a normalization term where beta is just a scalar that you modify. And uh, so this is, you can see this is just a very simple Hebbian plus normalization term and will uh, help you store memories in a Hopfield-like manner where you're also able to really um, push close by memories farther apart. So here with this, we can then run the full caching and retrieval protocol and see how well we're able to recapitulate experimental findings. Uh, if we look at the correlation profile of activity in this network, for visits, you get this soft, smooth decay that you expect. For cache and retrieval, you get uh, the same aspect where there's this uh, seeming bump in correlation that is very spatially precise, and that's uh, what we think of as this barcode activity again. And so that gets, gets the second experimental finding we are interested in. And we also have this nice temporal ordering of signals that we also expect from experimental data. So all of that is great, and um, now we want to think about this from a normative perspective. So why even have um, this kind of system for storing memories? And uh, we think there's kind of two tensions that you have when you are storing memories. Essentially, uh, this idea of pattern separation, you want to really reduce interference across memories, but also pattern completion, you want to also be able to recall memories based off where you currently are in the world. And to test these kind of dual effects, we'll be looking at a memory task where this agent is making three caches. So again, if we go back to our 10 state arena, let's say this animal has cached at this red dot. One question you might ask is just say, does this red dot have a cache at all? Like I can't peer into it and check whether or not it does, I just have to rely on my memory to answer this question. Um, the way we'll do this in the model is that there will be inputs corresponding to the current location of the animal coming in, and um, then you'll also have an input uh, corresponding to the item that you're trying to probe for. So here the animal is trying to know where seeds are, and so the seed input will be active as well. And so if you just look at the um, output norm of this network or just the strength of activity, you can see that it's very localized to the location where the cache has been made. This is C1, the first cache, um, and that's, that's great. You can read out where the location of a cache is in this way. Uh, the second is perhaps you want to actually say, where is the location of a nearby cache? If I'm far away, maybe I want to recall the place field that corresponds to the location of a cache that I'm interested in. And you can also do the same here. You can uh, be farther away, that's what this uh, y-axis is, and then try to recall the place field corresponding to cache one. And so we can keep doing this, let's say for two caches that are nearby to each other, and for, let's just say, a third cache to make sure there isn't some extra uh, interference that could happen. Um, and one interesting aspect of this, like here you're, ab you're able to do this identification and reconstruction task very well, um, but let's say you want to actually increase the basin of attraction for this attractor um, and be able to recall memories even when you're farther apart. Maybe you don't care about precision as much. And what you can do is actually just boost up this uh, uh, seed um, input into this region and essentially make this, uh, these attractors stronger so that you're able to recall the uh, place fields of hidden caches um, from farther away. 
and perhaps at the expense of precision. Um, one important fact, uh, detail is that in the model, the resolution is around one site that, uh, of Salman's arena. We match up the spatial profiles, and this is important because we expect that chickadees should, should be able to distinguish the location of two neighboring sites, and we can do that in this model as well. And so, uh, finally, we want to understand um, within this task, what is, what is the role of both place and barcodes? Like, is, there, is this just kind of an arbitrary model for memory? Why do we have both of these signals? And so here, this is the plots I just showed. You have three caches. You're able to identify whether caches are there. You're also able to uh, reconstruct and uh, conjure up place fields corresponding to hidden caches. And so actually, if you start ablating each of these, you can start understanding why both of these signals are useful. So let's say you ablate barcodes. You're only using place codes to store memory. Um, in the model, this means we don't have any chaotic dynamics. Um, and you can see that here, you don't have the precision that you want of memory. Um, these memories start blurring together, particularly for two sites that are close uh, together, and you're no longer able to really separate them out. You can also do this the other way and say, what if I just made my whole system extremely precise and completely barcode based so that there's no spatial correlation present in my inputs? And you enter a different failure mode where you can recall the location of, um, of a cache, but only when you're exactly at that cache. If you're anywhere farther apart, then you can no longer conjure up uh, this associative memory of where nearby caches are. And this is true even if you boost up the search strength, for instance, you just start seemingly randomly snapping to one place field and kind of catastrophically uh, unable to retrieve any other place field. So this is um, very interesting because it tells us that actually cognitive maps and episodic memory um, are really complementary to each other um, in terms of this type of memory task. Uh, so just a review, we've talked about this model inspired from, by Salman's data in food caching birds, where we propose a way that barcodes, these decorrelated activities, can be generated, how they can be used to store memories, and why they're so useful for uh, episodic memory tasks. And a fourth thing, though, that we want to understand is how this connects to prior models. So in the hippocampus field, there's a whole zoo of models that people have suggested can fit data well in this region. And we want to really understand if our model can uh, you know, unite some of these aspects and is not, in fact, just another bespoke model added to the sea of models. And so one particular uh, line of work that is um, near and dear to my heart is the idea that hippocampus is computing predictive maps. Um, that is, the cognitive map aspect of this area is in fact biased by the transition structure of the animal's experience. Um, and so this is actually work that uh, I had previously uh, worked on in terms of deriving learning rules for this. Um, so I'll briefly go over some work where with Emily Miscavishis, who's also here in this room, um, we show that a recurrent network and heavy and type learning can form predictive maps. So this is a previously published work. You're, uh, yeah, feel free to check it out if you're interested in it. And just as a quick review, the idea of a predictive map or uh, one particular example of the presence of this in the hippocampus is that if you're an animal running down an environment, there will, your place cells will start to become skewed backwards in the direction of the animal's experience. And so what we suggest uh, is that in a recurrent network with weights um, determined by this weight matrix J, we derive this learning rule um, where if you follow this learning rule, the synaptic weights of this matrix will exactly learn the transition probability matrix of an animal's experience. And so if you then take the recurrent dynamics of this network with uh, the synaptic weight matrix equal to the transition probabilities, and you look at the recurrent dynamics over time, you'll expand to get this long horizon prediction, uh, which is also called a successor representation. And one interesting thing, kind of thinking about both of these projects, is if you look at this learning rule, it's very similar to what we are using for this barcode model. You have a Hebbian element, and then you have this normalization element that's a function of, um, of the activity of these, of the pre and post um, activities. And so one question we ask is whether or not we can then embed this kind of predictive map within this kind of barcode, uh, uh, barcode network as well. And what we see is that um, 
the recurrent strength of the network, so I previously mentioned the idea that we can, uh, uh, I guess, like toggle the, memory, the model into more of a feed-forward mode or more of a recurrent mode, um, and so I'll call that recurrent strength, but if you are able to freely modulate that, you can control whether the model is in more of this place-driven mode, prediction mode, or barcode mode. So again, here is the activity of the network if you're looking at it in this um, more spatial place-like mode. Uh, here's the activity if you're looking at it in this more barcode, uh, cache activity mode where things are more decorrelated and sparser. Um, and it turns out if you look at this middle regime, you'll be able to see this kind of predictive map, longer horizon prediction, um, place fields arising. And here are three example units also demonstrating the same. In blue, you have a place field, orange, this kind of skewed prediction, and green, this very sparse, uh, kind of scattered across the track um, uh, encoding of different uh, episodic memories or caches. And importantly, this doesn't disrupt the memory task at all. And the model is still able to uh, remember these caches precisely. Um, and so we were asked to give our two cents about how all of this connects to learning rules. Um, and so I'll, I'll go through a few bullet points of some thoughts, some scattered thoughts. Um, one is that across both of these projects with this barcode <laughs> model and also this long horizon prediction model, um, a key element is the ability to gate plasticity and to be able to uh, lock that into some, some point of behavior where it's, um, you actually want to run it. And so from an experimental perspective, I would say that being able to isolate, these, isolate this uh, signal that allows for this plasticity gating and examine what's going on around that time point is going to be something that's very important for understanding learning rules. Um, the other idea that, I, uh, that we thought was really interesting here is that the, what, whatever you learn is not just a function of the learning rule, but rather the context in which it's run. In our model, if you run it under different recurrent strengths, you'll be able to get more of a, a predictive map representation or you get more of, a, of this kind of barcode representation. But perhaps in other models, it's some other different context that you care about, say architecture um, or some other aspect. And so to really understand learning rules, you also have to think about it in the different contexts they could appear. Um, a third point, uh, which was really what was so important about Salman's data set, is that uh, you want to isolate the point in which learning is happening. Um, in the bird, we know that the point of memory formation is locked around the time in which the bird is placing the food into a cache. And that's why we're able to really lock into neural activity there and examine what's happening to think about the learning rules. And so uh, we would argue for thinking about um, the kinds of behaviors that you're interested in and trying to understand what points in your task or your experiment is learning happening. And that can allow you to um, be able to think about these learning rules more precisely. And of course, in our situation, we're able to do that because it's a model organism that is very useful for this kind of task. And so sort of the final point that I would put on here is the idea to, of comparative organisms and uh, not only understanding how learning rules are used across organisms, but also thinking about what type of organism is most, um, most useful for understanding the learning rule of interest. And so with that, I want to thank um, Jack and Salman, who both uh, three of us have worked on this project together. Um, I meant to put a more professional photo of Jack on here, but I forgot, so I'm sorry. Um, and also my various advisors, um, PhD student at Columbia, and um, my advisors are Larry, Dimitri, and um, also Kim as well. It's a whole team of people, but, um, and we also got a lot of feedback from our uh, labs, and of course to the workshop organizers for uh, letting us uh, speak here. So thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Peter, first. When you say barcode, do you mean a narrow place field? Uh, no, so it's not just a narrow place field um, in the sense that the neurons, um, I would say the neurons are not participating in the barcode representation for just one cache. Like one neuron can be participating in the location of caches at multiple sites, none of which are close to each other at all. Um, so 
in that sense, maybe multi-cache representation is possible within a, a single neuron. And single neuron would have lots of narrow place fields, sort of like that. I think it's also a little more distinct in that the activity profile of these neurons are much more um, temporally local, and also the firing rate is much higher than that in a place field. So there's also other differences there. It's not just sort of this narrowed version of um, its its own place field. And yeah, yeah. So we use simulations in 1D? In 1D, yes. In 2D and 3D, narrow gets, I mean, it's sort of narrow in space and time. In higher dimensions, narrow is really bad. Have you thought about this? Uh, as far as encoding information. Yeah, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, we haven't we haven't thought about this the extra problems that might arise as I guess what you're saying like there's kind of this exponential change that could happen. Um, yeah, here we kept it at one D, but yeah, it'd be good to think about um, what happens in the more complex case. Um, might have to think about it more. Yeah. I think there was somebody at the back that the, had the hand first. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, I had a question. Uh, I have this. Uh, I've heard about some of these um, behaviors of chickadees, these blue caching birds where they will go and find a seed, pick it out of one of their locations, and then place it somewhere else, um, and just sort of move the seeds around. They're not always sort of eating them when they find them. Do you find that that kind of behavior correlates with something like a memory lifetime in your kind of recurrent network? I know with this kind of learning rule, sometimes you'll have this sort of gradual forgetting or recency bias of the newer things that you've stored. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Here, we didn't consider in the model uh, what we call recaching, which is the behavior we're talking about. This is like anim the animal will seem to kind of occasionally start shuffling around all its food spots, um, for, for those of you who are not familiar, um, and perhaps it's doing that because in the wild, um, food stores can get pilfered. Someone might be looking at you uh, hiding your food. Um, but yeah, to, to the question of um, what we think is going on in the model, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because uh, to really get at that, we need a way to think about a forgetting signal, which is something that we've toyed around with but haven't quite uh, really pinned down. Um, and yeah, I, I would say that if we think about in the, our ideas of forgetting, uh, we're trying to think of a way to essentially reset the system so that you don't have to worry about these um, that maybe the animal is only responsible for remembering a, a small store of memories and that it's not like over the horizon of all of these uh, caches that have been moved around, it has to continually store all of them, but rather there's like some way to kind of reset the system. Um, but still, still working on a, a good way to implement that in the model. It's a good point. I'm not sure who's next. Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. It seems like caching is a, a one-shot learning situation, and and it also requires a pretty high capacity. I know these birds. I don't know. I remember hearing a thousand caches or something. Does that does this RNN have an issue with one-shot learning and high capacity storage and you know avoiding interference and that kind of a thing? Yeah, for us it seems like um, the greatest issue, having you know done some simulations trying to get at capacity, the um, most difficult part is the resolution. So if you, um, uh, that is like if you have here, I guess here also the way the model scales is that as you have a larger and larger environment, um, the inputs and the size of the RNN also are scaling up. But um, yeah, I would say here there's more of interference from resolution where you're putting memories too close together than there is from the number of uh, memories that you're putting into the system. That is like it hits its resolution limit before its capacity limit, perhaps. Um, and to your point of this, like, so one, one interesting thing about chickadees, like, yes, it, it is true that some of the um, cited works are like, oh, they can remember like a thousand seeds over the course of a winter, but in reality, um, the kind of seeds that the animal is really responsible for managing and um, and eating and retrieving is usually over the course of one day. And so the number of seeds that the animal in the wild is typically managing is not actually thousands over a winter, but rather um, you know, several dozens over the course of a day. And the energy management system of these birds are really, um, they're really just living day by day and managing their fat re reserves. Um, yeah. Maybe one from this side for a change? Uh, maybe you at the back? Thanks. Um, me, right? Yes, please. Uh, uh, I was wondering what's the variability between these barcodes 
um, representations and if you can see similar variability in the model. Yeah, it's a yeah. That's a, that's an interesting point. Um, I guess in in the data, because we within an experiment usually have um, only a few points of time of these caching and retrieval. Um, like you can really only compare um, cache and retrieval at a single site uh, a couple of times within the experiment. It's it's a little hard to get at the question of variability. Um, there are I, I think the question of variability is more interesting. Um, in the context of when the animal caches at a location, retrieves, and then thereafter goes back and caches again. And there, there, is, there seems to be a different kind of barcode that's assigned to that, um, to that uh, location, but it's sort of this more altered function of the previous barcode. Um, that is, like there's, there, where there is variability at a location, it seems to be a very uh, kind of structured variability that is occurring uh, depending on how many times you've interacted with that cache. Um, if you look across population and all caching events, like and peak, peak activity, how different is that across all the caching events? Um, across all the caching events, um, yeah. Sorry, I, I don't, I don't have like an exact like quantification of that. Um, but that's, uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe I can get get back to you afterwards with a with a better explanation. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we, I think we better stop there for a break. Sorry, I know you have more questions. Um, so we'll take a nine minute break until Rafael's talk at 11. Um, let's thank Ching once more. Our next speaker is uh, Rafael Bogash from University of Oxford. And he's gonna tell us about once I can read the slide. Inferring neural activity before plasticity as a foundation for learning beyond backpropagation. Good morning, and um, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. During this talk, I would like to discuss the learning rules um, for learning in uh, networks including multiple layers, where weights in multiple layers have to be modified to learn the association between uh, input and the output. And I would like to, to, to propose that during uh, such learning, um, neural activity first converges to an equilibrium before the weights are modified. And I'd like to point out that this new inference of neural activity before plasticity is actually beneficial and improves learning in um, many situations um, which are um, faced by um, animals. And this work was um, basically led by a talented former PhD student in my group, Yu Hang Song. So the question of this workshop is, yeah. what are the learning rules for the brain? And as it was kind of already mentioned in the introduction, if we think about learning rules for supervised problems, then the first thing which comes to my mind is the backpropagation algorithm, which is um, known to be effective in training artificial neural networks. And much work uh, has focused on how such uh, this backpropagation algorithm could be approximated uh, in biologically plausible neural networks would only employ local um, plasticity and local computation. However, learning in the brain is actually superior to backpropagation in several aspects. For example, we humans require less training data than artificial neural networks. <coughs> and artificial neural networks are known to suffer from um, a lot of interference, uh, so they forget the information when they are trained on new information, and we are somehow more robust to it. So, the, so this raises a question whether we as a field should be kind of so much obsessed with focusing on approximation of backpropagation or seeking implementation of backpropagation, or maybe the brain is using a different principle. And during um, this talk, I would like to say that indeed, uh, the learning in the brain uh, follows a fundamentally different principle which we call prospective configuration. So I will describe what this. Um, show you a potential mechanism by which it may arise, 
and demonstrates advantages in biological contexts. So what is prospective configuration and how does it differ in, <coughs> from backpropagation? So I guess most of you are familiar with backpropagation algorithm, and essentially the way it works is that it modifies the weights in um, artificial neural network to reduce the error on the output. So in prospective configuration, because before such weight modification occurs, first the activity in all hidden layers will be adjusted to the state which, we, uh, which the neurons should have after the training. And only after we adjust the activity in hidden units to the desired state, then we modify the weights to reinforce this particular pattern of activity. And uh, this uh, prospective configuration is not a new algorithm which we invented. It's instead a, a feature of many um, existing models of, of learning, and in particular, um, <coughs> models in the family of energy-based models, which uh, where um, activity involves to reduce an energy function which describes certain set of constraints which we want the network to satisfy. And uh, these energy-based models include, for example, Hopfit networks or predictive coding networks. And um, we notice that uh, this prospective configuration reduces the interference. So it allows the network to learn new information while preserving information already stored. And we try to come up with a minimal example illustrating uh, the benefits uh, of this and the reduction of the interference. And we came up with this example. So very often, the brain needs to make prediction in some modality on the base of some other modalities. Uh, so imagine that there is a bear which always hunts for salmon in this river. Uh, so in the mind of this bear, whenever the bear uh, sees the river, it will predict the smell of the salmon and sound of the water. But imagine that on a given day, the bear has an injured ear, for example, because there was a fight with another bear, and doesn't hear the sound, right? So there is a negative prediction error in the auditory cortex. And the bear has to learn that for a few days there would be no sound of the river. And backpropagation can, of course, solve this problem for us. So what will happen is that uh, backpropagation would pr propagate this error through the network. And the key point is that um, in backpropagation algorithm, when, while the error is propagated, the activity of neurons doesn't change. So the activity of neurons is denoted here by color. And then backpropagation would modify the weights, so it would reduce the weights on this pathway. And it seems that this is a good thing to do because uh, on the next uh, day, um, the sight of the river would not trigger the prediction of the sun. So we achieved our goal. However, please note that by doing this, we also reduced the weights on the pathway for, from, the, uh, from the vision to smell. So we reduced the prediction of the smell of the salmon. And this is like a striking example of interference because the smell of the salmon was correctly predicted on the previous trial, and, um, and by learning to uh, reduce the expectation of the sound, backpropagation would um, reduce this weight. And uh, our bear would uh, not feel the smell of salmon and be hungry. Now, in prospective configuration, we first um, change the pattern of activity um, of the neurons in the hidden heat layers to the one which, we, um, which the network should produce after learning. And then the prediction errors are recalculated. And now the network kind of realizes that there is actually a positive prediction error um, in the um, olfactory cortex, because uh, the smell is there, but its prediction will be weaker with this new pattern. So uh, what um, may happen is that these uh, connections will be reduced, but to uh, reduce this error, also this connection will increase. Um, and this will um, reduce the interference, and our, some, our bear can happily hunt for salmon. Well, mm -hmm. Doesn't that happen during backprop as well? Because you backprop in both directions, right? Yeah. As soon as you weaken those, another one's going to have to strengthen. Uh, so, no, so in backprop, like if you just have a single iteration of backprop. On one, one iteration. Yes, yes, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, 
Um, no, 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 no. So I, I think that the, I, you know, I gave a talk in Gatsby, and maybe you remember that I was showing that even if you have multiple iterations, you'll have much bigger kind of detour in backdrop than oh, yeah, in that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. So now, how this magical property may may arise? So, so this this, this property uh, of prospective configuration arises in a family of models which include predictive coding networks, which uh, are my kind of favorite models, and. Uh, um, and the predictive coding networks are described by a set of differential equations, and some people find them difficult to understand. But Yu Hang came up with this uh, mechanical analogy, which is a simple uh, abstract machine made of uh, uh, um, rods and, st and strings, which performs the same computation as predictive coding networks. So let me just describe it, this machine to give you intuition how, how they work. Um, so I will describe it for the example of a simple network with three neurons. Um, and uh, kind of connected in a line. So in this mechanical analogy, activity of a neuron corresponds to a height of a node sliding on a vertical post. So in this uh, network, this neuron has little activity, this neuron has medium activity, and this neuron has high activity. The connection between the neuron uh, corresponds to a rod pointing from presynaptic neuron to another node, which is like an input node, and the height of this input node uh, is basically the presynaptic activity uh, multiplied by the corresponding weight. So weight parameters in this machine determine how the presynaptic activity translates to the height of this input node. And the key point of predictive coding networks is that the activity of a neuron is not fixed to their input, but rather it could be thought as connected to it by a spring. So we have the springs here in red. And the springs are in their natural uh, state contracted. So the springs try to bring the activity closer to this uh, input. OK, so now how does this machine operate? So for example, imagine that we are making a, a prediction. So during prediction, we just constrain the input. So there is a pin here to represent this. And now let the um, um, machine relax to reduce the potential energy of all the springs. And, uh, if we only constrain the input, uh, the actual um, energy can be reduced to zero, and, all, uh, and basically the um, activity can be equated with inputs, and, that, and the network makes the same prediction as the artificial neural network would with corresponding weight. Right? So, so here in this example, the weights are one, because the, the, the lines are horizontal, so um, we get the same output as the input. Now, during training, uh, we constrain both input and output, and then when we relax the machine, uh, the energy can no longer be reduced to zero. Right? So once the energy cannot be reduced by changing the activity, we will modify the weights to further reduce energy. And this will correspond in this case to uh, tuning this, this, this rod so they are uh, steeper. Uh, and, um, and the network will make a, a more similar prediction. So uh, I find this mechanical analogy uh, very useful. Uh, so actually, I built it, uh, this machine from Lego of my children. I borrowed from them. And you, can, you are welcome to play with it uh, after the talk. And uh, my son, 11-year-old uh, son, Ben, helped me to make a video, because of course he's much better in making videos than me, uh, on how this machine works. So let me, let's see if it works, right? So in this mechanical analogy, uh, this is a neuron, right? Uh, this is the input node, so they are kind of sliding uh, in, in this Lego version on two different posts. And the error is represented by the extension of the rubber bands, which tries to bring them together. <clears throat> so during prediction, we only constrain the input to the machine, uh, and the network makes the prediction. So in this case, the weights are one, right, because the connections are horizontal, so, the, so we get the input equal to the output. Now, during training, we constrain both input and output. And now you can see that the errors can, cannot be reduced fully to zero. Um, so we have to modify the weights. Sorry, I think. So we modify the weights to, uh, to further reduce the error. Uh, and now, when the network is making the prediction again, you can see that now the prediction is much closer to the target. And now you can enjoy the whole video. <laughs> OK, it's, uh, it's <laughs> okay. so now um, 
the, the nice uh, kind of feature of these predictive coding networks is that actually there exists a very simple network structure which is kind of mathematically fully equivalent to this machine, right, and performs exactly the same uh, computation. So let me uh, kind of uh, walk you through this equivalence. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, the predictive coding network run, uh, developed by Ryan Ballard equivalent to this machine. So the network itself includes two types of neurons. So there are blue neurons, which corresponds to the height of the blue balls, and there are red neurons, which encode prediction errors, and their activity corresponds to um, extension of the springs. And there's a particular pattern of connections between this. So um, the connections with um, white endings are the inhibitors, so they have little minuses here, and the field connections are excitatory, they have uh, little pluses uh, between them, and you can understand why they are connected um, um, in this way by looking at this machine. So let us think about the prediction error first. So, that, so prediction error neurons should calculate the ex extension of the spring. So, so the extension of the spring is the difference between the activity of the corresponding value neuron minus the prediction from the previous layer. So these neurons get excitatory input from the value neurons and inhibition from the previous layer scaled by weight w. Now, if you think about the changes of activity of this node in this machine, for example, this node is driven uh, by two springs. So this spring pulls it up, and this spring pulls it down. Right? So again, it has excitatory connection from this prediction error neuron and inhibitory connection from this prediction error neuron. But the coolest aspect of this network is that the weight modification, which reduces the energy, actually corresponds to Hebbian plasticity. So, let, so let me kind of explain why this is the case. So let us kind of consider how this weight could be modified to, modify, uh, to reduce potential energy. So this weight only affects the energy of this spring. And so um, the way it should modify should depend on two factors. First, on the extension of this spring. So you should only kind of modify the um, weight if there is an error to be minimized. And secondly, on the presynaptic activity. Because if presynaptic neuron has activity zero, the input will be zero no matter what the weight is, so modification of weight would not have effect on the error. So, so basically, the but, um, extension of the spring and the presynaptic activity are the two factors which should determine the modification of the weights. But now, when you see where this weight is encoded in the circuit, it sees that it exactly connects the neurons encoding the prediction errors and the, and the uh, values from the previous layer. So the modification which reduces the energy actually corresponds to Hebbian plasticity. So here you can see how the um, machine or predictive coding network can solve the Salmon problem, which I described earlier. So this is the kind of machine corresponding to the Salmon problem. So we have visual neurons, um, olfactor new neurons, and um, auditory neurons. So, so here the bear doesn't hear the sound of the river, so there is a massive negative prediction error. So, uh, so now when such network lands, it first relaxes to an equilibrium. So during equilib uh, this relaxation, just to reduce the potential energy, <coughs> excuse me, this neuron will go down. And when this neuron goes down, please note that there is also a positive prediction error here. Um, so now the weights are modified to reduce all the errors. So we reduce these two weights, but this weight is increased because there's, you know, um, this input is being pulled up by the presence of the smell of the salmon. So that on the next trial, um, when we make a prediction, the prediction for the sound is reduced, but prediction for the smell is maintained. So from this toy example, we would expect that this uh, prospecting configuration would also have some kind of benefit in learning in bigger tasks. So we wanted to test it on um, on some learning tasks, and of course, machine learning provides a great uh, benchmark for testing. So, um, so we use kind of traditional benchmark, in particular the fashion MNEST uh, data set, um, which are the pictures of uh, clothes which belong to 10 classes. But we use variants of this uh, benchmark to adapt it more to the way biological organisms need to learn. So for example, um, um, OK, so we tried several things. and. Um, <coughs> maybe before I present this, uh, this result, let me just um, remind you that the way artificial neural networks are trained involved 
uh, involves uh, um, training with batches. So um, you first calculate the weight modification for several training examples, and then you average them and calculate and then update the weights based on the average. And if you train predictive coding and backpropagation in this way, uh, so these are networks with four layers with the same number of neurons, uh, they perform identically, and this was already demonstrated previously by my former student, James Whittington. Um, but of course, this is not a realistic uh, training regime, uh, because you know, we cannot wait for 64 interactions with a tiger before we can update our expectations of what, what we will have. So we have to have uh, single shot learning. And if you allow, um, if you force single shot learning, there's a small advantage of predictive coding over big propagation. So um, here I'm quantifying the speed of learning by mean test error, and in all the graphs which I'm, which I'm showing, the learning rate was optimized for a given model. <coughs> but the um, main difference between uh, the performance appears in situations where there is some pre-existing knowledge um, in the network, and the network needs to avoid interference. Um, so for example, in the concept drifting tasks, we trained the network on uh, Fashion and Nest, and then periodically uh, changed the mapping of some output neurons to the classes. Um, <coughs> and you can see the performance of uh, backpropagation, prospective configuration, and you can see that in this task there's indeed significant difference of performance, which is kind of uh, consistent with this um, reduction of um, interference. And if you think about this, this um, concept drifting task is like a scaled up version of the Salmon problem. So it's not so surprising. It also has some benefits if the um, training says, uh, set is, um, has limited size uh, in con continual learning problems and in deep reinforcement learning problems. OK, so maybe I'll just skip it. And um, so in summary, I uh, would like to propose that um, during learning in biological networks, the networks first infer the activity of all the neurons in the hidden layers, which the network should produce after learning. And only this modifies the weights to reinforce this pattern of activity. And this allows the network to reduce the interference, and in case of our um, Salmon problem allows the bear to happily hunt for salmon. So I would like to thank my group, and in particular, Yu Hang Song, uh, <coughs> who led work on this project. And if you are interested uh, in details, uh, the, the paper um, describing it has been published in Nature Neuroscience. Thank you very much. OK, thanks very much, Rafael. Uh, I think the first hand was right here. Yeah. Here. So you say you let the activities converge. Have you tested regimes where you like approximate the convergence, like just alternate the update steps? Yes. So. Uh, so we have tested this, and the, the paper describing this work has been just accepted for iClear this year. And this is work by uh, another um, talented um, PhD student called Tommaso Salvatore. And it also works, and we also understand why it works. So let me just kind of explain you how it works, uh, why it works. <coughs> so um, in our previous work, um, before we realized that, that, that this prospective, prospective mechanism is beneficial, we were obsessed in uh, actually getting these predictive coding networks to do back propagation exactly. And uh, various members of my group had various ideas how you can make the, this predictive coding networks do back prop exactly. And for example, James Whittington noticed that you can do this. Uh, so the, the general principle is that you have to prevent the changes of neural activity in the hidden layer, and then uh, then you will get a backdrop in this predictive coding network. And James Whittington had one um, mechanism which essentially corresponded to making the springs in the last layer weaker than in all other layers. But uh, uh, then Yu Hang also proposed that you can also get a backdrop if you just modify the weights in one particular moment of time, just at the beginning of the inference. So then you get backdrop exactly in this predictive coding network. Um, so this is a new Rips paper from 2020. So um, now, in the regime which we described, where you modify the weights all the time, you will get a mixture of backprop and prospective configuration. So at the beginning, you get backprop exactly, because this is, uh, uh, this is what Yuhang uh, demonstrated happens in this network at the beginning of, uh, of, this, uh, with, uh, of this update. 
And then you have a mixture, and then the line converges to the one which you get in, uh, standard predictive coding. And since backdrop is not like a terrible learning algorithm, uh, it, the, the, the network employing this, uh, <coughs> this mixed uh, um, structure also works very well. Mark? Uh, thank you, Rafael. I was wondering what's going on with your backdrop? Because usually when you lower the learning rate, convergence should just improve, you know? Do you stop after a certain number of epochs all the way or so? Because usually lower backdrop just means better convergence. So and you see it going up again, so I wonder what's going on there. So are you referring to a particular graph? Yeah, yeah. To each one back, I guess. There are two more back, I guess. <laughs> one more back? Okay, here, for instance, it fell asleep. So a lower learning rate increases the, the test <coughs> rate. That, that's all to me. Okay, because so usually the, the, the smaller you make it, the better you approximate. Yes, so I, I think that uh, in this particular regime, because we are kind of interested in um, more biologically related uh, situations. So in biology, you probably don't have 10 million uh, time in your lifetime for 10 million training iterations, right? So we had a fixed number of training iterations. I don't um, um, remember what it, what it is. And if you have a fixed number of training iterations, if your learning rate is too small, then you don't converge uh, before, uh, before the um, uh, simulation time elapses. Okay. Back? Yeah. Uh, could you talk about the relationship between this algorithm and the contrast in heavy learning proposed by Joshua Benedict's group, it seems to be here you also need like a clan phase and a free phase. So what is that information do you need when you update like say a, a snap width? Okay, so maybe I don't need to have a uh, look for slides. <coughs> so their algorithm also tries to um, approximate backdrop exactly, right? So what they are doing, they are um, not not setting the output to a particular value, but when the training data is here, for example, they would just slightly nudge it, yes. so slightly move it, and this allows them to kind of maintain the activity of neurons where it is. And this is another kind of family of, uh, of uh, an example of, of this, the same thing what with, uh, James Whittington did for um, predictive coding. Celio uh, and Benjo, Celio um, and Benjo did this for contrastive Hegel learning, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, but you know, I, I think that um, contrastive Hegel learning can work also if you do not do this nudging, but you will just uh, set the values yes, uh, to, yes. to, to, to the target. Um, and we have some analysis of this kind of algorithm in the supplementary materials of our paper. Yes, over here. Um, how long do you think the time scales are for the relaxation loop and for the update of the weights? And also, how much of the activity you see in the brain is actually reducing this energy or solving like the tasks in a forward path? Because those might be like mixed. So. In the brain, we, we kind of think it's uh, relatively quickly, the network converges uh, probably uh, on a, a time scale shorter than you have to, I don't know, learn a new information. Now, in terms of numerics, I, okay, so I have to admit that I tried to advertise a little bit this model, but if you now try to kind of use it for machine learning, you will notice that actually you don't get much speed up because each, uh, although in terms of iterations, this one is faster, the, uh, each iteration here involves this kind of relaxation process, which is quite long. And so, um, Tomaso, in this paper, which I mentioned has been uh, accepted for iClear, demonstrated that when you use this kind of version of predictive coding, <coughs> about which you ask that um, you do the updates in parallel, and you do a very clever caching of information, you can get implementation which is as fast as backdrop. Yes, but then you have to do it in a very clever way. So. Uh, so, so we have one kind of numerical uh, implementation which is um, equ equivalent with in the speed um, to backdrop, but it's kind of complicated and kind of restricted on certain domains. And if, if you, you are interested, uh, uh, this is a paper by Tommaso Salvadori in IQ. The title is Incremental Predictive Coding. Also at the back, thanks. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you could um, talk a bit about the um, direction that, like, the symmetry that you have in the strings by the relaxation process 
how that maps onto like directionality of new York connections. connections are bidirectional, so, so it would seem that the network is um, symmetric, but in fact, is, uh, the network has also a probabilistic interpolation, so I'm not sure if some people maybe attended my talk yesterday when I was actually talking about this kind of more probabilistic interpretation of these crazy poly networks, uh, and actually corresponds to asymmetric probabilistic model. Um, and in this particular um, um, version, I was considering a model where the input predicts the output. Um, so yes, so in the implementation, the connections are symmetric, but actually they, uh, they are not fully symmetric and they correspond to a particular um, uh, directed uh, probabilistic model. Okay. okay, let's thank Rafael once more. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for attending this morning's session. So I was thinking for the panel session, I'll uh, have some prepared questions, I'll kick off with one, and then open it to the floor, but also if you prefer, you can also feel free to ask a question on the ask. I'll monitor that, and I can't guarantee I'll ask all the questions, but I'll I promise to ask at least some, if you prefer. But otherwise you can just stick up your hand uh, after my first question. <laughs> okay, so this is for anybody, really. Um, do you think the brain uses all of unsupervised, supervised, and reinforcement learning? And if so, how do they interact? <laughs> I think they use all of them. I have no idea how they interact, but um, it's, it seems important. <laughs> I'm looking at what Kim said. Okay. Um, you should give us first drinks before you make <laughs> Okay, here's one. Um, how do you personally go about discovering and studying brain learning rules? What's your process? Or strategies? I can I can say I, I borrow aggressively from uh, like machine learning research. Um, oftentimes, I, I think it often comes in the form of like you see a paper or you talk to a person and they're like this is working really well and you're thinking oh that's that's like pretty novel and creative and that's really interesting and then you start thinking is this a terrible match for brain data or or at least kind of a, a novel idea to introduce to the community um, and um, that's pretty much my my process. Um, there are, yeah, there are other processes that might be more bottom up from a biological perspective, but that, that's sort of mine. Yes, I agree that probably you can classify the processes most, mostly as bottom up or top down. And different people have different preference what kind of combination of the two they like to employ. I, I would say conversation, um, talking about science, and think asking, wouldn't it be cool if, or something like that. So a mixture between ripping down other people's results or your own results, for that matter, and uh, and addressing how addressing the weaknesses you find uh, by asking new questions. Yes, yeah, so I think it's a very good point because. Many of the rules which we have seen today are on a different level. So, <clears throat> for example, I think you focus on uh, rules for spike independent plasticity, while, um, for example, other talks looked at um, rules on the kind of fine uh, rate level. <clears throat> so, even there's a gap between these two levels, and it's kind of interesting to think and investigate how to bridge this gap and how um, the rules from one level kind of relate to rules on the other one. It's interesting that none of you mentioned data. You don't stare at data for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the bottom-up approach, right? Actually, in this experiment, we came, I, that kind of did happen, because I think we came at it with some really structured hypotheses, like replay or elastic weight consolidation, which is kind of remapping-y. 
Um, and then we started running some models, and we realized we kind of had no idea what we wanted to look at them for. Like they can do different stuff in different conditions, and we just actually wanted to look at the data a lot first, and then kind of pivoted almost entirely to analyzing the data. And now I'm starting to look at the models again. But it was it was interesting how not useful it was to look at the models in this particular case um, before really like knowing what we were getting into um, data wise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody? Well, that's well, as a student, do you have like a, how, <laughs> how you do things in a, in a different way? <laughs> um, I mean, I I feel like uh, two of the projects I worked on, I guess, were more top down. Just like we started with some algorithm in machine learning, whether that was like success representation or in the case of the US paper, like. Um, attention-based key value memory, and then just had that equation and said, from the toolbox of what we allow learning rules to have biologically, um, how do we derive a rule for that? But yeah, I think I'm still getting used to sort of this bottom-up approach of some on data set, for instance, where um, I don't even think I can articulate exactly what we did. I feel like we were just kind of throwing around ideas and playing around with stuff. and. Um, yeah, it's kind of a very, it, it feels almost like a less structured, but maybe um, kind of like fun in a different way. Yeah? To what extent do you think that our assumptions about what your presentation is like affect the learning rules that we um, look for? And an example of that is that sometimes we assume that there's very code, sometimes we assume control code, sometimes we assume burst, we might assume that there are place fields, we might assume that there are bar impact what variables we are looking for? And is, does that limit us in some sense? I, I mean, I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, I feel like uh, this is sort of um, something that we've been hoping to get at towards the end, and I would say it's probably important for other, like you said, like temporal or rate code and things, which is just like, not just stopping at your particular model and your learning goal, but then at least like expanding and looking at literature and saying like, how how would I like flip this to um, I don't know like if, if for instance your model is in like a, a rate network, how does this look for a spiking network and um, is there a reasonable way to connect this to other models? I guess that's sort of the approach that we've taken, but. I would say by the failures, right? Like if, if your if your the biases you bring into a question contribute to your failures, then at some point hopefully you hit your shins enough that you change change position. But I think the implicit uh, assumption there that your your biases your make dogmatic biases will hugely contribute to how you formulate. The solution to a problem you see uh, is, 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 a, is an issue. Yeah. Um, I think the question of whether one can locate a biologically plausible implementation of backprop has been like an organizing thing for a while. Um, is this still a useful frame? Uh, how do you how do you think about this? Well, so of course I tried to argue in my talk that that's not about the process. Blake is sitting and making me angry now. So I I know. Know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, so I think I'm smiling knowing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, I, I think it's, it's uh, predictive coding, for example, or, or this prospecting relation still sh shares a lot of similarities with backdrop, right? So even though it's it's I try to kind of frame it and set it as fundamentally different constraints, but it's, in reality it's a little tweak on backdrop, right? Uh, so, so you are doing something similar, but instead of just propagating errors first, you first calculate the, the, the values and then update the, the weights, right? So, so, I, so I think um, mm, it's still a useful framework. So what I wanted to kind of say in my talk, that, you sh that, but, that it's a useful thing to think how we can get something similar to backdrop, but we shouldn't be obsessed with getting backdrop exactly. So sometimes you know we try to match backdrop like 100%, and uh, and then and maybe we we enforce in our models constraints which are not even present in the real brain. The record, I agree.
Okay, great. Thank you. I, I, for me, it's not so relevant as to like whether it's important. I, I mostly don't care, I think. Um, I try to mop the floor in a different corner of the room from where everyone else is mopping, and it seems like there's enough people considering that question uh, so that I try to you know, clean a different part of the house. Um, that's my take on it. I, I, I just not my expertise, so I just wandered somewhere else. I, I was just wondering, couldn't with your approach you mock the same corner of the floor? Because I mean, you optimize now for homeostasis and kind of activity, but let's say you would train on a task and kind of you know where the back profit would lead you, and then you would kind of run all of your thought memory routes and see which one is kind of getting you in the right direction. Possibly. Um, I would need someone to do that who actually knows what they're talking about when they say back prop and that's not me I would say. Um, so I would humbly help someone else mop. Um, maybe <laughs> 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 the concern to never achieve this, right? Uh, like how it's a little bit in this question like how close do you want to approximate this? Yeah. I mean you know like has you not been very happy to your question so maybe <laughs> Well, I just I, I think there's there's a, a long-standing interesting question that maybe we just don't have to compute to answer, unfortunately. Which is, if you really throw metal in at many different tasks, is what's going to emerge going to be back propagation exactly, or is it going to look different if you impose certain constraints? We get kind of one of those tin guts. It's a great question. It's one we and other groups have tried to tackle, but. It's hard, even with the amount of compute we have today, to do that because really the metal really properly requires compute. Yes, Barbara. Um, I wanted to go back to in your timeline. You you noted Candell's uh, thing, and he didn't just do habituation; he also showed associative learning. And I, I like to think of it as Candellian learning versus Hebbian learning, and I don't understand why. No one looks at Candelian learning, Can you explain which essentially thing? doesn't. So Hebbian learning requires the postsynaptic activity, whereas Candel showed that you have a neuro release of a neurotransmitter coupled with the activity of the presynaptic neuron, you get a change in the weight. And certainly in invertebrate systems, in the fly system, for example, that's exactly the kind of learning rule we see. So I'd be interested if the panel. Why, why is everyone so obsessed <laughs> with SDVP, or if they have an insight into why? Just to clarify, sorry, it's the fact that the two, more than two inputs are correlated in time. That's the it's, it's two inputs correlated in time, but it's not the presynaptic and the postsynaptic. It's yeah, the presynaptic pre and some other signal. Right. Okay. If you don't want to, I would say we, we can do this. We're agnostic, actually, to. Uh, to where the inputs are coming from, as long as we parameterize them, right? So right now, we don't have another second presynaptic input in the framework, at least for what I've shown you. Uh, we only have pre-post, pre-rate, post-rate, and time constant memory uh, of the window. Um, but in the next iteration of this, where we put codependence with other uh, presynaptic activity in it, if it's important, it will pop out, I mean, hopefully. At least for the thing we're asking, right? There is, again, whether we're asking the right question is whether we're putting the right constraint on. But I, I agree. Um, I was going to say, it seems like what you described is also very similar to behavioral time scale plasticity, where it really is this like third factor that is coming in, and the way change is a function of just the presynaptic activity. And so at least within the hippocampus field, I think people are really interested in that and think of it as a way of like setting what the inputs into the region are. It certainly seems like a more popular. Uh, does this relate to supervised learning, where you get like, it's, it's more convenient and then uh, unsupervised, which is more happy? Is this the right kind of connection? I would say, I mean, a second pre-synapse doesn't necessarily specify whether that's a neuromodulatory or another excitatory or an inhibitory synapse, right? If you flip it to a learning signal of a modulatory kind, then you can argue yes. Yeah. Yes? Um, I think to what extent do you think spikes matter in, in these learning rules? Um, 
I guess there are some extreme opinions on this. There's one extreme that says that you don't really need to think about spikes. You can just have basic biological constraints that say positivity and activity and so on. Uh, and then there's another that says we have to model the, the entire dynamics of the cell in order to understand the learning. So I just wanted to sort of hear your opinions on this. So just maybe now, so I presented a rate-based model. But uh, I, I think, as I mentioned, I think it's important to build bridges between this le different levels of description. And um, since we are in Lisbon, it's kind of good to mention that very nice work in Lisbon, like um, Chris Machens has been done on, and in fact with others, with Sophie Net and Berlin, on trying to develop like spiking version of predictive coding. Right? So, uh, so a lot of this kind of work which I described for fine trace can be kind of also translated to a spiking network. And um, <coughs> yes, so I'm answering specifically to, 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 to my talk, but I, I think a general principle is that it's very useful to have the kind of bridges between different levels of theories. Anybody else have comments on other levels, links? Like, so in Kim's case, it's linked us with behavior and the neural data. So do you think that's essential to be bearing behavior in mind with all the time? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. Like behavior, behavior is, is very important. And I think, yeah, I mean, anchoring to, to top down and bottom up both seem like nice ways to constrain things. Um, I think, yeah, a lot of the, like, I guess I've never worked with like a, a, a spiking neural network or, or those kind of like really biologically possible uh, learning rooms for the most part. Um, and I kind of uh, have the like, <laughs> I take comfort in thinking they're both kind of expressive. So there's like a level of, of generality uh, where if you're, you're thinking about the capabilities of a network and looking at certain abstractions or, or phenomena from it, um, they wouldn't necessarily be um, like, they might be. They would be things that would be properties of a learning rule system that could happen in either one. But in terms of like bridges between levels, um, I think probably I, I and, and a lot of people could benefit from knowing like when that assumption breaks down. What's the high level property you might be thinking about that really does move around based on what learning rule you're using? Um, this is probably something on which there's already a literature, and I, I should consult it. Or if you guys have thoughts on it, um, maybe I'd be curious. Um, I would. I would say two levels. Two things play into this. Number one is what level of interest you are the interest, understanding you're interested in. If you want to understand algorithmically what's going on, maybe you don't need spikes. Uh, but if you if you want if you're interested in the implementation and the biological implementation, I think spikes are the de facto uh, tool that neurons are interacting with. Uh, so you're going to have to take them into consideration, and then. The second part is the economy of science, right? Like, I incorporate spikes because I know I know that I won't be able to compete with DeepMind, etc. Uh, when they, you know, for building great networks, like my strength is spikes, and I know that they really don't give a crap. So I, I will not get I will not get cut, right? Off in that different part of the floor. <laughs> Next question. Can I just double check? Has anybody tried to ask a question on the Move app? You have? You have? Yeah. You have? I'm just confused why it's not coming up. Did you ask on the. I asked in the, the panel session. Yeah, because yeah. I can't see the QA for this particular section. You see the question. the QA, so I asked in the chat. In the chat, okay. Right. Yeah. Should check that. <laughs> well, you can go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's fine. Right. To what extent do you think the real effects like activity? And then my animation play into learning in the brain. To what extent do axonal effects play into learning? Well, real cells in general, but like my animation. I think this comes back to the question that Maya really asked earlier. Uh, she asked how our biases bring us uh, to our answers. And, uh, and something that I know Maya is interested in is non-synaptic learning. So whether a memory really manifests itself only in the synapses of the system, or whether there's other places we could put them. And there's some, you know, beautiful work by by other people, by Susanna, for example, who's looking at where mitochondria align themselves in the neuron. And similarly, your question is pointing at and other mechanisms that would strengthen or weaken uh, particular neurons for doing something. 
uh, so I, I wouldn't neglect it. I would, but uh, it's a matter of how many things you can look at at once, right? Anybody else? Any thoughts on other stuff other than neurons and synapses? Yeah. Uh, so, like, I love the work that's being done for, like, I don't know, like, for, like, you're working with you and I'm trying to think, like, you know, like, to be in the But, I mean, as you mentioned, like, we're all looking at the whole project right now. So, like, we're looking at the, uh, our biases of, like, this situation should be, like, happening to like, and directly, like, making that behavior. But I feel like, in brain, there's, like, different types of also learning and different learning models, which are the things at the same time. And I wonder if you guys, like, have thought about how to deal with that. Like, kind of like avoid just basically like feeding our models to the data we have, like, kind of like trying to like integrate things like here. Yeah, I mean, it, so in, in our task, it would have been really, more like, it's great to be able to look at what hippocampus is doing for a really long period of time. Also, it'd be really cool to look at how hippocampus and cortex are interacting. There's, like, really nice hypotheses about that. Um, I think, like, Ching's work, not the, the um, multiple objectives interacting together, the, the stuff in the main meeting, um, I think really speaks to that. Um, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. <laughs> Just like, you know, uh, if, if you're trying to think about how different regions are, like, maybe learning to do different things or learning under different objectives, they could affect the system in, in complex ways that are kind of hard to follow. Yeah. <laughs> the literature search from the ML perspective, it seems like, you know, if you have a mix of uh, slower or faster learning in different regions, um, it, it can change like sort of what objectives you need. Like sometimes mixing different learning speeds can actually make the problem easier. Like in our, in our case, uh, you don't have to worry about representation class if you're careful about where you put different learning speeds in different regions. And so I guess that's just to say, yeah, it seems important. <laughs> it seems interesting. Yeah. Oh, I mean, tips talk really like get quite elaborate with the number of different combinations of rules you need. So, like, is this something that you deal with? Like, I, I know you're citing, say, Friedman Zanke, work thought a lot about how to combine these rules to get, you know, take a bunch of boxes. How do you find it in this particular problem? I think it might, to be honest, I mean, I, I'm probably wrong about this, but I think it might be the other way around, that the shape of the plasticity rules actually informs us about the function of the particular region, um, so that when you, um, sorry, when I'm taking on the tonality of your speaking, I'm really sorry. Um, I started swinging my, my words up, to, up and down. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. We see that uh, particular rules are better or worse at forgetting or, or not forgetting, right? Uh, what I've shown at the very end of the talk that you have these rules that are all producing stability, but some of them remember a, a, a sensory or a stimulus for hours after we present it and others forget it within 10 minutes. And it turns out that the shape of the plasticity rules uh, has a lot to do with that. And you could argue that, you know, the, the, the neurons in a particular brain region have come with a particular plasticity rule for whatever reason, and they become experts at remembering something for a short time or for a long time, and that the wiring that they produce with each other depends a little bit on the expertise that they bring to the table. So it might be flipped from the other way around. Okay, we're nearly out of time, so sorry, I just have one question I really want to ask this panel. I don't really want to ask that question. <laughs> Yes. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, okay, my first study overwhelmed with this amount of shapes. Uh, and honestly, it feels like I could just write any kind of shape, and this probably wouldn't work in one case or another. And I would like to know. I would like to know 
if there is a dynamical change that you could have on, on, on this type of system that changes that shape uh, according to what is happening? What kind I don't of know the answer to this. Okay. I mean, I, I think I'm with Blake in that just changing one wiggle is, is not like... What do you, what you say about this the, the neuron noise that you're always observing experiments and it's not just quite easy to pinpoint what is strictly is producing that shape? Absolutely. But let's take that offline because yeah, I don't okay. answer. Thank you. Okay, I'll ask my thank you. I'll ask my question now. Uh, I can find it. Yeah, so right, many people at Cosine, for example, and in this field use back propagation to train neural networks uh, and they go interpret their dynamics or representations and then they hope to make an inference about the brain. So do you see any risks with that approach? Like what do you think back propagation is gonna create artifacts in the representations that people might make bad inferences about the brain? Some conclusions should translate to biological brains, but, and the question is that maybe not all of them, right? So, for, for example, the, the example of the model which I presented would uh, inherit a lot of properties from um, the propagation, and for example, like Andrew Sachs has this beautiful analysis of learning dynamics in artificial neural networks, and he recently was showing that he, when he tried to apply the same analysis of selective coding, and he gets exactly the same results. So, so many of these results kind of uh, generalize. However, there are also differences. So for example, in our paper, we have this whole list of experimental predictions where um, predictive coding would generate different predictions than that. Right? So, so I think that most of the things generalize, but there are also differences. So, so this is kind of answering the question on the example of... Uh, yeah, but how do you know which, gen which results to trust and which not to trust? Well, so you can always try to interpret the result in the uh, light of particular models. Uh, the, the best way to answer this question is to try to simulate various alternative models um, to match the data and see which models can reproduce the data. And maybe, well, if I may kind of offer this to the field to, uh, while trying to kind of explain the data, maybe you can, in addition to try and fit uh, the propagation, train predictive coding networks, which are actually also scalable and um, can be trained easily and see what, what kind of uh, values models predict for the data. Shane, have you tried that uh, back, back prop training? Because uh, most of your presentation was about sort of more biologically possible rules, but have you done any comparisons? Uh, no, no, I've um, not. Um, but definitely it's something that I think we've thought about, especially in the project with Kim, which is fully back prop, where it's like, Presumably there's a lot of different ways to do gradient descent. Backpop is one of them. Um, it seems like it would be interesting to see if other ways of doing gradient descent do lead to different representations or different representational changes in the trajectory of learning. I don't know that that has been checked out. It would be something that I feel like uh, is, is what I'm curious about for answering this question. In the context of our project, obviously. Okay, uh, we're over time, so let's stop there. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second part of the workshop dedicated to learning rules in the brain. Uh, the first speaker is Blake Richards from McGill University and Mila. So, here. Okay. So uh, thanks very much for having me. This has uh, been a fun workshop so far and I'm uh, really pleased to be here. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, something with a different flavor today, uh, but I'm going to connect it to my broader philosophy that I think was raised during the conversation <laughs> in the panel discussion earlier, and uh, which I think is, is worthwhile clarifying per the uh, request of the workshop organizers, in fact. So, the, the, the specific topic, though, is going to be about uh, evidence for non-Euclidean synaptic plasticity in the brain. And I'm going to break down for you what that means in a second. First, let me actually launch into that philosophical question. So how I'm going to get here is by talking about normative models. So let's, let's take a high-level look at this question of how to model learning. I think everyone would agree that the 
specific way that you're going to model learning rules in the brain is uh, based on what your goals are. So I'm borrowing here the uh, nomenclature developed by Colin Breedenberg and Christina Savan uh, in their review paper. So we can have biophysical models where we have explicit relationships to biological mechanisms, and these are great for identifying poten potential physical mechanisms of information storage in neurons. We can also have phenomenological models, which are very useful for linking experimental results in synaptic plasticity to network models. These are the kind of STDP type models that Tim was telling you about earlier, and which um, I think have been a mainstay of computational neuroscience for a long time. And then you can have normative models. And these are models that you have designed potentially at a high level to actually be optimizable for non-toy behavioral tasks. Image identification, controlling an arm, parsing text, generating images, whatever. Um, now, of course, our ultimate goal should be multi-level models. We want to have models that link all the way down from behavior, complex behavior to biological phenomena. But you can't just chew it all off at once. And um, necessarily, people pick their spot that they're going to focus on. Now, for me, I really like normative models. And they're something which I think were ignored in computational <laughs> neuroscience for far too long. When I was a, comp when I was a graduate student in the noughties, um, there were very few normative models out there. And that has started to change over the last 10 years. But uh, I, and I'm glad to see that, because I think it was a mistake to ignore normative models. Because I would argue if you, if you can't, don't have models that can actually learn the things that animals learn, you don't have a model of learning, you have a model of something else. So um, let's just break this down a bit. Let's, let's start now with a normative principle, because as I said, I really like normative models. So, what should a synaptic learning rule achieve? This is what I mean by normative. Some people say, what does normative mean? Normative means it's something that gives you an explicit rule that guides you. You should do X. So, we're going to ask a normative question. What should a synaptic learning rule achieve? And I would argue that the most obvious thing it should achieve is that it should improve behavior as much as possible for as little metabolic cost to the neurons as possible. And whether that has to be, how we measure that metabolic cost is, though, uh, a complicated question. And we're going to come to this in a second. But let's mathematically lay this out. So we have a very simple equation here. Our synaptic weights at time t plus 1 are going to be basically whatever set of synaptic weights w minimize our loss function. So we're going to measure our behavior with a loss function that we want to minimize. The system's going to be better at doing the behavior as the loss function gets lower. So we want to minimize that loss function. But we also want to minimize that metabolic cost, if you will. Now, mathematically, so this is, our, this is the measurement of how much does it cost us to get from synaptic state WT to synaptic state W. So we want to find a balance between those two things. We don't necessarily just want synaptic weights that fully improve the behavior. We want things that don't cost us too much either. Now, one way of thinking about that mathematically is that this is like a distance function in synaptic space. What we're asking is, if I have one setting of my synapses and I want to change it to a new setting of my synapses, how much is it going to cost me to do that movement? And another way of phrasing that is, how far away is that new point in synaptic space? How far do I have to walk biologically? How many proteins do I have to insert? How many cytoskeleton elements do I have to change? All these sorts of things. So this is the normative question. How can we best improve behavior with as little cost to the neurons as possible? That is, how can we best improve behavior while traversing as little distance in synaptic space as possible? Now, that leads to a very natural question of what should the distance function be in synaptic space. And ideally, we want something that aligns with biology, of course. Blake? Yeah? Do the first W to be W to be a W? The big... No, because this is the, uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. That should be a W, Peter. Thank you. My apologies. That should be a W. That's an error. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Now, the, the distance function that we pick for our synaptic space 
will determine our synaptic geometry, as it were. So if we have a standard synaptic geometry where everything is all kind of straight and, and linear for us, um, then things are pretty intuitive. So let's say we want to go from the red point in our synaptic space and we're considering either jumping to this purple point or this blue point. Well, with this nice linear Euclidean geometry, it's very easy to see that the blue point is farther away from the red point than the purple point. So if we assume, say, that behaviorally these two new points are identical, then we're going to want to pick the purple point over the blue point just because it's closer in space. It costs us less to go from red to purple than it costs us to go from red to blue. But our synaptic space might not be Euclidean. It might be curved. It might have weird geometries. If it's all bunched up here at the top, maybe it's actually the equivalent distance to go from red to purple as it is from red to blue, in which case maybe it'll be hard to pick between these two situations. Or alternatively, maybe we've got a really funky synaptic space where crossing this zero point for synaptic weight one is verboten because it's like undefined in the distance function or something like that. In which case, um, you can't even do this. It costs infinite or undefined amounts. So necessarily, you have to pick to go from the red to the blue space. And as you'll see in a moment, this actually is exactly what you get with uh, some really interesting distance functions that I think match biology better. OK, so let's break this down a little bit more. This, is the most, this slide is the most math that I'm going to show you in this uh, talk, but it's, it's critical to understand this to really get what I'm talking about in this talk. So um, depending on the distance function you use, and this gets back to what I was saying just a second ago, you get different learning rules with different properties with respect to Dale's law. So you're probably all familiar with Dale's law. Technically, it says that all neurons release just a single neurotransmitter from their terminals. There's, of course, violations to this in biology, but it broadly holds across most neurons and neocortex and many other structures. And um, what it means practically for neural networks is that you can't change the sign of your synapses, because you're either a glutamatergic synapse, in which case you're excitatory, or you're a GABAergic synapse, in which case you're inhibitory. Um, so let's, let's look at this for a second. So here what I've done is I've taken a linear approximation to the uh, distance function. And this is actually why Peter was uh, very correct in that uh, correction. Um, what I'm actually approximating here is the loss at W, and I'm using a first order Taylor uh, approximation to that. So I'm just taking a linear approximation to get my uh, loss function at delta W. So I'm taking delta W T plus uh, linear, uh, so just the, the gradient with uh, multiply at, at WT multiplied by that step. And then I've still got my, my distance term, my proxi proximity penalty term. And here that, that eta, that's just our, our learning rate. Okay, so depending on the distance function you pick, you get different learning rules. For example, if we pick the usual Euclidean distance function, the weight change that minimizes this expression is good old gradient descent. So if you have a Euclidean geometry to your synapses, the optimal learning rule for your synaptic learning mechanism is in fact gradient descent. At, put another way, it is the biggest change in behavior you're going to get for the least amount of synaptic update. But let's say we have a different distance function. So this distance function is the corrected callback Liebler divergence. Um, <laughs> if we want later, we can talk about why I'm introducing this. But this is a very interesting distance function because um, what it does is it produces a learning rule when you do this minimization that's called exponentiated gradient descent. Now, this is a very different update from gradient descent in some important ways. So gradient descent, w at t plus 1 is equal to w t minus your gradient. Whereas in exponentiated gradient descent, W at t plus 1 is equal to W t times e to the negative gradient. This means, first of all, that this is a multiplicative learning rule. So the weight updates that you're going to do are going to depend on your current synaptic weight. As well, this is where I was driving ultimately, these two different learning rules have different properties with respect to Dale's law. So in gradient descent, there is no respect for Dale's law. As far as gradient descent is concerned, 
If I have a synapse that's positive and the best behavioral performance is across the origin and to a negative synaptic strength, doesn't matter as long as it's a relatively short distance uh, in Euclidean distance, I'm going to cross that path. So I'm going to shift my positive weight to negative or vice versa. But in contrast here with exponentiated gradient descent, I can't do that. I have to respect Dale's law. And it's because of this term here. So you'll notice that what this term here says is that if the synaptic signs are different, then I'm taking the log of a negative number, which means it's undefined. So the distance between two synaptic points that are changing signs is actually undefined. And as a result, necessarily, if this is my synaptic distance function, I must respect Dale's law. It will not let me change the signs of my synapses. So that's cool from a biological perspective. And it probably means that it's a lot more aligned with actual biology. You know, if I'm a synapse, I'm a glutamatergic synapse, I literally don't have the option of changing to a GABAergic synapse. It's an undefined distance for me because there is no machinery for me to do that, biologically speaking. It's not like adding more AMPA receptors or removing them or whatever. It's just impossible. So uh, another important thing about this is that different rules find different solutions for your problems. So here's a very simple illustration of that. We have a very simple teacher network where there's literally just two inputs with fixed weights. And we're going to run, pump some data through this. And we have a student output with two weights that's trying to learn uh, from this teacher network. Now, critically, of course, there's many different solutions to this problem. And we're going to look at which one's gradient descent versus exponentiated gradient descent find. And what you can see in some simple simulations that my grad student Arna ran is that um, these two different learning algorithms find different solutions. So gradient here is the actual uh, synaptic weights. So this is weight 0 and weight 1 in the teacher network. These were what the actual teacher network weights were set to. And if we use gradient descent, what it does is it ends up discovering solutions that lie along the equivalent uh, line. So these are technically correct in terms of the error output, but they're different solutions ultimately. Whereas um, exponentiated gradient descent, and in particular stochastic exponentiated gradient descent, where you, you do many batch training, will bring you instead closer to the actual solution. Okay, so a quick summary. My takeaway message so far is that we should start from the normative principle that synaptic rules should improve behavior for as little cost as possible. That is, changing your synapses as little as possible. But for that, you have to decide on what your synaptic distance function is. Yeah? Did I get that right that the red line didn't reach the... Yeah, it can't fully reach it, uh, and we can discuss later why. Yeah. Um, so different learning rules uh, will be produced by selecting different distance functions for your synaptic space. And uh, this ultimately is important because it leads to different solutions. So let's look at how to actually use this experimentally. Uh, can I save questions till the end, actually? Sorry, because I'm time limited here, I'd like to do that. Uh, OK. So let's actually connect it to some data. How can we actually use this if we're experimentalists? Like here, this is supposed to be a conference to connect theorists to experimentalists. Well, we've actually done some work this way. Um, and the way we did it is we used a theoretical tool from uh, machine learning and optimization theory known as mirror descent. So mirror descent is another way of thinking about this problem. And roughly speaking, the way mirror descent works is you think about your synaptic space as something we call the proximal space. And what you're going to do is you have a dual space that's defined by your distance function. The dual space is the space where the changes are linear according to any jump you make. It with a Euclidean distance, and that's determined by what your distance function is in the proximal space. So the way mirror descent works in machine learning is you take your weights in the proximal space, you map them to your dual space, you then do gradient descent in your dual space, and then you map your weights back to your proximal space. And those mapping functions are determined by the distance function that you have here for your proximal space. So um, what we have shown in a paper that's coming out in iClear as a spotlight uh, this year is that as long as the updates to your synapses are sufficiently small, then 
the distribution of synaptic weight changes in your dual space will converge to a Gaussian, no matter how, what, no matter what loss function or data you receive. And that's pretty cool because what that means practically is then you have a way of testing the distance functions in your synaptic weight space. Because what you can do is you can run an experiment where you collect the distribution of your weights before learning, say in blue here, and the distribution of your synaptic weights after learning in red here. You take the difference between those, it's going to give you some distribution of synaptic weight changes in your proximal space, in your synaptic space. And then using a theoretical distance function that you think might be the correct distance function, you can transform that distribution into your dual space. And if you have the correct distance function, that is going to lead to a Gaussian in your dual space. If, however, you have the incorrect distance function, you're going to get a non-Gaussian. So this is a way of testing and falsifying different hypothetical distance functions for your synaptic geometry, experimentally speaking. Now, we tested this in deep nets. This is just showing on a series of different deep nets here. Each plot is a different deep net. Each curve here is a different theoretical distance function. This is, uh, this is the negative entropy, the, the average negative entropy, so related to our callback loop or divergence. These are different uh, norms, the two norm, the Euclidean, the three norm, uh, an extension of that. And then on the bottom here, we have what the actual distance function is. And on the y-axis, we're plotting the difference from the cumulative distribution function for a Gaussian. <coughs> And what you can see is when we train our deep networks with, say, this uh, callback Leibler divergence or negative entropy distance function, then the best fit to a Gaussian CDF in the dual space gets, it, it results from transforming that weight distribution with a negative entropy. Likewise, if it's actually the Euclidean and we train the deep net with that, then um, our best fit to the Gaussian in the dual space is uh, given by transforming it with the two norm distance function. Okay, so the takeaway message here is in the event that your synapses are not changing too drastically, you can actually experimentally test different distance functions. Step one is you measure the synaptic weight distribution before learning. Step two, you measure the synaptic weight distribution after learning. You take the difference between those two distributions and you transform them based on the distance function that you are hypothesizing. If those result in a Gaussian in the dual space, you have the right distance function. Okay, so what does real data tell us now? Uh, so here I'm gonna tell you why I think exponentiated gradient descent is actually a better fit to brains. So first of all, just based on that last experiment I said, now, people haven't run exactly that experiment, unfortunately. But what they have done is they've repeatedly looked at the distribution of synaptic weights in the brain. And what people have repeatedly shown in the literature, uh, a few times anyway, not as many times as I would have liked to be sure about this, but so far, the data suggests that synaptic weights are generally log-normally distributed. This is what we see here from a review from uh, Bujaki and Mizuseki. Um, so in mouse barrel cortex and in rat visual cortex, when you do paired patch clamp experiments to measure synaptic weight distributions and you plot those out, you get a nice log normal distribution. Now, that's interesting because the log normal distribution is what is preserved by exponentiated gradient descent. So if you start with a log normal distribution in your proximal space, the distance function transformation defined by exponentiated gradient descent is uh, actually, the, tra the transformation defined by that is actually just the log. So if you do your updates here, so this is going to give you a Gaussian now, you do your updates here, and then you bring it back with the exponent, which is the transformation, again, defined by exponentiated gradient descent. So what you're going to do is you're going to get back a log normal distribution. In other words, if the distance function is actually the corrected callback Leibler divergence, then what we should see experimentally is that brains have log normal distributions that stay log normal in their distribution even after learning. So if it's true that we always see log normal distributions in the brain, then this is probably, then the, the, the distance function is probably the corrected callback Leibler divergence. Now, the other reason this is interesting though is because there are some really nice properties to this algorithm. 
So first of all, exponentiated gradient descent actually outperforms gradient descent on tasks where the relevant inputs are sparse. So this is a really simple example of that. This is a regression task where you have a bunch of inputs, n inputs, and then a small number of those k that are relevant inputs. These are teacher inputs. So you're going to have some regression task based solely on k of your inputs. And what we can look at then is what happens when we change the ratio of n to k, so the number of irrelevant inputs to the number of relevant inputs. And here we're looking at that change in ratio and we're plotting the performance, uh, the test accuracy of gradient descent versus exponentiated gradient descent. And what you can see is that when the number of relevant synapses is equal to the total number of synapses, gradient descent slightly outperforms exponentiated <coughs> gradient descent. But as we start to change that ratio and we get many more irrelevant inputs to relevant inputs, exponentiated gradient descent far outperforms gradient descent. We can see that also in a biophysical model. So this is work that was done by Brennan Bicknell and Kevin Sheng, uh, which was a wonderful collaboration. They had some biophysical models of pyramidal neurons, and they trained it in the same basic task. The task is there's some subset of synapses that you have to say if they are on or not. If those synapses are on, the expert synapses, then you need to spike. If they're not, you have to not spike. And if you change the ratio of the number of relevant synapses to irrelevant synapses and train this with gradient descent versus uh, exponentiated gradient descent, um, with more irrelevant synapses than relevant synapses, exponentiated gradient descent performs better. And you can see this here as we increase the number of synapses in this model. This also holds in a more realistic task. So here we've got a simulated arm that we're controlling with a series of muscles and it has to hit different targets. But we are additionally injecting noise into this recurrent neural network. So it's got all this external irrelevant noise that's coming in and it somehow has to just focus on the correct inputs for controlling its muscles. And when you do this, um, if you train with gradient descent, you do okay, but you do better training with exponentiated gradient descent. And here you can actually see the performance of the arm as it's reaching towards the different targets. Um, another final piece of work, and then I know I have to wrap up, is uh, interestingly, exponentiated gradient descent handles sparsity and pruning much better than gradient descent. So here we had a test where we were training a recurrent neural network on MNIST. Uh, sequential MNIST, so it receives sequences of the rows of MNIST images and it has to categorize the image. Uh, and then as we were training, we pruned synapses. So we went from uh, 10 to the 2 synapses down to just a few synapses. And what we saw was that um, once we, as we started to prune, event, things were at first fine, but as we started to prune more and more and more, performance dropped. But exponentiated gradient descent was able to recover from that drop significantly better than gradient descent. And this is just a, a quantification of that, the cumulative loss you get from pruning. So you get less change in your loss from your exponentiated gradient descent. OK, so to summarize, the takeaway message is that when we look at the synaptic weight distributions in the brain measured to date, the distance function, uh, sorry, that I should have changed that to distance from potential. The distance function that best fits them is the distance function defined by the callback loop of divergence. And this is nice because it respects Dale's law, it can detect sparse signals, and it is better at recovering from pruning. So I would argue, based on this data so far, this, the implication is that the brain uses non-Euclidean synaptic geometry. But more experiments would help settle this, as, as I described. So to conclude, now a lot of people are going to say to this, uh, but what if the brain doesn't use gradients at all, man? Uh, well, look, I'm going to die on this hill. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if Barlow Mel is in the audience, but he discovered that last night in talking to me. Um, <laughs> normative models cannot be ignored in computational neuroscience. I think we ignored them for far too long. <clears throat> And I'm not saying that all models need to be normative. I'm arguing it's a necessary component for multi-level models because it ensures we're actually studying learning. We're not studying sparsity or homeostasis or all these other nice properties of neural circuits. We're studying reaching for things, recognizing objects, walking, eating, 
all the stuff that animals actually do. That's what they learn. That's what we need our models to do. If you don't have models that don't do that, you're not studying learning, you're studying your model. And so um, if we accept that indeed we need normative models, sorry, my uh, thing seems to have stopped, gradients just drop out of normative models. If you just take this normative principle and you ask, what am I going to get the biggest behavioral improvement from for the least amount of synaptic change, you get gradients. It doesn't always have to be exactly gradient descent, as I showed you. It could be other learning rules, but the gradient's always going to show up in your equations. Now, it's really important to say, and uh, luckily Ching said this for me in the uh, discussion this morning, it is not the case that that means I'm saying the brain does backprop. Backpropagation, to be clear, is one way to estimate gradients. There are many ways to estimate gradients. I am not committed to the idea that the brain does backprop, but I am very much so committed to the idea that the brain has ways of estimating gradients. And I tell you right now, if you have a learning out rule that doesn't follow the gradient to some extent, is totally uncorrelated for it, from it, you're not going to learn fuck all, nothing. <laughs> Your model is going to suck. And this is what we have seen repeatedly in computational work in AI and other spheres. So um, I made this argument <laughs> with uh, Conrad Kerting in a paper that came out in the Journal of Physiology this year. Uh, or last year, possibly the crowning achievement of my career has been um, that when they asked me for a graphical abstract for our paper on this, <laughs> I was busy, so I sent them this, and then they never got back to me. <laughs> so this was actually the published graphical <laughs> abstract for our, for our paper in Journal of Physiology. Um, but uh, I stand by it. <laughs> Which is that I, I really insist all the biological mechanisms that we all study, that we're all interested in, I guarantee you they are providing brains with a method for estimating gradients. Dopamine, it's estimating gradients. Heavy in plasticity, it's estimating gradients. Behavioral time scale plasticity, it's estimating gradients. I guarantee you. It doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be backprop, but if it doesn't hook into the gradient, your learning rule is not going to work. Sorry. That's that. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
of, 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 of distance. Oh, this is a very specific form, right. So you could have many different distance functions that also respect Dale's law, yeah. I think is your point. The, the, uh, there, there is no biophysical reasoning behind that distance function. It was that this distance function has some nice properties from an optimization perspective, and so we started exploring it because we kind of discovered in this old literature on optimization, we saw this distance function that worked well for certain problems, and then the fact that it respected Dell's law was interesting. But the other component to it that's worth noting is that what that ultimately implies, that particular distance function, is it says that it costs you more to take a uh, weak synapse and increase it X amount than it takes you to, say, take a strong synapse and decrease it by X amount. And I think that's also interesting from a biophysical interpretation level. Okay, let's do one question from there while Christina's setting up. Yeah, here, yeah. sorry, Christina. Please, you take it. Like when we read your Gaussian theorem, yeah. so you're remaining sentence say, under primary regime, your final weight's independent of the initial weight. So there must be a bunch of qualifiers on that. Uh, sorry, if you so are. Your final weight is independent of your initial weight. So there must be some qualifiers on when that. So, so there are some qualifiers. I mentioned one of them. So you have to be in the lazy regime of learning. Uh, and you. You can go read the paper. You also have to have. I tried it. It took thinking. Yeah, yeah. You have to be in the lazy regime of learning, and you also have to have some guarantees on the temporal decay of the correlation in your data. So if your data is correlated infinitely over time, it's not going to work. The, the theorem doesn't hold. If you're on premise. If you're on premise, you're by definition. Exactly. So, so to be, yes, and you have to be over crown trust. Okay. Correct. Yes. If you're in the lazy region, Yes. Sorry. Correct. That was a good paper. I have to say it's good for me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, next speaker is Christine Greenberger from uh, Brandeis University. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, that's a tough act to follow, so I try my best. <laughs> Um, well, thanks, Kian and um, Oleg, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. So as mentioned this morning, I'm an experimentalist. And so I look at how brains learn from the, um, from the perspective of dendrites, these beautiful structures. Um, I find them beautiful. Um, that are really the, the site where a neuron receives the majority of its inputs and integrates it. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about a project that I did when I was still a postdoc in Jeff McGee's, in Jeff McGee's lab. And uh, this was really part of a team effort with this fantastic group of scientists. So when we asked the question, how do computations performed by dendrites contribute to the ability of the brain to learn, um, contribute to the ability of the brain to encode individual experiences as brain activity? And so to get, to get at this question, we have been studying place cell activity um, in the mouse hippocampal area C1, and place cells were briefly mentioned this morning. Um, I just want to go quickly over what they are. So place cells are neurons that are active when the animal, in this case it's a rat running around in an open field arena, the white lines are the, is the trajectory of the animal, each red dot corresponds to activity, it corresponds to an action potential. So these place cells are active when um, the animal is in a particular uh, location of its environment. Now in any given environment, about 25 to 50% of CA1 neurons are place cells, the rest is silent. And so they're place fields or firing fields tile the entire environment. Now the spatial distribution of these place fields can vary uh, from task to task. And so for example, in this uh, linear track now, and this is data from my own recordings, so this is now a mouse running on a linear track. Uh, on the y-axis you have number of place cells, on the x-axis you have the position of the animal on the track. You see that here, around 90 centimeters, there is an increased place field density. And this is where the animal that is uh, water restricted and therefore thirsty receives a water reward. And so what we conclude from this is that we can use, uh, um, that we can use understanding how these uh, representations form. Um, we can use this to understand how individual experiences, behaviorally salient, salient locations are encoded in the brain. So uh, let me just quickly introduce you to the anatomy of an individual CA1 place cell. So you have um, 
the soma here um, with the axon. And so each of these, can I maybe use the pointer? Yeah. So uh, each of these pyramidal cells has two dendritic integrative compartments. So one is the perisompatic compartment consisting of the epic oblique dendrites and the basal dendrites. And they usually receive local input in the case of CA1 from area CA3. And then there is the tuft compartment <coughs> out here, which receives long range feedback input in case of CA1 from layer three of the entorhinal cortex. Now this uh, anatomical arrangement has a couple of functional consequences. And I want to just mention two here. So one is that inputs from CA3 and EC3 don't mix on the level of individual dendritic branches. So the integration of these two input streams only happen here at the soma where the action potentials are initiated. The other consequence is that these inputs out here are electronically so far away from the action potential initiation side that they by themselves can hardly drive any action potential firing. And so the neuron has come up, or, or I guess nature has come up with a solution. How can the tuft signal to the rest of the cell that it's active? And the solution are these dendritic, or one of the solutions are these dendritic plateau potentials. These are large uh, voltage events that are initiated out here in the apical trunk. And they basically show up at the soma and to downstream neurons as these bursts of action potentials that are um, that basically signal, okay, so now the tuft was strongly, um, strongly activated. And so because these bursts, these bursts of action potentials that are riding on a depolarizing wave are the somatic signatures of these dendritic plateau potentials out here in dendrites, I will call these events for the rest of the talk uh, plateaus. And so given this diversity of input, and of course I'm strongly simplifying here because I haven't even spoken about the 20 type of interneurons that exist in this circuit, Given this diversity of input together with dendritic events, the questions that I'm going to discuss with you today is, so how are then CA1 play cells forming? So to get at that question, we use a very simple um, spatial learning task. Right? The hippocampus is supposed to be really important for spatial learning. So the animal is in this case head fixed. It's running on a linear tre treadmill. The belt is 180 centimeters long and is divided up into three, sector three sectors, each enriched with a different set of somatosensory cues that the animals can touch with their paws or with their whiskers. And so the task is very simple. The animal has to learn at a one fixed reward location. And we give one reward per lap. And one lap is one of these revolutions of the belt. And so this is how it looks in real life. Um, so you see the animal that is head fixed that receives um, the, the reward here through the slick port. You see kind of the belt with the cues um, of passing by. And so the usual um, parameters that we read out is velocity of the running. So this is a self-propelled uh, task. The reward location, licks. Um, so these are basically the behavioral parameter we analyze. So combining this very simple spatial learning task with whole cell recordings, we found a few years back that these plateaus that I just mentioned are very powerful driver of place field generation. So in this cell, so this is one single cell recorded in intracellular configuration. You see that in labs five and six, the cell was initially sort of quiet or fired on these spurious action potentials, but then firing out of the blue in lab eight, one of these plateaus, a place field emerged and was there for the remainder of the recording. Now, um, because we are an intracellular configuration, we can change the membrane potential. We can sort of influence the, the, the level of excitation in the cell. And so we can play an interesting trick. We can artificially evoke these plateaus now. So this is now not the cell doing it, like on the right side. This is now the experimenter, one of us, injecting a large amount of current through the patch pipette. You can see that plateaus are um, initiated. And then also in this case, a uh, case field emerged. So uh, I need to tell you a little bit more about these experiments so we can play this trick everywhere on the, on, the, on the treadmill. So there is not really a preferred location where the cell is particularly prone to acquire a place field. If we use play, uh, action potentials instead of initiating plateaus, this does not work. So it really requires um, plateaus. And lastly, through a series of an analysis and experiments, we basically concluded what's going on here is a change in the synaptic weights or synaptic plasticity. And so we call this new form of uh, synaptic plasticity, behavioral time scale synaptic plasticity, or BTSP. And basically, the scheme is as follows. So whenever this, or when the cell fires a single dendritic plateau potential, so it's a one-try learning rule, 
we will have potentiation on these um, CA3 to CA1 synapses. So these are these red synapses here. So it's basically a heterosynaptic plasticity. Um, so we have a, a weight changes there. These weight changes are dependent on the plateau signal itself, as well as a, so what we call an eligibility trace. So this eligibility trace is basically a filtered version of the synaptic input. And so the resulting plasticity time course then is on the second range, it's on the behavioral time scale in the seconds range, and importantly, asymmetric. So it, it uh, starts around three seconds before the plateau and lasts up to one and a half seconds after. So this long time scale um, has a couple of interesting functional consequences for place fields. So one is that there is a linear relationship between the width of the field and the running speed in the lab that the plateau was fired. And so I want to show you an illustration for, to give you intuition why that is. So if an animal is running slowly when the plateau is fired, it basically uh, crosses less space in, the se in six seconds. So the, um, the place field width will be relatively small. However, if the animal is running very fast, it covers a larger space in that same six seconds. Now more input will be potentiated, <laughs> hence the width of the field will be much larger. And so we looked at this um, in, uh, in, uh, in detail. So this is now each cross is one cell. On the y-axis, you have the width of the field. On the x-axis, you have the running speed um, of the animal during the induction. And you can see that this is really a nice linear relationship with a slope of 2.5 seconds, which is about in the seconds range, as we would expect. Importantly, if you would assume a plasticity kernel of about 50 milliseconds, this would give a line. So this relationship would not hold. The other, I think, very fascinating consequence is that because of this asymmetric plasticity kernel, um, place fields tend to shift compared to, the, um, compared, to plateau, compared to the plateau that initiated it. So here is just an illustration. So you basically can see that the majority of the place field firing will precede the plateau. Um, we call this predictive place fields. And in, our, in this data set, um, it's about 10 centimeters. So I think this is very fascinating to think about what could be the behavioral consequence that actually what comes out of the hippocampus is kind of automatically a prediction of what will happen, not a representation of the actual position. And then um, finally, um, I want to uh, mention that BT is sort of the plasticity current that I showed two slides ago is kind of a, a simplification actually through additional experiments that were mostly analyzed by, by Aaron and, and Sandro. Um, in Jeff's lab. So um, we found that actually BTSP is bidirectional. So on the, on, this is an experiment where um, we first uh, generated one place field at, uh, I guess, position 110 or so. So this is here. So this is the first induction. Then the, set, and the, the, cell, uh, the field um, you know, started, uh, was, was uh, started via BTSP. And then there was a second induction. <coughs> Uh, at an earlier time point. And you can see that these two place fields sort of influence each other in an interesting way. So basically, in this case, the first place field uh, disappeared, and then a new place field appeared. And so based on these data, then Aaron came up with, the, with this sort of uh, updated version of the learning rule, namely that actually whether a synapse will undergo potentiation or depotentiation will depend on the, on the relationship to the plateau, and it will also depend on the weight of the synapse. So if a, if a, um, if a, if a, if a synapse, if a plateau will be far away from a synapse, and the synapse is really uh, has a very high weight, it will rather undergo depotentiation, and if it's low weight, it will undergo potentiation. All right, so um, this is sort of the single cell part. So, so far, we showed you that on an individual cell level, BTSP mediates place cell formation. And so the next question then was, is, does it also have an effect on representations of individual experiences? Does BTSP allow individual experiences to shape the C1 representation? And so the Dritic Plateau is obviously sort of a major factor here because it kind of tells the cells, OK, something important has happened. Now for my place field here. And so basically, this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. So what's the relationship between this in the single cell plasticity rule to the representation that I showed you before? 
Okay, so to um, get at that, we turn to a different technique. Um, we turn to two-photon calcium imaging, and you've seen you know, beautiful uh, data from Kim today. So we don't have a mesoscope. We don't have thousands of neurons at the same time. This is kind of a typical field of view. So you see, can see individual somas. Um, they are labeled with g -camp, and so whenever a cell is active, fires a burst of action potentials, you can kind of see the cells um, the cells flash up and become brighter, and so we can read that out as a place cell activity down here. Um, so I should emphasize that this task is very, very simple. Again, um, so we can, it really takes only one session of about 60 minutes to learn it. So this is the advantage that we can really follow individual cells as the animal learns and sort of ask, okay, when do they come up? What is the time course of the development of the representation, etc. And so, um, so, so this is the first question we ask. We looked at individual place cells. So uh, these are three place cells, these heat maps. On the y-axis now, it's not individual cells, but it's the lab number in the session um, from one to you know, 100 or so. And on the x-axis, you have uh, the, this, the position on the linear track. And you can see that uh, all of these cells are not there from right from the beginning, but they come up as the animal learns the task. Um, so this cell, for example, appeared in lab 59, this cell appeared in 52, and this cell appeared in, uh, lab, uh, in lab 15. And so we want to ask now, do these cells show <coughs> signatures of BTSP? And the answer is obviously uh, yes. So the first signature is sort of this abrupt appearance, right? The blue color means no activity, the red color means high activity. So you can see that these cells did appear just out of the blue. They show this characteristic predictive shift I talked about. And finally, they also show um, the relationship between the width of the field and the running speed of the animal. Just to point out one example here. So this cell appeared here somewhere around 90 centimeters. I'm plotting up here the, the velocity in this lab. Um, that the cell appeared, and you see that around 90 centimeters, the, the velocity was quite low, around 10 centimeters, hence the width is quite shallow. In comparison, here it appeared also at around 90 centimeters. In this lab, the animal though ran 30 centimeters per second. You can see that the width is, wide, is, is um, much wider. So we can quantify these. So this is the width velocity relationship for an individual animal and across animals. And this is very well matches the whole cell recording results. And this is the um, an analysis of this predictive shift where compared to the lab where the plateau was initiated, all the place fields tend to shift forward. And then on average, it's a, or the median is around 10 centimeters or something like that. Um, so so from the, just from the recording, it's sort of you know, this is consistent with BTSP, and I also did some manipulations. So I um, pharmacologically acti um, 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 blocked NMDA receptors with, through, a, through an agent called AP5, and plateau, plateau initiation through a calcium channel blocker called SNX. And in both cases, two things happened. So the number of place fields, which is usually between 25 and 30 percent, goes down. It's about half, and the distribution, there is not as nice of an overrepresentation anymore. So the, the, the distribution of the fields is basically uniform after this manipulation. All right, um, so this is sort of um, the setup, right? So CA2 is two different types of inputs from CA3 and EC3. BTSP on the CA3 to CA1 synapses creates a representation in CA1 that is experience dependent and predictive. And so now in the last you know, few couple of minutes, I sort of want to uh, talk about this other aspect. <coughs> now the question is, how can BT, so what would the reward of a representation imply? It would imply that there are more plateaus, more place field formation around the reward than anywhere else. And so um, to get at that question, how can that happen, we turn to the other input from EC3, because we know from in vitro and in vivo work that EC3 is very important. It's required for uh, plateau firing. And so um, I want to cut a long story short. I just want to tell you that I optogenetically silenced these EC3 neurons around the reward location, and this indeed um, prevented the formation of the reward of representation. And we also did some imaging of the EC3 axons to understand how these um, how the input is, what are these axons represent? 
And so this is a, 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 a summary. So we did imaging and modeling, and we found that in this environment A, which is the, has the uniform cues, one fixed reward, basically in, in, uh, in um, blue is the uh, model EC3 input, and you can see that the CA1 representations nicely follow it. And then we did an additional environment where we don't have uniform cues, only two cues. In this case, a visual stimulus uh, marked by the star and a not, then the reward 50 centimeters later. In this case, you see that the EC3 input has a different shape. It now not over represents the reward, it over represents the light. And in this case then, the CA1 representation also followed it. So we could show that we can change the EC3 input behaviorally, and the CA1 representations followed it as predicted. Okay, so this is what we call, is, is consistent with what we call an instructive signal. And so the last question then was, is this an error signal or a target signal? Error signal means, at least with my naive understanding, initially it's high, the, the representation has to be learned, and then as the representation is learned, the, the, the instructive signal should go down. The second, uh, a target signal would mean it's just constantly broadcasting to CA1, this representation should be formed, this representation should be formed. Okay, so what is it? So this is our attempt to look at that. So what I'm plotting here is the C some CA1 population activity in the first 10 labs and in the labs 51 to 60. And you can see that over time as play cells get formed in, um, you can see the overall level of activity goes up, and the light cue, in this case, is this data from environment B. This is the light envi the, the environment with only the two cues. You can see that there is this light overrepresentation formed. Now, if I plot on top the EC3 um, population activity, you can see that it stays relatively constant. It's there right from the start, which is kind of puzzling to think about how this works. And it, importantly, it stays constant also later on in the session. So I can plot that, I can plot the development um, of the EC3 activity over now 80 labs, and then plot the correlation between the blue and the red line, and you can see how the CA1 sort of adapts or, or gets more and more correlated with that signal. So what we concluded from this is that what the EC3 sends to CA1 is a target signal, it's not an error signal. And so then this is sort of the framework we now have. So EC3 is a target signal, in the tough dendrites of CA1, you have a mismatch calculation between the target signal and an, as of now, unknown feedback signal that represents the actual um, CA1 activity. This feedback signal should be negative, so an inhibitory interneuron would be a good candidate. So there is this mismatch calculation. If there's excess excitation, you will have a plateau initiated. The TSP is formed, changes the CA1 representation, and this calculation can begin anew. Okay, so this is sort of the current um, model we have. Um, there's a lot of open questions. As I mentioned, what could be this inhibitory feedback signal is unclear as of now, but there are many other questions. So for example, what is the role of neuromodulation? How, how, is this BTSP a hippocampus specific phenomenon? Is it in other areas? Is it in other species? Or, and also, as I mentioned, how is this EC3 target signal generated? Okay, so that's all I have. Um, as I mentioned, this work was performed in Jeff's lab. Uh, thanks a lot to him for a great uh, mentorship. Um, I have my own lab now at Brandeis. This is also a lovely group to work with. We do a lot of fun science. Um, thanks for listening and happy to take questions. Okay. Yeah, let's actually start from this side this time. Yeah. Maybe a very naive question, but just from the person that uh, was familiar a bit with the topic, but not yet fully yet. Yeah. Sure. Uh, did the literature research on it. So the golden standard uh, in electrophysiology is basically in for for CCT characterization is the in vitro uh, research. Yeah. I'm not sure it's the gold standard, but yeah. it's one way to put it. I mean, it's, I mean, you have the most control over the preparation, obviously, but you know, it has other disadvantages, like you sort of don't have the physiological situation, right? Yeah, so but is it possible to induce that kind of oh, yeah. <laughs> So, sure, so this is uh, in one of the papers, so it's, it's definitely possible to um, mimic it in slices. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, so we could find and replicate the time course and all that. Okay, Blake. Uh, beautiful talk, thank you so much. I just want to ask about that last little uh, model you had there, because it strikes me that, I guess maybe I'm not understanding something, but let's say you have the EC3 coming in, giving a target, and then it's driving a plateau potential in your cell. Mm -hmm. Um, why do you need some kind of error calculation at that point? Since it's giving you a target, it's telling that cell, you should be active. So it's going to drive a plateau, the cell will then get active. Right. And it strikes me that what you then actually potentially want to do is then kick in the inhibition to the dendrite to stop generating plateaus when it's no longer necessary to drive plasticity in that cell once it's responding to the correct place field. I'm sorry if I didn't convey that correctly, but that exactly is oh, what's that's going what you're on. Trying to say. Yeah, I so sort of on the sort of on the population level, that's what's going on, right? So the yeah. plateau is an individual, a cell-specific signal, <coughs> but then on the population level, at some point, you know, inhibition overcomes the target signal, and no plateaus are generated. And we have evidence. So if we take place cell formation rate as a proxy for BTSP induction, we see that initially the rate is very high, and then it sort of levels off. Okay, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sorry for not No, no, I misunderstood. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask how you think about reconciling this really like beautiful single shot things you're showing mm -hmm. in the neurons with the kind of longer time scale changes in behavior, right? Which take yeah. like hundreds of occurrences. I, I, I'm just not sure how to think about that. I agree. It's, it's very puzzling to me too, right? So the, it's a one-shot learning rule, but the behavior is gradual. And after 20 laps or so, usually it takes the animal 20 to 30 laps to, to be good at the behavior. Um, I mean, I can just speculate, right? It's, I, it sort of relates to that you maybe need a certain amount of information in the hippocampus to sort of, um, you know, to be enough that the animal can now learn. Um, that is the only reason, I think. You know, over time, the representation gets bigger and bigger and more refined. So I assume that there must be some threshold there where it, it can do it. Um, earlier you plotted the place field size versus running speed. Yes. And on average, uh, there is a linear relationship. But I also noticed that it seemed like the variance got higher as running speed increased. The, the fact that the dots were more spread out. Uh, sorry, the next. Uh, this this is the only relationship. Uh, you mean this here? No, no, no the, the slide that you just showed. Had it. Oh, so this is this is the calcium imaging. So there is definitely um, more slop in the calcium imaging for several reasons. One, we cannot. So I think this is um, this is just a problem with the calcium imaging. One, it is relatively hard to <coughs> know. So so we make certainly some mistakes with identifying plateaus with the calcium imaging. So all we can say is this is if it's very clear, it's you know it goes from something to from nothing to something. Then it's you know we we assume this is a plateau. Um, but there are sometimes cases where this, is, um, where this is not as clear. There is an average relationship where on average the first lab is larger than, the, um, than, the, than the, the rest of the field. But this is sort of on a single, this is on individual animals, these are individual place cells. So this is, I feel this is a little bit slop there. The other mistake that we're making is that there could be some cells that, are, that, that are not, do not require BTSP, that are usually those that are there from the right from the start, and they are also included in this plot. So I feel like there are a few things that contribute to the um, problem, problem there. And, the other, and, and, and uh, I guess as I'm thinking about it, it could be that the ones that are around the reward are the ones that are generated in labs with slow speed. So right, the animal usually slows down around the reward. So maybe those are the environments with the really the more BTSP mediated ones, and so there's less slop there. But I don't know. That's just I just thought about it. I don't know. So these are sort of reasons why this is not as clean as the whole cell relationship, right? Where we can really know these are plateaus. Okay. Yeah, let's take one more from that side. Uh, yeah. So with your speculations about the feedback signal, do you think they are feeding back onto um, the EC3 sort of cells? Uh, and if they are, is it going back to a, the same population? Or is there some segregation between um, the feed-forward EC3 
uh, cells and potentially a separate population that is taking CA1 feedback? Uh, so I'm not sure I'm understanding your question directly. So what I so this is a what what this is a local CA1 signal that we are assuming, right? Where interneurons that sort of get population activity are from the surrounding pyramidal cells. We don't know exactly whether they feed directly back onto the same cells. They will sort of, you know, feed back onto the population of CA1 neurons. Does this make sense? Am I answering your question or? Sorry, yeah. I'm not sure I understood it correctly. Yes, thanks everyone. <coughs> we will now we now need to take a break until 4:45. So feel free to ask questions offline. The next speaker is uh, Kian O'Donnell from Ulster University. Okay, so um, I'm going to motivate this talk by asking this key question, which has been touched upon today, but we haven't really had a proper discussion about it. What's the time scale for the rules of synaptic plasticity? In particular, I'm going to argue that it's, uh, well, there's many processes on multiple time scales, and the slower ones are the ones we've been more ignoring. That's my kind of point that I'd like you to take. Most of the talk is going to be kind of a perspective or a review, and then I'll talk a bit about one project that we published last year uh, for the last third or so. So, um, to answer the timescale question, we of course go back to the, our good friend Donald Hebb. And he said, when, uh, you know, when cell A is exciting cell B, I've colored in pink here, the, he said, repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it. So there he's already implicitly applied <coughs> some timescale, specifically the timescales of neural activity. So what, is, what, do, what do I mean by that? What's, what are the time scales of neural activity? Again, um, I like these lines where I can draw things on a line, like I did this morning. So if we think about all uh, relevant time scales here, spike is like a millisecond, stuff happens seconds, minutes, blah, 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 up to memories might last a lifetime. And neural activity dynamics for more like sort of the decay or autocorrelation time constant for a single neuron is on the order of, um, milliseconds to maybe 100 milliseconds. Obviously, maybe there's some slower dynamics up to like a second or something in some cases. Right, and the issue is that, that so that, that is presumably the time scale that Heb was talking about, or at least what, what he implied. The issue is that there's a gap or uh, a mismatch with the time scales we typically think of behavior as operating on. So behavior, okay, you could motor control or some fine time scale stuff. And like my tongue is working at some speed here when I'm saying these words, but large chunks of behavior operate on seconds to minutes time scale. So what's going on there? And um, you know maybe Christina's BTSP is one answer to this, but I'll argue that we already probably had an idea that there's many components of neural activity dyna or sorry plasticity rules that are already operating these slow time scales. Then you know beyond that, there's also this uh, lurking thing of like the long-term memory. And we know that like some memories can last a lifetime. So how does this all link up with the initial events that trigger the learning that somehow reflect like, behavior or task improvement or whatever? And then we has, also have this business of storing things long term. So you, the, the sort of textbook answer to this, or thinking about these time scales in memory science, is um, splitting the process of memory, or learning, I should say, into three phases. Induction, expression, and maintenance. And induction means this is the brain activity or the event that triggered the, the memory. Expression is the sort of physical changes that the brain makes to sort of represent the memory. That might happen with some delay after the induction. And then the maintenance is like just keeping the memory stored long term. And that's the thing that might last forever. So where do, you know, where do these three processes land on this time scale map? It's not exactly clear, but um, if you follow like a heavy logic, the induction is stuff on this neural activity dynamics time scale. Expression, we know from experiments, might take minutes or hours even sometimes. And then the maintenance, you know, who knows? Maybe a lifetime, maybe not if you believe in representational drift. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna focus on the induction part right now and ask what are the time scales of just the induction phase alone. So, you know, uh, Christina's talk was amazing, uh, talking about this phenomenon of behavioral timescale plasticity on the order of um, a couple of seconds time window. 
and I, w uh, it, I would tr just try to point out that there is a big literature going back many decades now that has already thought a bit about what are the temporal limits for um, induction protocols. So here's one example from a paper from Bob Malenka when he was a postdoc, I think, in 1992. Well, there's a standard LTP experiment in rats hippocampus. So they're recording something like synaptic strength on the y-axis. Get some baseline, 100% baseline. They give a very high intensity stimulation to the synapses, and they get an LTP that decays to, you know, uh, it's increased by 100% or something, lasts for about 30, 40 minutes in this brain slice. So what they did here was they have uh, bathed this piece of brain tissue in a photoactivatable calcium buffer. So when they shine a light, it will sort of uncage this calcium buffer, and so they very precisely uh, suck up all the calcium in the cell, and then we know that blocking calcium is a very effective way to block LTP. So by controlling the time of this calcium blocking relative to the stimulation, they can ask how long sort of the induction time scale is sensitive to. In this case, they stimulate or sorry, uh, block the calcium between two and a half and four seconds after the induction and didn't do anything. But if they reduce that delay to one second, the LTP uh, goes away, at least on a long time scale. So that already says there's some one to two time scale component here that's the synapse is sensitive to for the activity, or at least for some processes. Right, so what about SCDP, this famous spike timing dependent plasticity, which is on a way faster time scale than this? And just to, we, a couple of people already covered this, but to recap, um, the idea here is that the pre and post synaptic time, sorry, pre and post spiking time gap on the order of milliseconds determines the direction of and that magnitude of synaptic strength change. So the y axis is like synaptic strength change. X-axis is spike timing, positive number means pre, before, post, so like a causal thing. In that case, the synapse strengthened. Post, before, pre is a negative number on the x-axis and the synapse weakened. So it's a super famous B and B curve. And then of course, like there's been tenfold number of computational modeling papers where people have taken kernels like this um, and asked what they do in, in learning. And we saw many examples from Tim Vogels this morning. So I think, uh, personally, I have a problem with SDDP in that it's, <laughs> As I, believe, I believe the data, right? I'm not arguing with the data. And what the data shows is that synapses are sensitive to stuff on fast time scales. I'm not denying that. The issue is it kind of, it's so, you know, such a beautiful idea and very persuasive that everyone focuses only on this fast time scale component. So, if, just to schematize, uh, I would, I'd like to point out that there's actually three different time scales in these, the way they do these experiments. There's more than this fast time scale uh, going on here. So often people will make these plots where they indicate the presynaptic neuron. This is like time on the x-axis, and here's a spike in the pre-neuron. Here's a spike in the post-neuron. <coughs> and they talk about this, you know, time gap is the pre to post time gap. So that's the x-axis in the last slide. But if you do just one single spike pairing, you typically don't really get a change in synaptic strength. So in practice, what people do in uh, brain slices is repeat this protocol, this pairing, rather, up to 50 times maybe, or maybe more. So in that case, we now have introduced a couple of other time scales we need to worry about. One is the gap between the pairings. And typically, people, I mean, different people do choose different time gaps here, but it's often on the order of one to 10 seconds. And then there's also the third, you know, the time scale of the entire stimulation protocol duration, which can be anything up to 10 minutes or more. You know, and that's starting to get uncomfortable because that's like a very long and repetitive protocol that feels a bit unphysiological. Um, and the kind of alarming thing is that, you know, people are quite aware that this fast time scale difference makes a big, um, has a big effect on the synaptic strength change, but the kind of truth is that these two other time scales also matter just as much. And uh, here's an example from the interspike spike interval, so that's how two time scale. Um, here, this is Jesper Schostrom. When he was a postdoc, he repeated the SCD, sort of an SCDP experiment at different uh, repetition rate frequencies. So it's the same x-axis as before, the, you know, that's the tau one on the x-axis, the fine time scale thing. But instead of seeing this beautiful B and Poo curve, uh, he sees different things happening at different repetition rates. So once every 10 seconds, he gets this like LTD only curve. Once, once every 50 milliseconds, he sees this thing. And then if, once every 20 or whatever milliseconds, he sees this other thing. 
And to me, this isn't, this is kind of getting, this isn't like a little modulation, you know, these are totally different curves. And, you know, I'm not pointing out, out anything new, these are well-known things, but to me, this is, just implies that we can't just, to, to think only about the fast time scale thing is misleading. It's not, it's not the, feels like the wrong way to think about it. And same is true for the very slow time scale ones. We know, for example, that um, inducing LTD, even with these, like, long-term depression, even, even with these, uh, um, post before pre protocols, you need many, 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 many repetitions, and the time scale for LTD is, seems to be quite a lot slower than inducing LTP. So that's minutes, let, let's say a few minutes time scale we've talked about. What about even longer time scales? Here's an experiment from Gary Lynch's lab in 2012, where they did again a standard like LTP protocol now, so kind of old school LTP protocol. Get some baseline uh, response in the hippocampal brain slice to this theta burst stimulation, which induces an LTP, and then what they tried to do was induce a second round of LTP at the same synapses. But what they found was that they did with a 10 minute gap relative to the first one. What they found was that the second one didn't uh, increase the synaptic strength any more than the first one did. So it was like a saturation of the first one already. The second one couldn't uh, increase the strength anymore. Repeat that experiment with a, th uh, what's that? 30 minute gap, and they see the same thing. So it's still saturating. However, if they wait long enough, if they wait one hour, then they were able to induce further LTP, okay? So there's something going on here between 30 and 60 minutes that allowed the synapses to increase their capacity to strengthen even more. So, you know, if we're gonna write out a plasticity <coughs> rule, mathematical function, do we need to worry about everything that happened in the last hour? You know, we can't just worry about the few spikes that happened in the last 10, 20 milliseconds. And I think, again, about even longer time scales. It's this beautiful set of experiments from Thomas Ertner's lab where they um, prepared this hippocampus uh, slice culture preparation where they sort of pseudo hippocampus they've taken out of an embryo. Uh, and they can keep it alive in a cell culture for a couple of weeks. And they can do these very clever all optical experiments where they induce plasticity on single synapses and then track them over many days. So it's, it's cool prep. And what they do is they can uh, induce LTP at a single synapse. And that's what's shown in this y-axis is strength goes up after 30 minutes after induction. And then kind of shockingly as well, if you believe in LTP, the, when they come back to that synapse a day later, it's gone back down to baseline, or on average, they've gone back to baseline. The same is true for the second measure of synaptic strength. So whatever they did to the LTP, you know, the LTP's gone after a day, so that's probably not storing the memory, like the synaptic strength anyway. Um, however, like I said, they have the ability to track these synapses over many days. And what they find is that if they just look at whether synapses are there or not under light microscope, if, if they wait a week and in control conditions, about three quarters of them are persistent and then about a quarter get lost just to some sort of baseline turnover. And however, if they make the same pie chart for just the spines that they LTP'd, even though the synaptic strength has gone back to baseline on average, there's some sort of um, protection against this loss. So the fraction that's lost has decreased a lot. You know, and I don't know what time scale that happened. All I know is it happened between one day and seven days. Um, so it's probably in that order. And that, that also fits with the time scales of protein changes due to gene expression. So we might think there's something going on there. It, it's not a weird time scale. So if we go back to this plot that I had of the time scales of plasticity. And before, you know, I guess there's a hand wavy idea that induction depends on neural activity time scales. Expression takes an hour or something, and we know that. There's a lot of reconfiguration of the synapse molecularly, a time scale of an hour, and then the maintenance is something that happens longer term. But if, if you start looking at sort of the biology, so I kind of only showed sort of physiology experiments, but there's also a bunch of molecular neuroscience to work out the mechanisms involved. And there's, to me, there's not really a clean cutoff between these processes. So if we're theorists and we're trying to write down a <coughs> plasticity rule, it's hard to say what time scale we're allowed to just um, cut ourselves off at, you know, do we only have to remember what happened in the last minute or do we need to start worrying about what happened an hour ago? I don't know. Now, of course, the, like the, somebody once said, the universe is Markovian, you know, there's no history dependence. I only know, my synapse only knows what it is currently storing in its own molecular configuration. So it's not that it has a total track record of everything that ever happened to it, but it means that it's probably some high dimensional object that is storing some implicit traces of these longer time scale things that happened in the past. Well, you know, what that is, I don't think anybody really knows. So, how should we proceed? Um, my belief, or 
hope is that, uh, as you know, Tim highlighted this morning, the space of possible plasticity rules that the brain could have is enormous. And, um, you know, we just don't know where, it could, where the real rules lie. Um, you can try and choose rules and match behavior or uh, choose rules and match like physiology statistics, like activity, stability, stuff like that. <coughs> or my approach is to think about the models that are consistent with the molecular properties of synapses. And that won't give us the answer directly, but it might reduce the search space a lot. <coughs> it's a hope. So what are these mole molecules? I know you didn't come to cosine here about molecules, but you're going to have to <laughs> <laughs> bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, what are these molecules? Um, I like this plot from Ryuhi Yasuda, uh, where he, he, he almost single-handedly his lab has really characterized a lot of these uh, molecules using uh, dynamic imaging, like fret and flame imaging, to look at the activity time scales of these things. And there's just stuff happening at a few different time scales. So calcium is like fast, 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, a signal synapses. But then there's like enzymes downstream of that, CAMK2 famously, and calcineurin that are on the order of 10 seconds. Stuff slower than that again on like a minute's time scale, actin um, depolymerizing uh, proteins like cofilin that change the structure of the synapse on even 10 minutes time scale, and then finally gene transcription, which could be hours. So there's just like a cascade of things happening at different time scales, totally consistent with the physiology experiments that I showed you earlier. And here's a very beautiful paper from um, Haruhiko Bito's lab where they did something kind of a theorist would like, which is look at the response of uh, two of these enzymes to stimulations at different frequencies on the x-axis and different numbers of pulses. So they pulse release glutamate onto a neuron and look at the time series of the response of these two enzymes. And then they made these kind of um, nice uh, heat maps of the y-axis is like the integral in this case or the amplitude of the response as a function of the frequency and the number. And if you look at the right-hand plot first, the this can, can, CAN is calcineurin. Doesn't really care about the frequency, but it does care about the number. So it's kind of doing some sort of integration or account of the number of pulses. Whereas CAMK2 was only active for sort of very high frequencies and a lot of pulses in a short period of time. And it's quite a nonlinear way. So, you know, and actually one, one thing I didn't mention is both of these molecules are downstream of calcium and calmodulin. So they're listening to the same signal and performing different nonlinear transforms on the same raw signal. So somehow they're sort of, they're not creating information, but they're sort of extracting different aspects of the calcium signal out. And then downstream of those is some other things that decide whether the synapse gets stronger or weaker. So I, the, the, I, my belief is that these non-linearities non matter. And I try to motivate that with a very quick example. Um, so imagine we've got some fast variable, like voltage or calcium or something in a synapse that's driving one of these slower variables, like CAMK2 or calcineurin. And imagine the synapse's job is to um, distinguish these two patterns. One of them should cause plasticity, the other one shouldn't. So for example, if there's a burst stimulation in red, it should dis re respond to that with some plastic change, and the blue one uh, doesn't respond. The issue is if you have some linear transform then to the slow variable, it ends up kind of averaging away the fast time scale stuff, and you just get something that's pretty similar for both cases. In contrast, if we have some nonlinear function that responds to this output, you can tune it to respond much more strongly to the bursty input than the low frequency, or sorry, the tonic one. So, you know, this is a made up example, but the point is that. It might be that characterizing these nonlinearities matter for figuring out these rules of plasticity. So I've, I've written a, a short review paper about summarizing some of this stuff, so you're very welcome to have a read of it if you want to find out more. So what's the strategy, um, I think? And uh, this is kind of my strategy, but I think it's not a bad idea in general, is to uh, look at the biology and build some computational models that are molecularly or bio biologically accurate, or at least biologically inspired, and then go and study those in, as a proxy for the real thing, because we can measure everything, control everything, and hopefully get some principles out of that, and then, then go back and abstract those models, either in a hand-wavy way or in a principled way. And then now you've got a rule that you have some 
faith that you've built up from the bottom up and then you can go and ask the same questions that people typically ask is how does this help with learning and circuits so that's hard um, and we haven't got very far but I'm going to quickly tell you about one attempt at starting this <laughs> the first step at least so what we did we to try and do this uh, we asked where would you do it if you were going to try this approach and we thought let's try it in the most uh, well characterized synapse in the mammalian brain which is probably the ca3 ca1 synapse in the rodent hippocampus the exact same synapses that uh, christina was looking at the potentiation of so we had this collaboration project with um Roman Veltz is a mathematical neuroscientist in, in RIA and his PhD student, Yuri, and his co-supervisor, co Ellen Murray, who's an experimentalist, along with Cesar Tigaret in uh, Cardiff University. So what we did, we tried to, I mean, it's not the first attempt at this, but we feel like we have come up with, a, a, in some ways, the most accurate model to date of this synapse, for at least for plasticity induction purposes, where we modeled a lot of the machinery going on at synapses, like probabilistic vesicle release, NMDA receptors, calcium or uh, calcium in the spine, cam, calmodulin, and CAMK2, these uh, enzymes I talked about already, and AMP receptors ultimately. So and we took very a lot of care, like these ion channels are like small in number at the synapse, so for NMDA receptors you've got on the order of 5 to 10 per synapse, so and each channel can't be like half open really, it can either want to be open or closed. So to respect that sort of discrete, discrete property, we model those as sort of Markov processes that switch states. But then for the more uh, continuous variables like voltage or even calcium, we can model them as with ODEs. So we have this big sort of system of some stochastic Markov things hooked up to uh, differential equations and have stuff acting on different time scales. So there's sort of some fast stuff on st that is stochastic, some things like voltage and calcium on a 10 millisecond time scale, and then downstream of that, we've got slower processes like CAMK2 and calcineurin. And then crucially, we also find big, big effects from like short-term synaptic plasticity, like vesicle release rundown on the order of seconds, and then this backpropagation action potential gets uh, attenuated over time too. So we put a lot of time and effort into like doing the best job we could matching that to physiology data. So what happens, um, we played different plasticity protocols into this model matching experiments from Jack Miller's lab in Bristol and asked if, uh, took one protocol for example that gave LTP and another protocol that gave no change but they're just different in one spike. And they don't look that different in the calcineurin and CAMK2 responses in the model. So to get this a bit more, we made a sort of phase plot of the two enzymes response to this, these two activity patterns, and there it starts to look a bit more separated. And that gave us the idea to define a plasticity rule, which is sensitive to the sort of dynamics of this, um, these enzymes in this 2D plane. So we sort of started drawing boxes and said, oh, this is an LTP box, this is another box for LTD, and had like an integrator of the time spent in each box. And with some you know, substantial amount of hand tuning, we were uh, able to very well match these seven different the plasticity outcomes on the y-axis of these seven different protocols that uh, Jack Miller's lab had. And interestingly, not we didn't kind of we only match, tried to match the mean responses, but in the model because it's stochastic already gives you some variance in the amount of plasticity you get for a fixed protocol. We also to some degree match the variance. So for example, this one the data points are quite high variance, and so is the model response. So one takeaway for a high level. Um, conclusion is that the rules of plasticity themselves might be stochastic, so just the machinery is not that reliable. Whether that's a bug or feature, I don't know. And we also compared this to sort of off-the-shelf classic <coughs> ST, like SCDP models, the triplet SCDP, Greipner Brunel, it's a calcium-based model, and none of them could match the data uh, as well as the our model. Our model is much more complicated and flexible, so it's not a shock that we can do better, but um, yeah, still worth comparing. So then the PhD student, Yuri Rodriguez, it was an absolute machine, and he, he fit this model, or used the model to replicate data from nine different experimental studies. So the, the study I just showed you already, um, studies on frequency-dependent plasticity, this like BCM curve, uh, developmental changes, so this LTD goes away with development. Changes in extracellular calcium and magnesium. These are things that you can control in the slice experiments that have a big effect on plasticity again, it turns out. that came up earlier, too. And then also, interestingly, this behavioral timescale plasticity we can replicate, too. So this, this seconds um, 
gap between pre and post activity. And again, it's not a shock. Like in our model, we've got these seconds time scale variables like CAMK2 and uh, um, the, some of the presynaptic short term plasticity has that time scale too. So, but we, we didn't um, have to work too hard to replicate some of that. So I'm happy with that in general. And um, now we can start to play games with the model as an experimental test bed. And it's not that I believe the model really, it's got a lot of parameters. We uh, tried some sort of optim automatic optimization routines, but the, the model was just so slow <coughs> to simulate that it wasn't very efficient. So we tried Bayesian optimization and some other things and just didn't work. So in the end, we did a lot of this hand tuning, which is a bit fishy, but. Um, so what I'm trying to say is I don't necessarily believe the parameters that it's 100% faithful, but it at least re reproduces a lot of the phenomena that we see experimentally. So one thing we did was ask, uh, does spike timing matter? And to do that, we played some of these protocols that experimentally Caesar had played with very regular timings, and we just uh, randomly jittered each spike with some variance. So the standard deviation of the jitter is on the y axis, or x axis, sorry. And for zero jitter, like that's the case I showed you before. And we have these four protocols with different amplitudes of plasticity. And what we find is, of course, well, not of course, but if you jitter enough, at least these three protocols start to merge, and this one becomes different. So what this kind of says is this model is sensitive to jitter um, at least on a 10 to 20 millisecond time scale. And why does that matter? Uh, if we th depends how accurate we think um, spike time precision is in vivo. If we think it's faster than this, then maybe spike times do matter. If we don't think it's faster than that, then they probably don't matter. And you know, this is even repeating that stimulation many times. Uh, in vivo, does that repetition happen so accurately either? I don't know, like the period. Um, yeah, I just showed this plot. I think this is more or less my last plot. Um, one thing we looked at was sort of what you would compare to what you would expect from a Hebbian rule. So a Hebbian rule is, um, if I put presynaptic activity on the y-axis and postsynaptic activity on the x-axis, Hebbian rule says pre times post, so we'd expect strongest plasticity up in this corner. But in this case, we saw this non-monotonic relationship with the postsynaptic activity, mainly due to things like backpropagation, active potential attenuation. So, you know, they're getting stuff out of this that is not, uh, or was surprising to me when we did it, but not in hindsight. You can kind of explain it away. So I think that's the value. I kind of hope that it'd be something like. Eve Martyr's work in the uh, SDG, where you don't trust the model fully, but you can explore it, and it's close enough to reality that you can learn stuff. That's the goal. So, summarize. Uh, it's my belief that the rules of synaptic plasticity are sensitive to activity on multiple time scales from milliseconds to hours. And I think one way forward, at least one set of constraints, is looking at the molecular processes of synapses. Uh, we built this multi time scale computational model, can reproduce data from nine different studies. Uh, looked at spike time variability, and its prediction is that um, it, mess, it messes up the plasticity a lot. So it depends how precise, the, you know, whether or not that matters for in vivo depends on the precision of time, spike timing in vivo. Yeah, and I guess the knock-on implication is it, the prediction is that it's seconds time scale stuff is more important. And it's also a very nice study from Michael Greifner on this. So the, the big question is like, how do we then go from this to something more simple that we can study and um, even simulate, you know, this just took like almost real time to simulate on my CPU, which is not practical for thousands or hundreds of thousands of synapses. So we have to do some form of model reduction, both for analytical tractability and for just practical simulation speed. So I'm, we still haven't done that, but that's, that's the next step. Thank you. Based on your models, could you make testable predictions on eligibility traces that you got now given experimental ways? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I guess we'd have to somehow identify one of the variables with the eligibility trace, but CAMP K2 is an obvious one. But there's other known kinases that we didn't include, but they were sort of be easy to add. Yeah, adding stuff is kind of straightforward if you have a goal, but yeah, uh, uh, we haven't actually thought about that framing yet, but that's a good idea. Both in the predictions. Predictions if you do what, sorry? Look for What does the model predict as it stands? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, well, like if in BTSP, they, there's, well, like, I know Jeff's lab is already looking at what, what mechanisms might be that eligibility trace. And like there's some evidence that it's CAMK2. So 
I think in this model, we didn't explicitly knock it out and look at that BTSP curve. I'm pretty sure it would have a big effect. But there's other slow variables there too. So that's a, that would be a nice study to like knock out each of the slower ones and see how, what effects they have. But there's more than one. Okay. Got a question regarding the principles from constraining the models based on biochemical parts. And biochemistry is pretty complicated. There are about uh, a thousand proteins which can uh, become parts of complexes in the postsynaptic densities. You mentioned two, which are some of the most important, but there are so many others. Not only that, but you've got some uh, compartmentalization. You can have a spinal apparatus, you can have things which are going to be yeah. within the neighborhoods of channels. Are, can we actually believe that we can come back to systems neuroscience and to say, no, here are actually a set of constraints when there is that entire set of variables? I don't know. I do know the real brain has all those things, so I'd like to at least consider them in the model. And um, There's some bottlenecks here, so cal we know calcium is crucial, and then these are two mo enzymes that are downstream of that, so that's why we picked them. But I agree, there's a bunch of other stuff, but all models are wrong. PKC, PKA, you get cyclic yeah. AMP, you get quite a few other things which are very important too. Yeah, I think that's one good point. Like we, That's why I said it's a model of this particular synapse, so we, we tried our best to focus on this one synapse because that's the case with the most data, but even that's like probably the tip of the iceberg yeah. compared to reality. So yeah, maybe it's uh, not going to map onto other parts of the brain so well, but the goal is more, I think, to get some principles out or ideas out of it. You know, I don't, I don't believe the model, but if I can learn something from it, that would be good enough. Okay, let's do one more question while you do that. Yeah. Well, one one um, thing which is missing from many of these plasticity talks is sleep. And we know that brain sleep is, is modifying the, the uh, spines, uh, like uh, ruining many, let's say, in some. So, uh, have you thought, like, what does it do? Like, uh, any, like, it seems to be like an offline uh, optimization of some kind. Yeah, I think one place I was thinking about it could come in is, um, you know, I was saying the requirement for plasticity at fine time scales requires a lot of repetition. And that's one place that it can, doesn't make sense to me for an awake animal or a person, but sleep, there's these slow wave cycles that are like a clock. And that's, you know, you might imagine a sequence repeated many times over some period and that, that could probably you know implement some of those fine time skill memories I think. Yeah, that's one place. Um, other than that, no, I haven't thought about it. Okay, the next speaker. Oh. Next speaker is Juliana Georgieva uh, from Technical University in Munich. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to Kian, Tim, who's not here, and Oleg. And um, I'm very happy to have the honor of giving the closing lecture of today's workshop. It's really been an amazing and um, very exciting, um, exciting day. So I'm gonna come back to some of the topics that Tim Fogels discussed in the morning and a little bit Kian. And I'm gonna say that I am a believer in STDP, but the approach that I'm going to take will be a little bit different than what we have seen so far, and is going to actually look at how we can use learning rules like STDP, and in particular, I'm gonna be taking families of STDP rules, so not just a particular type, uh, type of STDP rule. And I'm going to look at how these types of rules actually inform uh, the connectivity that emerges in networks. And I think this is something that didn't actually appear in today's discussion. We have looked quite a bit at dynamics, activity, behavior, training for tasks, and all these things, but we didn't actually look at, uh, look at structure and organization and uh, motifs of connectivity that emerge in neural networks. And I think this is a particularly exciting time to do this because we have all these connectomes now, and so it is, I think, the right time to start looking at what these rules are predicting and look at the connectivity motifs that uh, they predict would emerge in these networks. Okay, so um, here I mostly show studies um, from the past that have looked at functional measurements of connectivity, so mainly multi-patch experiments in different brain areas and different species that have really shown that connectivity in different brain circuits is highly non-random. So I'm gonna start here at the bottom with this learning, uh, with this um, experimental setup. I believe this was layer five, visual cortex neurons, whole cell recordings. Song et al, 2005, this is now almost 20 years ago, that identified or discovered motifs 
that involved uh, connections between three neurons and quantified their over or under representation relative to randomly connected networks. Then there were these other studies where they looked at a different control uh, model here. I believe they preserved the in degree connectivity but compared then the emergence or the over representation, the prevalence of all these different three neuron motifs relative to, uh, to this uh, other control model. Um, and this was, a, I believe, a computational study that actually pulled data from different um, experimental uh, uh, setups or from different brain areas and again found this, uh, the same idea, that we have this over and under representation of these different motifs. Um, for now and for the rest of the talk, I'm mainly going to be focusing on connectivity motifs that involve three neurons, and the reason is simple. Uh, the problem becomes combinatorially really, really large if we end up considering more than just three connections, but I think many of these ideas can, of course, be applied to higher order connectivity motifs. And the, I'm going to very briefly describe a theoretical framework that we have to study how a family of plasticity rules influences connectivity in networks and then I'm going to show you the results. So the idea that, that or the, the, the challenge of studying um, how these learning rules, how these plasticity rules shape the emergence of different connectivity structures in networks is that it's, it's really like a feedback loop. So on one hand, we know that connectivity affects activity. So if we have a network like this, if we focus here on the blue neuron, or sorry, on the green neuron, and look at the inputs that this green neuron receives, in this case from the red, yellow, and, and light blue neuron, we see that the spiking of this postsynaptic neuron in the network will, of course, be very heavily influenced by the strength of the synaptic connection. So clearly, what connectivity you have in the network will influence the activity that you have. But here we're studying plasticity or learning, and so clearly the activity that you have in the network will affect connectivity via these processes of learning and synaptic plasticity. So the classical STVP rule that we have seen several times now is one uh, such rule that can tell us how we can use these pairs or different uh, maybe combinations of, of spike times or firing rates, other properties of the activity of the cells to influence uh, the plasticity of the connections between the neurons. So this we've seen multiple times, basically just says that pre followed by post spiking gives rise to potentiation, post followed by pre spiking gives rise to depression. Okay, but is this the only rule that we should study? And, and, and is it really a black and white thing? Do I, am I an STDP believer or not? We all know that these rules are extremely different. People have measured them in different brain areas in the, between different uh, types of neurons. So here we see, uh, this is a review that was published 10 years ago now that quantified uh, you know, different types of rules. We call them Hebian if they follow this classical pre-post gives rise to potentiation, post-pre gives rise to depression. We call them anti hebian if they're flipped along the vertical axis. Um, they can be symmetric, such as this rule that we see here in the hippocampus. They can be LTD dominated, they can be LTP dominated. So depending on the brain region and the types of cells that you have, these rules can take different shapes. They can also take different shapes and forms if you have different brain states, different no neuromodulators different developmental stages, whether you care about behavior and whatnot. So really, you know, what is the right rule to be studying? So what we tried to do in our work was to actually focus on um, these STDP rules as a family of rules that we can parameterize in specific ways and investigate what could potentially be different types of connectivity architectures, focusing now on these three neural motifs that I introduced at the beginning, that will emerge if we now choose these different types of plasticity rules that can be parameterized in different ways. So we have heavy and anti heavy and symmetric. And so the framework that we use, and I'm just going to very briefly mention this, stems from uh, the idea that we can separate the time scales over which activity and dynamics operate, which are generally fast, and the time scale over which plasticity operates, which is very slow. And so this allows us to write the average change in the weight as this integral that involves the product of the correlation between the pre and the postsynaptic neurons that are involved in the change of the synaptic weight and what we call the plasticity rule, which is from now on going to be denoted by this kernel L. So what we are going to do is change the shape of this kernel L and ask what are the emergent motifs based on how this WIJ between two neurons, I and J, uh, changes. 
The framework we're going to use is known as this uh, a, a theory of, of, uh, that Hawkes proposed actually a very long time ago in 71. This is a three-page paper that I very much encourage you to read. Uh, it's a very dense paper, but a beautiful paper that basically um, suggests that we can describe these, the firing of these neurons as these mutually exciting stochastic processes. And based on this, what we can do is we can describe the correlation function between these pre- and postsynaptic neurons, which is an important parameter that tells us how we can describe the change in the synaptic weight as the product of terms that involve what we call interaction kernels. So these are the synaptic kernels that tell us how spikes are transmitted from the pre- and the postsynaptic neuron. You can think of this as simply being the EPSP function, the weights and the firing rates of the cells. And this little schematic really tells us what, um, what <coughs> the framework really is. So we have a pre- and a postsynaptic neuron. The pre-neuron is J. The postsynaptic neuron here is I. What we're trying to model here or describe here is the change in this weight, Wij. And the way we can do this with this Hox theory is to basically include the contribution into the change of the weight Wij from all the other neurons in the network that we label as K by including all the possible paths through which activity, in this case spikes, can propagate to the pre- and the postsynaptic neuron in question. These are the neurons I and J. And so in this example that I've shown you here, there's a two connection path labeled here as beta through which spikes can go from neuron K to the presynaptic neuron J. And there's a single path well, alpha is equal to 1, that tells us how these spikes can go to the postsynaptic neuron I. So we can use this framework, and then we can get our expression for the weights, and then we can study what happens. From now on, um, what I'm going to assume is that I'm going to cut. So this is, of course, an expression where I can include all the alphas and betas, so all the possible paths in the network. But from now on, I'm going to cut the sum, and I'm only going to include interactions where alpha and beta can be maximum 1. So they can be 0 and 1, but I'm not going to include alphas and betas bigger than, bigger than 1. And actually, we see that when we simulate this, you know, this, this approximation is actually uh, very good. So what do we get? So if we only assume that these alpha and beta paths have length 1, we get linear dynamical systems that tell us how we can study the connections um, in simple three-neuron circuits. So let's, let's say for now on that we have, from now on that we have this three-neuron circuit uh, from the, the blue, red, and the yellow uh, neuron. And we can basically study the evolution of the synaptic weights as a linear dynamical system where we can study the individual, so the, 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 the evolution of the synaptic weights in these two, uh, in these three two-dimensional planes. And so what we see, if we pick this plasticity rule, so this is the vanilla STDP rule, I have chosen it so that the potentiation and depression time scales here are identical, so the tau plus and the tau minus are the same. And I have chosen it so that the area under the blue curve is identical to the area under, in a moment, under the, the red curve. And so what we can see here in this three-neuron circuit is that the only place you can end up is in the corners. So this particular learning rule, depending on the initial conditions, ends up only preferring unidirectional connections. Question, Robert? Yeah, I just was too slow on the equation. Is this all additive? <coughs> this is all? Additive update? This no is all additive, yes. That's right. It's all additive. OK, so basically after plasticity, if we look at how these, these pairs of weights evolve in this three-neuron circuit, what we get are two different circuits where we only have unidirectional connections. The first circuit, we call this a divergent motif because we have this divergent connection coming out of the blue neuron into the red and the yellow neuron. And here we also have the emergence of these cycles or these loops. So this type of learning rule can give us this activity, uh, this, type of, uh, this type of structural motifs in these three-neuron networks. But as I said, we're not interested in just studying one particular learning rule. Now we want to parameterize the learning rules and investigate how, if we change the shape of this learning rule, or we manipulate, say, the time constants of potentiation and depression, or we manipulate, say, the area under the curve, how will uh, this change the predictions that we have for the motifs in these three neuron circuits? So the two parameters that I chose to vary, so this is how we, we look at the family of plasticity of STDP rules, are I chose to change the ratio of the red and the blue, so the potentiation and depression in this STDP rule. This is shown on the x-axis. And I also changed uh, the, the ratio of the depression and the potentiation time scale, so tau minus divided by tau plus. So the example that we saw so far was in the middle, where we basically had what we call a balanced or vanilla STDP rule, where depression, potentiation, everything was exactly the same. 
And these are the types of motifs that emerge if we do this. But now we can actually vary all these properties and we see that the system ends up evolving. So this, this simple three neuron circuit ends up evolving into very different <coughs> configurations. So we can maybe start, I should have revealed this one by one, but we can maybe start by looking at the, if we, let's say we keep the balance of blue and red to be equal to one, but we manipulate the uh, ratio of the depression and the potentiation time scale of the learning rule. What we see now is actually the emergence of a very different uh, fixed point in this linear dynamical system. Namely, we can now actually go into the upper corner, which corresponds to the regime of having a reciprocal or a bidirectional connection. And so in addition to just these two, this divergent and this cycle motif, where we only have unidirectional connections in this three neuron circuit, we now have five additional uh, connectivity motifs that also include bidirectional connections. So for example, this one corresponds to a, almost like an assembly, a circuit where every neuron is connected to every other neuron in uh, bidirectional ways. Then we can, of course, um, this, this regime seems to, I've color coded it, so this regime here in green seems to be the same as that one. Here what we have is we have reduced the depression relative to the potentiation, so the LTD relative to LTP area is less than one, and we have also uh, scaled the time scales uh, of the depression and the potentiation, so we, have, we see the same motifs there. And then we sort of have these two extreme regimes, so in the case where everything is almost very, very dominated by by potentiation, we have the emergence only of these bidirectional connections, so this is very good for, for example, of assembly formation. And we have, we have this other regime that is very depression dominated, and so here we do actually have other novel motifs that emerge that primarily involve unidirectional connections. And so we can really do this mapping, and we can really see how this family of basically STDP rules when we manipulate the properties of the STDP rules, namely the area under the potentiation depression and the time scales, we can get a different family of uh, motifs. Let's look at this a bit more carefully. So actually first, um, this is the same plot that I showed you before, and the examples that I showed you here, we can actually map them analytically on a, on a full face plane where we can indeed look at a specific not just these, you know, not just these nine by nine points, three by three, but we can actually look at um, a continuity of values of this depression to potentiation ratio and the ratio of the depression to uh, potentiation time scales. And so um, at the bottom here, you can see all the possible motifs that can be observed in this three neuron circuit. And underneath, I have, uh, under, I have used the color to denote which are the motifs that can emerge in each of these different regions, depending on yeah, what the depression to potentiation ratio is and what the ratio of the time scales is. And so what I want you to point out is that if we use this vanilla Hebbian learning rule, STDP uh, learning rule, uh, that is asymmetric, where pre-post gives you potentiation, post-pre gives you depression, there are several motifs that you cannot get with this rule. So these are three motifs, there's a total of four connectivity motifs that you cannot get with this rule, uh, independent of you know, how you actually change the parameters or the properties of the learning rule. So keep this in mind. Um, <coughs> we can also run numerical simulations. So nobody asked me what, what's the white region there. The white region there is actually a region in which our analytics cannot actually predict what motifs uh, we see. But if we actually run numerical simulations, so again, this is a three neuron circuit, we run it 20 times just starting with different initial conditions. We can see that this matches our analytics very, very nicely. And in reality, actually, if you simulate this, you do get, you can fill in this white region where analytically we cannot predict what motifs emerge. Okay, so these are the motifs that can come up from the Hebbian rule. We also wanted to see whether some of these results also apply when we simulate larger networks, when we look at larger networks. So here we considered networks of 100 neurons, all excitatory. We put in uh, one of the different rules, so um, again, this is a, what is this? this, is a nine by nine, or this is a more, this is a four by three grid, so a total of 12 points that we chose here. We simulated these networks of 100 neurons, and it, for each of the cases, so for each of the plots that you see, so here's the one that we looked at before, the vanilla STDP rule that has equivalent, uh, the uh, identical potentiation and depression um, areas and the identical time scales, tau plus and tau minus, and when we simulate this network, we see this is the fraction, this is the frequency of motifs that emerge in these networks. 
you see that indeed we get exactly those motifs that are predicted analytically from simply our three neuron circuits. So many of these the results that we can get from the three neuron circuit pertain also to larger networks of 100, of 100 neurons. So all of these, it's, it's exactly the same motifs that we have there and I have tried to color code um, each of these, these bars according to the, to the colors that we see in the face plane. All good for now? Okay. So you may be wondering, yeah, Michael, quick question. question. Yeah. Do you have to do some sort of renormalization of phenol synapses from blowing up? We have an upper bound, and that's the only thing we do. Okay, we have. So we do not have any kind of other normalization. <laughs> yeah. We just have an upper bound. Yep. Uh, are all synapses initialized to be of equal weight throughout the network? There is. They're all initialized to be weak, and we actually take them to be from a small uniform range. So this is not too relevant. Yeah. They're all weak and from some uniform range. Okay, but this is, so I've changed the shape of this learning rule, but this is still only the classical Hebbian plasticity rule. So what happens when we now um, change the learning rule? Can we get more motifs, perhaps? So now um, I've actually flipped the learning rule, so I've made it from Hebbian to anti-Hebbian, and I can do exactly the same exercise. I can take it, uh, I can look at the three neuron circuit, I can change the ratio of uh, depression to potentiation and also the time scales of the, uh, depression to potentiation. So these are the four extremes of what these learning rules look like. And now what we can see is that we can actually get a few new connectivity motifs. So here's the comparison. So these are the phase planes in each of these different regimes to tell us sort of what are the motifs that we predict. And so you can see that there are the ones that were previously predicted with the Hebbian rule are shown here with the green box. And there are, out of the four that we could not predict with the Hebbian, with the vanilla STDP rule, there are actually two that can be predicted from this anti-Hebbian STDP rule that's just flipped symmetrically along the y-axis. So there's this one that has actually these two bidirectional connections and an absence of a connection between the other two neurons and one that just has a single bidirectional connection. Okay, so maybe this gives us hope that if we now explore really fully the whole space of, of um, learning rules, we can indeed capture all of these different um, motifs. But that actually doesn't uh, turn out to be the case. So then we explore the symmetric learning rule, where we can again modulate how much potentiation and depression we have. And this learning rule, I'm going to flip between these two slides. So this is the anti hebbian and this is the symmetric. So it looks very similar, right? The only difference is that, um, oops, the only difference is that here, the boundary that separates you know, these, these two regions is sort of like a curve that's concave or convex, and in the other case, the, the curve actually flips the, the convexity. But otherwise, the, the face planes look different, but otherwise the motifs that are predicted are basically the same as the ones that are, by this symmetric rule, are the ones that are predicted by the anti hebbian plasticity rule. So there are still two motifs that we cannot predict. And, but we didn't give up, so what we realized is, okay, all of this is clearly only including homogeneous uh, learning rules in these networks. Um, uh, focusing only on the three neural motifs, but also in the large networks of 100 neurons that we were simulating. So, and this is of course probably not the case, right? We said there's all these learning rules in different brain circuits between different cell types, and so we need to kind of harness and, and utilize all of this heterogeneity. So again, we looked at a very simple framework with a three neuron motif, and then we simulated the larger network where we now started to mix these learning rules. So here we mixed a Hebbian and an anti-Hebbian learning rule, and we did this by basically assigning uh, this according to the postsynaptic neuron. So in this case, the po if the post for the postsynaptic neuron, which is the blue neuron, all the incoming connections experienced Hebbian plasticity, and for the yellow neurons, all the incoming connections experienced anti-Hebbian um, plasticity, anti-Hebbian STDP rule. We still got the same connections we got before. However, when we now flipped how we assigned Hebbian and anti-Hebbian, so now the incoming connections to the blue neuron experience um, anti-Hebbian and the others to the yellow Hebbian plasticity, we were now able to get the other uh, two motifs. So what I'm trying to say here is, you know, there is a family of STDP rules. They can be symmetric, they can be asymmetric. Uh, they can be Hebbian, anti-Hebbian, depending on whether this thing, we have this causal relationship pre, following, followed by post, giving rise to potentiation or depression in the case of anti-Hebbian. And all of them can be modulated by changing how much potentiation or depression you have. So we really, rather than thinking of it as a single STDP rule that operates in a circuit and that's it, 
I would like to propose that maybe we could think of this as a family of STDP rules that all work together uh, in these circuits, and then they can give rise to these interesting structures, uh, interesting connectivity motifs. All right, and I think I have maybe five more minutes. Five more minutes, you're the chair, good. So all of this was with excitation. So recently we have also started to think about inhibition. And um, because you know, excitation is, is, is all great, but, but there is a lot of inhibition in the brain and it is very important because it's needed to, to stabilize things, but it's also needed to also induce some specificity. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the view maybe of 10 years ago was that inhibition is really just there to impose homeostasis to make sure that activity and connect, connection, connection strengths don't blow up. But in recent years, there's all sorts of studies, both modeling and experimental, that argue that there is actually some kind of co-tuning so, uh, with excitation. So these motifs that we see that emerge in the, at the level of uh, connections between excitatory neurons are also reflected in the connections from inhibitory neurons to excitatory neurons as well. This is just an example to show you that you know, this type of co-tuning is especially relevant for the emergence of, say, these strongly connected cells, uh, groups of cells known as assemblies, and there's some, you know, lots of evidence now that says that inhibitory neurons also participate in these assemblies. So they're not just providing blanket inhibition, unconstrained connectivity to the rest of the network, but they're really talking. I mean, this is also what Tim showed earlier. There's this codependence, so there is this, you know, they listen to what is happening to the excitatory cells. And so to, to get a, you know, more of a mathematical understanding of what is really going on, we again started with small circuit connectivity motifs, and here we actually just have two neurons, an excitatory and inhibitory neuron. We're fixing almost everything, so we're fixing the firing rates of the excitatory and inhibitory cells, we're fixing the connection from E to I, but we're assuming that the connection from inhibition to excitation is plastic. And so here is the learning rule that Tim and Henning Spreckler proposed more than 10 years ago now that I think has beautiful homeostatic properties, can regulate firing rates and recurrent neural networks, and can do all these cool things. And so this was, of course, also our starting point. But what my postdoc Dylan Festa realized was that one can actually take the expression for the, learning, for the, for the change in the synaptic weights, or for the learning rule, and decompose the plasticity rule into contributions that separately involve the firing rates of the cells, and I think we actually had some discussions about this earlier. So there's a term that involves the presynaptic firing rate, the postsynaptic firing rate. There's a term that involves the product of the pre and the postsynaptic firing rate, and this constant is actually very interesting. It's actually the area under the curve of the plasticity rule. It's an important parameter, as well as the correlations in the spiking between the excitatory and the inhibitory neuron. And so when Dylan actually plugged in the parameters of uh, Fogels and Spreckler rule, he realized that that rule is actually very rate dominated. So the goal of this rule is to really homeostatically regulate the firing rate of the cells. So the, that's what I pl we, Dylan plotted the learning rule to be. This looks a little bit different than how I think uh, was plotted by Tim and, and Hennig in the original paper. And that is because here I only plot the contribution from the, so the, the L term. And I think in the original paper, they actually also include the rate-based term, which would push the rule a bit, little bit downward, so you would actually also get a depression. But if you, if you take the parameters from the fogel specular rule, you see that in the decomposition that we have achieved now for the inhibitory to the excitatory change in the weight, the terms that depend on the postsynaptic firing rate are zero, and the term that dominates is actually the one that is really the product that involves the product of the pre- and the postsynaptic firing rate. So this learning rule is very dominated by uh, differences in the firing rates, and that's why it's so good at homeostatically reg regulating the firing rate. So here, if we take what we're simulating are now these two separate motifs, one motif in which we have a strong excitatory to inhibitory connection, and we're just looking at whether this connection is present or not, how the inhibitory to excitatory connection develops. And so as Tim showed, indeed, this rule is homeostatic, the firing rate uh, of these two excitatory neurons to which the inhibitory neuron projects to. Here's the dark blue one with the outline and the light blue one indeed converge to some target rate and the inhibitory weights also go up to some values. So we basically have potentiation of both this co-tune, so this bidirectional uh, connection with the excitation, but also to what we call this, this sort of lateral connection. But then we, we, we thought, well, what happens if we change the parameters of the learning rules? So we actually start ignoring this a term that depends very strongly on the firing rates. This is the middle, uh, the third term in the sum, so this R pre R post B times B. 
by basically making B, which is the area under the curve, of the plasticity rule equal to zero. So now we're really, we really want to understand how correlations between the excitatory and the inhibitory neuron influence how the, you know, the weights will evolve in the system and what will happen to the firing rates um, of the cells. And so now we can take different shapes of what we call now this covariance dominated learning rule where the B term is zero. So if this term, this rule really depends on changes in the, in the correlation. So the area under the curve there is zero. So what we see here is if we take this symmetric learning rule, we now see that one of the weights becomes potentiated and the other one completely depresses. So we have the emergence of these co-tuned inhibitory neurons relative to the <coughs> So the emergence of these bidirectional or mutual connections. And um, <coughs> if we take a different shape of this inhibitory learning rule, we basically see that now uh, the, the opposite case happens, namely the bidirectional connection becomes depressed and this lateral connection becomes, uh, becomes potentiated. And this is something that Farish de Lagzi, together with Brent Doran and, and Adrian Fairhall, has actually looked at a little bit in, in kind of larger simulations where these learning rules were, were present. Um, but I, we wanted to sort of look at how this particular decomposition of the learning rule by trading off these terms that depend on the rates and the correlations can really promote the emergence of these mutual connections where excitation and inhibition are really strongly going together versus this lateral inhibition where inhibition is not really matched uh, to excitation. Okay, and I think I'm running out of time just to tell you that this also works when we simulate larger networks. So here we start with a network where we only have inhibitory to excitatory plasticity and we can indeed go in this regime that we call co covariance dominated. So we assume that we have a learning rule where the uh, contribution from the firing rates would be zero. So the area of the, the blue and the red would be basically zero. The potentiation and depression would balance each other. We assume that the excitatory to excitatory connectivity is fixed. The excitatory to inhibitory connectivity is fixed and, and inhibitory to inhibitory as well. Um, and the only thing that we assume is plastic is this inhibitory to excitatory connectivity. And if we choose now the parameters for this particular learning rule, so for this symmetric one that should promote from our, from our simple motif analysis, that should promote this bidirectional connection, this is a scenario two, we indeed see that this is what happens. So the mutual connection, so we can look at the average of the weights in the network, the mutual connections become much, much bigger than the unidirectional connections. And you know, we can also look at uh, sort of the distribution of all of the connections, all of their strengths. And so we see here a much, much bigger tail for these mutual connections than for the unidirectional connections. All right, um, we can do other things. Oh, I really should have shown this earlier. We can do other things here. We actually take a ring network and we basically put two types of inhibitory neurons that can follow these two different plasticity rules, the symmetric one, which promotes these co-tuned excitatory to inhibitory neurons and this other one that causes the isometric one that gives you this uni um, the lateral um, inhibition and this is something that I think Fairste, Laxi with Anne-Marie Oswald they measured this also experimentally to be um, relevant for different inhibitory subtypes so PV2E and SST2E actually obey these two different learning rules and we can actually train our ring networks to indeed um, uh, capture these different types of uh, these different types of connections. So on one hand, capture the unidirectional uh, connections for the when they experience this plasticity rule. So here we see uh, this is this, these are the connectivity matrices E uh, I to E because that's the one that's plastic inhibition to excitation. So we see a lot of white along the diagonal, which basically tells us. These are the unidirectional connections that, that tend to induce this lateral inhibition. And the ones, the, the connections that experience this symmetric uh, inhibitory to excitatory plasticity rule show here a lot of red on the diagonal, meaning that they are the ones that actually co-tune with the excitatory cells. Okay, so I'm definitely out of time. Just to summarize, I will uh, skip this. The, the <laughs> idea that <laughs> I hope what I, what I have shown you, even if you didn't follow the details, is that I, I like to think of plasticity as just a family of different learning rules that can be parameterized in different ways because they do apply to different brain regions, different types of circuits, different types of cell types. 
And uh, we're now starting to look at some connectomic data sets and we're hoping that by kind of reversing the process that we have done, we've built, we, we have a bottom-up approach. We're studying this family of learners and predicting a family of learning rules and predicting motifs. But now we can go back and look at connectomics data and look at what types of motifs emerge and then hopefully say something based on our analysis about the types of, of learning goals that, that exist in these circuits. Thank you. Um, maybe I can have one question. <laughs> behind schedule, so let's ask the panelists to prepare, come with your chairs, and we will take questions while we talk. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, nice stuff, very uh, systematic. Um, Claudia had this paper, Connectivity Reflects Coding, and I guess it kind of is, is coding an important component also in the outcome of Moki, and if so, how? So we really aren't thinking about coding in any way. It's all about the emergence of these motifs. Uh, you're thinking, I think this was the title of her voltage SDDP learning goal, right? This yes, I'm the, thinking about what's, what's the structure of this spiking in the network and is it going to bias you towards particular motifs? Uh, so I mean, we're not addressing anything about coding. All we're doing is just saying, if you take these different plasticity rules, what are the types of connectivity structures that you will observe? But and then one should process. think about, but 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 yeah. Like, I mean, if we think about, well, if we think about computations, for example, you could think about okay sequences. You could think about assemblies and what are the prevalent motifs in such architectures, right? So yeah. in sequences, you probably want a lot of unidirectional connections. In assemblies, you probably want a lot of bidirectional connections. Probably if you have some kind of mixture, you will be somewhere in between. And so this could sort of tell you what are the learning rules you should use if you want, or if you have a network with assemblies, or if you have a network of sequences. Um, maybe the missing link is like if you have a computation, what is the type of architecture that can realize the computation, and then this would tell you, okay, what are the learning rules that can, can achieve that. So underneath it's all Hox processes for this analysis. So that so yes, that's right. So the theory for now, we are using these, these Hox processes, so that is a... Um, yeah, I mean, that is but one limitation, it's what allows us to do the math, but we can, but if we simulate things that they look okay also with like leaky integrated fire neurons and, yeah. Okay, let's start the panel discussion then. Just to start with, let's uh, consider a question that already was partially uh, addressed uh, by some talks. So what levels of brain organization should we be looking at to understand the learning rules? So is it circuits, cells, or molecules? What do All of the above. People think. Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> I think you should follow up on that. <laughs> Well, I, I think it was a good answer this morning, and I can't remember who said it, but like picking, I don't, going all the way, obviously the, the real brain has all these levels all the time, so they're, it's hard to uh, separate them, it's just we like to think of the levels separately for our mental convenience, but uh, at least with modeling I think it's only really feasible to think about two levels at a time and try and bridge them, and that's the goal, so maybe like we frog one at a time, but yeah, of course it's like, just because I advocated for molecules um, being relevant doesn't mean I think behavior is not crucial as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to disagree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, I like very much that you focus on the differences on SDP because a lot of, there's not much consensus across experiments regarding repetitions and, and the frequencies evaluated. And, and these things make a lot of different kinds of neural noise. And, and then we don't have a really, we only have a memory of that shape. Uh, but going down to those molecules, do you think that if, say, can get uh, calmodulin K2 and calcineurin in effect some sort of uh, changes 
we, he's definitely denying in the 10 seconds. So you see changes happening in the slower time frame. Do you think that a balance of both could be? Um, so say one is LTP, one is LTP? Yeah, that's the belief that CAMK2 is necessary for LTP, and if they block calcineurin, they block LTD. So, um, but there's other molecules probably downstream of those implementing things on slower time scales, uh, definitely. But figuring out like that all. Um, so that means from a bigger time scale, you could go to lower time scale, right? Because it's a balancing circuit on something that might be decaying, but its effect is no longer affecting. Yeah, sorry, if there's a mismatch in those two, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I guess our model implicitly takes that, but we didn't really study that very well, but it hopefully it's in the model. Yeah, because they do have different, slightly different time scales. Mm -hmm. That's true. Can I just add something to this variability in the time scale that's reported? Um, or the frequency depends. I think something always to consider is what was the exact preparation that the experiment that was used and so on. So this can also influence these variabilities. And I think you know paying attention to that would be important if you interpret um, experimental data. Right, like for example, age of the animal, right? Is it a young animal? Is it an adult animal? Things like that can influence which time scales you find. And I think that makes sense. Maybe this is a very naive question. Maybe someone from my team, Blake and Kayan, so that they would have a process to do that is stable, implement some radium that is consistent with biochemistry of the cement. All of them are sort of that's the dream. <laughs> How could you do that? We already have some some spaces, but we just have to see the intersection. Right? I mean I think per Kian's comment, you you have to maybe Except that initially you you you're, you got to just try to bridge two levels because it's too hard to jump across all the levels. At once. So I think it's reasonable to say start with like okay let's try to get a learning rule that respects some of the phenomenology that models like Tim's and, and, and Julia's are trying to capture and then you know make sure that it actually can learn something as well. But then it would be hard to then wire that into molecular models as well. So then maybe you instead have to have you know something that spans from that phenomenological level down to a biophysical molecular model as well. And hopefully, if if you kind of attack it at all those different levels, bridging those different levels, eventually it's going to link up. Okay. Uh, I have a question about these like multiple timescales of plasticity and uh, thinking about them from a behavioral neuroscience perspective. And this kind of classic difference between masked training regimes and distributed training regimes. And a distributed one meaning you take a bunch of repetitions of some learning experience and you distribute it across time. Um, and you get a memory that's more robust and actually seems to be distributed across maybe a wider network of systems in the brain. Um, do you think that this would maybe just speculating be related to things happening at the synaptic level or yeah. at the sort of systems level and about replay and things like, like yeah, that? Yeah, that's a good question. Like that Gary Lynch paper that I showed with the one hour thing, the yeah. title of that paper is something like <laughs> the cellular car correlate of space memory, you know, which is yeah. a stretch, but like. Uh, doesn't sound impossible. So I, I think the answer is probably going to be some of these things happen at a, or you can understand them at a single synapse level. And then there's definitely other processes that happen on probably longer time scales, like hours to day, like the systems consolidation business and representational drift and things like that, that are more collective and widespread phenomena. So I don't know the short answer. But, but I think there's like the brain activity is fast. And that has to go through all these uh, different time scale mechanisms to end up with a very slow thing that's your memory long term. So I think there's some sort of um, one way traffic there that's unavoidable. And just take, I guess, if it takes some time for things to percolate through the brain. Like, other than um, electrical signaling, there's not very many ways to communicate quickly in the brain. So we kind of need other slower things like sleep and I don't know maybe some chemical growth of things or turnover to implement those slower times or those uh, yeah long times of changes. Mm -hmm. okay. So for me the biggest question is what's the air signal in cortex or is there one? 
the biggest question for the experiment was, are we, when are we going to get that? I mean, because we can speculate. We have you know, all sorts of ideas what it could be, and, and if we have it, what we do with it, but we can't kind of guess. I mean, it's to, to be clear, you don't need an error signal. What do you say? You don't need an error signal necessarily. It's, with no error signal at all, can you do stuff in a deep network? Oh, yeah, man. It's called target propagation. But also, no, but you need, other, but that's, in some sense, that's an error signal, right? It's coming back through the activity. You just need a target that you specify, and then you need to reconstruct that target in the rest of the layers. And, and furthermore, calculate the error locally between the target and your current activity. So it's just error, error signal is perfect. Yeah. Well, no, it depends on, on what you mean. So, so here, here's what I'd say. Like you, you, it depends on how you define things. But let me give you another example this way. So there's a beautiful paper from Josh Sacramento's group called the Least Control Principle that came out recently, where what they do is they have a control system, and they force the target on the control system. And, and the way they do that is by having an additional control signal coming in. It forces the system to the correct answer. And then the loss function is actually just to reduce that control signal. Now, if you want, you could, count, you could characterize that control signal as an error, but it's not really an error. It's yeah, a but control so, signal. Let's feed that activity. Yeah. It's in essence, aren't just sitting there. It's not just pre-posted. Well, no, it's not just pre-posted. It's, right. it's not just pre-posted. There's something else going on. I'm with you. Yeah, there's something. Maybe there's there's, a, there's a third, fourth, yeah, fifth there term. Lots, there are, you know, theoretically, there are lots of ideas out there. Yeah. Um, but very much really, it'd be nice. But, but I mean, Christina's talk presented, for example, with BTSP, it's, it's probably a target signal coming in in hippocampus, for example, right? A kind of related question to that, and the idea came up at the end. In biology, the synapses are more complicated than a pre and a post. There is glia, there is a lot of other things happening there. There are tripartite and quadripartite synapses. Like, how much of the dynamics over there are we like missing out on the space of potential learning rules that we could get? Because it might not just be modulation over the long time scale, it might just be very rapid feedback coming through another circuit, like say dopamine in like fruit flies. Like are we missing that space of learning rules altogether by focusing on just two setup uh, pre and a post -sitter? So so I think so uh, go uh, ahead. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understand. So, so are you saying we are not considering neuromodulation, or I'm not no, quite sure no, what you're talking about? Like neuromodulation is going to change your XTDP shape and in, in different ways, but there might be very, very rapid activity-dependent things. Like uh, one of the things that happens in Drosophila is the spike. Uh, the, there is this timing-dependent effect of spike between the presynapse and the postsynapse. In a way, it's, it's a little unclear, but the, it is highly modulated by the presence of dopamine, which is actively changing very fast in fast time scales and is modulated by downstream feedback to the dopaminergic neurons. I mean, absolutely, there is definitely some role for neuromodulation there. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think, yes, that's something totally to be you know, analyzed and explored, no question about it. Um, you ask, I guess, about GIA influence, the same there, right? There is a lot of potential plasticity there where, you know, GIA could en envelop or form envelopes about certain synapses where it's not there. It's just so much to explore, I think. I mean, sometimes it's also useful to sort of simplify things to have, so that we can <coughs> tackle experimentally certain questions, but absolutely, there's a lot of things to be explored there, and potentially we are missing a lot. Yeah. I mean, I guess I kind of wanted to ask sort of a question about the error signal. So to me, as I'm, you know, naive, uh, a little bit naive about sort of the you know, machine learning thing, I think I, I kind of find it hard to think about the error signal as something that you, um, that you send as a global signal, as opposed to something that's calculated on a single cell basis. Is this something that I'm understanding correctly? I mean, um, you know, because I imagine that the error should be different for every cell, potentially. How can you sort of signal that if you think about how regions communicate with each other? Is that possible? I mean, it is possible. You can definitely have that level of single cell resolution in your communication. So it would be that cells sort of, you know, send 
each cell sends a slightly different error signal, for example, from one from one region to the other. Precisely. Okay, yeah. and so there would be yeah. some hardwiring or some sort of hardwired connectivity going on. It doesn't even have to be hardwired though. That can be plastic. Mm. This is what's been been shown in all of the work on first. So feedback alignment used uh, hardwired error pathway, uh, but more recent work on algorithms for weight alignment use plastic error feedback pathways, and those work in fact better than the hardwired error feedback pathway. Um, it, it's totally possible, and this is what uh, I think is is important to remember. There's no reason, given all of the machinery in the brain, that you couldn't have a high-dimensional error signal or target signal, whatever you have. Think it is. Okay. Um, I, um, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed all of these talks. Um, I had a question, um, I guess this question's been addressed in various forms, like basically um, how these uh, learning rules constrain the algorithm space. I feel like this version just came up in all the talks, but I had like a particularly clear sense of it in Juliana's talk where there's these motifs and it feels like that's saying something about how the learning structure would constrain the graph structure, would it constrain like the circuits in the algorithm. <coughs> And similarly, like in your talk, like it seems like there's some things that this um, that, that might not have a projection that works for which there's any degree of descent. And um, yeah, I think I'd be curious for everybody, like how do you think about the learning rules you guys say constrain the algorithm space? If, if that's a scale we can say things about at this point. I mean, they definitely, they definitely, I think they definitely constrain because what. You you cannot you cannot implement certain types of computations if you don't have the right architecture. But I feel like it's kind of a second level of mapping. On one hand, you you have the mapping of okay, what is the learning rule, what is the graph structure, and now that you have the graph structure, what is it that you can do with this network, right? So it's like a second level mapping that you need to understand. Given a particular architecture in your network, what can you do with this? You know, is it is it an associative memory-like structure where you, you, know, you rely on these strong connections and pattern completion and so on? Or is it something that's, I don't know, very sparsely connected with some chains like whatever, in, I don't know, HEC in the bird song or something where you really need to, to create very precise sequences or... Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what uh, Tim set up. Like, another way of thinking about that is you could imagine meta learning under constraints, and then you can find out what algorithms are possible uh, from that. Um, there's been some work that way. I remember a paper from Jack Lindsay a few years ago, um, and I, I think definitely, it, as Julian said, this will constrain the algorithm that you can implement necessarily. It's what are the the terms you have in your learning rule, what are the possible time scales of your learning rule, and all that stuff. Can I, can I ask you guys about this? Uh, the, I mean, my, my understanding is that in ML, unsupervised learning is often, sometimes rather used for pre-training networks to get them in a good position for supervised training. So that sounds very really like what we're talking about already. That... Yep, absolutely. That is, I mean, it depends on what you mean by unsupervised. I think there's sort of a funny thing that sometimes happens um, in the communication between ML and neuroscience right now, which is um, unsupervised learning is abs, well, self-supervised learning is critical to machine learning right now. It is the basis of most of the recent advances in, uh, that, that you are all familiar with in terms of big models and stuff like that. And that's different than unsupervised. It's slightly different, yes. It, well, I know it's different because what it's doing is it's taking a data stream and it's treating that data stream as a target for itself. So it's not that you just get some data and then you do some stuff with it. You, you're still trying to match some target. It's just that the target's derived from the data stream. The training's on the supervised rules, I guess. It's done with backpropagation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it could be that that's how unsupervised learning happens in the brain, to be clear, right? Like, we've seen a lot of evidence from, from Kim, from Christina, from, from other groups that 
um, there seems to be predictive learning in the brain, and this is arguably a form of unsupervised learning. You're getting a stream of data, you're predicting the next thing. And if that prediction is basically a target for your algorithm, then it's, it's I think, perfectly consistent with what we know about the brain. Okay. I have uh, another question in the spirit of biological details that may or may not matter. Um, how do you all think about uh, any potential role of stuff happening, not necessarily at the synapse, but inside cells, particularly like in the soma? For example, uh, transcription and stuff like that. Does, does that matter? In, in a substantive way that should affect how we think about the algorithm. Like Eric Campbell says, yes, because yeah. on the slow time scale, it's called, uh, it's gene transcription seems to lead to uh, like structural plasticity changes, but that's still synaptic plasticity, just a bit of a delay. And uh, there is some, like, so there's work from Alcino Silva and Denise Kai showing that they're trying to find out what neurons are get wrapped up in a hippocampal memory, and they've figured out that it's to do with Krebs expression. So, and that seems to be, like, that's a gene that gets transcribed often in response to neural activity and seems to control the excitability of the neurons, so regulates some ion channels that change, make neurons more or less excitable. And that has a, you know, sort of biases which neurons are going to get uh, activated during memory encoding. So whether that's sort of directly learning itself or just like an ancillary rule for learning, it's hard, you know, it's hard to differentiate. But yeah, I'm sure there's some components, but I think the big issue is that uh, like synapses are a little bit like autonomous machines that can make decisions based on local signals and then implement them fairly quickly. Whereas gene transcription, all that stuff just takes time, like minutes to hours. So it's not really going to be much use for encoding or learning things on fast time scales, I guess. But, but isn't that like uh, a benefit <coughs> rather than a bug? Because we're talking about like how we account for uh, learning a memory on very, very long time. True, yeah, like, there's some things happening on slow time scales that make sense, and like that's part of this uh, synaptic tagging idea that protein synthesis happens on the slow time scale and might cause a, like a, a one idea is that, uh, from Richard Morris and uh, also uh, Eric Handel and others that um, when there's an important event in your life, you create some wave of protein synthesis that acts as like a, a, a gate on long-term plasticity, and then but the proteins hang around for an hour or two, and that sets like a time window inside which things can more preferentially get uh, encoded in long-term memory and there's evidence that's controlled by dopamine, for example. So they, they think that that might be a correlate of like these flashbulb memory events. So something important happens in my life. I remember other things in that happen nearby time, but on this one hour time scale. So yeah, I think the answer is yes, and it's less studied, I'd say, than um, all this uh, fast time scale stuff. And there's also this work from Aaron Schumann that there is actually local translation in the dendrites um, close to the synapses, you know, so that the proteins, I guess, don't have to be transported all the way out. So there's local mRNA and local protein translation. That's kind of important for synaptic plasticity, actually. So I think I think it's very important, but yeah, less studied. I think all of us kind of spoke more about this induction phase as opposed to you know later expression, maintenance, these type of questions. And all of us, I mean, this was related to the earlier question, all of us assumed, well, maybe you also actually, that it is the only thing that matters is just the connection between two neurons. But in fact, synapses are on dendrites. And, you know, I think Tim showed this a little bit, right? With, there is a lot of interaction, a lot of stuff happening on the dendrites and clusters and nonlinearities and ion channels and stuff. We don't think about. And so it's not just a single number that evolves in time, but it's and actually spines. Very, and spines, exactly. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, what's the question also? Uh, I had a question kind of trying to link the lowest level we've seen with the synapse and the normative uh, one. Like we talked about metabolic costs and I was wondering whether <coughs> on the single synapse uh, simulation you can actually try to estimate costs. Because I was a little bit wondering, I mean, if I think about the synapse, probably if, even if it doesn't change, it's already a lot of cost just maintaining kind of the... And so with a synaptic change, actually the main cost for a I don't know, overall synaptic volume or something, it's like trying to relate this to level. 
Yeah, Mark has a review paper on that, right? Yeah, we were looking at that actually. Well, the, the, this hangs together with this protein synthesis dependent stuff in the spacing. So the early expression of, uh, of, of plasticity, which Kean has described, comes, it seems to come at almost no cost. It's only when you start to do this consolidation, and when you look at protein synthesis dependent plasticity, that it becomes costly. Um, now you could make a very quick draw and then say, well, the protein synthesis is probably then expensive, but there's, for instance, a paper by Kowalski that shows that, well, maybe that's maybe not so expensive. So actually, it's not clear where the energy is going. Uh, you can make estimates of it. It's about 10 million joules per bit of information, which is about a million times worse than your hard drive. So you can think about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the precise the, 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 the local stuff seems to be free, but then where the energy goes is actually not clear. Um, with all these synaptic variables, we sort of have d weight equals some function. What's the time scale of that? Like, we're, we're, I'd like to get your opinion on like when does that weight change happen? You know, we're talking about weight at time t plus one equals some function of weight at time t. Brain doesn't have a centralized clock. This is all happening continuously. So I'd like to know, like, what's your views on that? Well, that's, I guess that's this expression phase where you've got some signal that says change the synapse, and then it takes some time for the synapse to reconfigure. And it, I mean, if you look at those plots that I showed, the strength goes up and then set the down, it takes about ten minutes or something. So it's relatively slow. Um, yeah. So, but I, I don't know how that fits in with the like uh, approximate backpropagation board view where I'd want to wait 10 minutes for my next rate update to our next uh, gradient descent step or something like that. I don't know. I mean, you can do, to be clear, like if you want, you can do um, your learning algorithms in continuous time rather than with the <laughs> alpha and just have, you know, the, the derivative of the weight with respect to time is equal to some function. Um, and then you can change the time scale on that. Um, you can also have it be that those continuous time equations are determining various eligibility traces that have to get some additional signal at later times, signal at later times to actually be permanently consolidated. Um, there's many ways of, of uh, such a weird and interesting question, but there's many ways of skinning that cut, and you can. Uh, uh, Really, there, there's no reason to assume that you have to wait X amount of time for the update to occur or not. It's, it's up to you. You can still have very powerful learning algorithms regardless of these considerations. Okay. Yeah, just to follow up, I'm just a little curious, like, if, uh, why would plasticity have these very long time scale dynamics if you were just running sort of quick updates? Like, like we, we know that plasticity does have these long sort of time scale dynamics. And I'm curious if, you know, is there any explanation for like why that would be advantageous rather than just possible? I mean, I, my reaction is um, from the normative perspective, it would be crazy not to have these long scale time dynamics because what you want to be doing is controlling behavior at the time scale of seconds and minutes and even longer potentially. So, you know, if you just imagine from a purely normative perspective, I backpropagate my gradients as far back as I can. Like if I can, if I'm training a neural network and I have infinite compute, I'm going to backpropagate those gradients as far as I can. That means my weight update is going to depend on stuff God knows how far back in history. Now, realistically, you want to truncate that a bit because maybe you don't actually care about the entire history of things. And of course, then there are physical and computational constraints you face. But I think the longer you can push those time scales, the better. And that's why something like BTSP was so critical to observe it, because I think the, the world in which plasticity rules are always defined on tens of milliseconds time scales was always, for me, problematic from a normative perspective. But, but, but I should, so, so I've done some work on development. And, and, you know, I worked a bit on like the retinal geniculate system and then also in cortex. So in development, time scales are slower. Mm. So cells tend to fire in bursts. They, like I'm talking about early development. So in the <coughs> it would be like even embryonic days or very early postnatal days. 
the cells are really physical, like don't have the right ion channels and they're very sluggish in their firing. So you usually get bursts in very slow time scales. And so the plasticity rules are also slow. So it's actually interesting, we've been talking a lot about BTSP, but uh, like, I don't know, I, I have to remember this because it was my very first paper as a PhD student. I worked on a rule that was called, uh, so STDP, this was B burst type dependent plasticity. BT, what is it called? Not BTDP. Uh, B BTDP, exactly. <laughs> and it was measured at the synapse from the retina to the LGN. And it was, it's on the time scale of seconds. Right. And it looks kind of like BTSP. It actually looks symmetric, but it operates on time scale of seconds. So I think it's like, okay, this in this case it's a developmental setting, so activity time scales are slower, but I mean it is Right, we have brain states, sleep, wake, even in, in adult animals, activity can really operate on different time scales. Rates can change, correlations can change, you know, you can have very fast spike correlations where things like fast learning doesn't <coughs> matter, but you can really have very slow changes that should also have some role. And then probably there you know, these long time scales of plasticity would, would be important. Okay, yeah, unfortunately we only have time for like one last question, if somebody has a good one. Can, can I actually throw a spicy thing out yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. Because, okay, so, so it came up this question of do you still believe in the STDP? <laughs> I, I can't help but introduce this as your final question. Um, and yesterday when this was asked at, uh, at the workshop on dendritic calcium spikes, uh, I very forcefully said no, I won't believe in that curve, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, so here's why, but I'm curious to hear the, the thoughts of Juliana and maybe Tim as well on this, this concern that I have about this. So when, when we look at these curves, these are derived from experiments that have very specific experimental settings, right? And when you think about the space of all the possible experiments you could have run, all the possible spike trains you could have done, all the possible conditions you could have had in your slice, or all the possible things you know your animal could have been doing, etc., that's a huge high dimensional space. And your experiment represents a, you know, a point in that space, maybe if you're lucky, a little line, and if you're really working hard, a tiny plane in that space. And so like, at what point in time can you then actually extrapolate that out and say, okay, I have this little you know, line in my 100 million dimensional space, and this is what the data looks like on this line. I'm gonna assume that the data looks like that across the rest of the space. Like, isn't that something that kind of keeps you up at night? And wouldn't it make you wonder? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but both of us said, okay, yes, we believe in STDP, but both of us show that STDP can change, right? Look at look at the STDP there, right? There are many types. I mean, it, I, I think of it as it's something that is constantly changing, maybe for one period of time for some synapses and something. And I mean, it, it's also like you showed this this from this review, right? The extrapolation from the biophysical to the phenomenological to the normative model. So this is in the phenomenological category. Right. And I mean, we, we need to we we always need to put things in some abstract way. And this is this is just one way in which we can uh, abstractly describe what the circuit is doing without going into the biophysics, without thinking about the tasks. But I think, I hope Tim, Tim agrees, I don't think we, we think it's, oh, it's this rule, and this is the rule that you know goes from when the animal is born until the animal dies, and it's independent of what the animal does. I think it's very, we all agree, it's flexibly modulated by everything, right? And it's, uh, you know, um, that, that's, how, that's how I think of it. It's not that it's one rule that's always fixed, but it's constantly changing. Right, but so then the interesting thing about that is if, it's, if it can change even more than your parametric models allow it to change, the space of those learning rules might be so vast as to be less helpful for understanding learning? I don't know, I guess that's my question, is like at what point does the zoo, that piece points. of paper, like at what point does that zoo of learning rules become just like a soup that's less helpful for you, right? I don't know. But maybe that's an overly antagonistic way to phrase it. Like I, I think spikes alone are certainly not enough right. to understand. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's what the G U believe S E P means to express. Right. Uh, do we believe spike is the one and only thing? I guess that's really the question. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. that's how you constrain yeah. the model, and so that's where I start to go. I don't believe that. 
Yeah. No, but I should agree. But okay. I think both of us are including race dependence, and so again, I mean, just with any model, right, you have to make some assumptions, you have to put some constraints, and so here we are assuming spikes and rates that matter, and voltage, but there could be other things, calcium, other molecules, so you have to put yeah, the yeah. lines somewhere. All these models are just bridges from yeah. A to B, and yeah. like, no, Kevin and Julia have covered certain bridge from their models to something else, and you know, in my case, I have them somewhere else, and yeah, I, I, we just have to put all these bridges together to make like a ladder or something, and then get from the bottom to the top. Or a soup. Yeah. Can I explain a little bit this question? So do you believe that milliseconds help timing backwards? It doesn't matter whether how the process of the road looks like, but really, the essence of SDG for me is that millisecond time scale. Uh, spike timing doesn't matter. Do you believe that that's important for learning in the brain? No, so that was the I, I do. I mean, it depends. It depends on the brain region. I mean, yeah. there are some brain regions where it definitely matters. So, I think it's this your multiple time scale. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, and that was the you know Gershner's motivation for proposing SCP in the first place was this yeah. Barno like yeah. uh, auditory discrimination thing. So, like, it makes a lot of sense there. But uh, does that mean it's Involved in visual cardiac processing, I don't know. You know, hard to say. But I think cortex, the key thing is no way. Sorry. <laughs> you can't have a cortex. No way. <laughs> but maybe auditory cortex. So yeah. you know, it maybe it makes more sense there than in visual. Yeah, okay, thanks everyone for attending. Actually, we run out of time, and that may be a good point to conclude. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> What's <laughs> <in> <laughs> <panelists>? <laughs>